Welcome. I would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you are not speaking. Slide two. For media and press, the FDA press contact is Sherry Duvall Jones. Her email is currently displayed. Slide three, please. My name is Dr. Maria Coyle, and I will be chairing this meeting. I will now call day one of the September 11th and 12th, 2023 Non-Prescription Drugs Advisory Committee meeting to order. Dr. Jessica Sa is the acting designated federal officer for this meeting and we'll begin with introductions. Thank you, Dr. Quill. Good morning, my name is Jessica Sa and I am the acting designated federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation. We'll begin with the standing members of the NDAC and start with Dr. Christy Brittain. Good morning, Christy Britton. I'm from the Medical University of South Carolina. Where I'm a, a professor and um, I am a clinical pharmacy specialist with MUSC Health. Thank you, Dr. Britton. Next, we have Dr. Clement. Good morning to all of you, uh, Stephen Clement. I am a practicing endocrinologist at Anova Health Systems in Northern Virginia and have expertise in endocrine diseases. Um, so the, co the content of this committee is, um, for this topic is to be very interesting to me because this is a lot of new information. So. Thank you. Next is Dr. Ginsburg. Good morning, um, I'm Diane Ginsberg. I'm a clinical professor in pharmacy practice and the Associate Dean for Healthcare Partnerships in the College of Pharmacy at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you. And Dr. King? Hi, I'm Tanya King. I am professor of biostatistics at Penn State College of Medicine. Thank you. And Dr. Basarek. Well, Basarek, uh, Family Medicine, uh, Epidemiology. I work for Artful Health in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you. Next, we have our non-voting industry representative to the NDAC, Dr. Dato. I'm Mark Dato, industry rep for um, Non-Prescription Drug Advisory Committee and Pediatric Pulmonary uh, Retired. Thank you. We'll now introduce our temporary voting members and begin with Dr. Amr Shahi. Good morning, Marianne Amr Shahi. I am an emergency medicine physician. Um, I'm professor of emergency medicine at Georgetown University School of Medicine and um, a medical toxicologist at the National Capital Poison Center, as well as a clinical pharmacologist. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Blaylock. Um, hi, uh, I'm Sue Blaylock. I'm a professor emeritus uh, at the School of Pharmacy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And my area of expertise is medication risk communication. Thank you. And we have Dr. Callis. Good morning. Uh, my name is Karim Callis. Um, I'm a senior scientist at the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland currently working as Director of Clinical Research and Compliance for the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and also Chair of the NIH IRB. Thank you. Next is Dr. Coyle. Good morning again. Uh, I'm Maria Coyle. I'm an Associate Professor at The Ohio State University College of Pharmacy and a uh, Ambulatory Care Pharmacy Specialist at our Wexner Medical Center. Thank you. Next is Dr. Diagostino. Good morning. I am Evan D'Agostino. I'm a consumer representative. I am an advocate with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and a biochemist by training. Thank you. And Dr. Dykowitz. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Dykowitz. I'm an allergist, immunologist, chief of allergy and immunology and professor of internal medicine at uh, St. Louis University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Thank you. Next is Dr. Fig. Hi. Hi, William Fig. Uh, I'm an investigator at the National Institutes of Health, clinical pharmacologist, uh, also associate director of the Center for Cancer Research uh, in the National Cancer Institute. Thank you. And Dr. Jones. <laughs> 
Good morning. My name is Dr. Bridget Jones. I am a professor of pediatrics at University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. Um, I'm also a pediatric allergist and pediatric clinical pharmacologist at Jones Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Thank you. We also have Dr. Ken. Good morning. My name is Esther Kim, an active duty physician stationed at Fort Belvoir. I'm an associate professor of surgery at the Uniformed Services of Health Sciences, and I'm an otolaryngologist and rhinologist. Thank you. Next is Dr. Jennifer Lee. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Lay, um, professor of clinical pharmacy at the Skag School of Pharmacy um, at University of California, San Diego. I'm a pediatric and infectious disease specialist. Thank you, Dr. Lay. And Ms. Jennifer Schwartzat. Hello, I'm Jennifer Schwartzat, and I'm your patient representative. Thank you. We'll now go to our FDA participants and begin with Dr. Michelle. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Teresa Michelle. I'm the director of the Office of Non-Prescription Drugs in CEDAR, and I am a practicing pulmonary critical care specialist. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Todd. Good morning and welcome. I'm Nusheen Todd. I'm the director of the Division of Non-Prescription Drugs, one in the Office of Non-Prescription Drugs, and my training is in medical oncology. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have Dr. Lenhart. Good morning. My name is Martha Lenhart. I am the deputy director for Division of Non-Prescription Drugs, one in the Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Ada. Good morning. My name is Stephen Ada. I'm the Associate Director for Monographs in the Division of Non-Prescription Drugs 1. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Stark. Good morning. I'm Dr. Peter Stark. I'm the lead clinical reviewer um, and I'm in the uh, Division of Non-Prescription Drugs 1. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dr. Bishop. Good morning, my name is Ben Bishop and I'm a reviewer in the Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. Thank you. We also have Dr. Wren. Good morning, everyone. My name is Wing Zhao Ren, the acting team leader of Division of Inflammation and Immune Pharmacology in Office of Clinical Pharmacology in FDA. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Pham. Good, mor <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Tracy Pham. I'm a drug use analyst from the Division of Epidemiology, um, uh, Office of Surveillance and Ep uh, Epidemiology. Thank you all. And I'll return the floor to Dr. Coyle. For topics such as those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are quite strongly held. Our goal at this meeting will be a fair and open forum for discussion of these issues and that individuals can express their views without interruption. Thus, as a gentle reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson. We look forward to a productive meeting. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in the Sunshine Act, we ask that the Advisory Committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of this meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with the FDA about these proceedings. However, FDA will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion, and also the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topic during breaks or lunch. Thank you. Dr. Sa will read the conflict of interest statement for the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Coyle. The Food and Drug Administration or FDA is convening today's meeting of the Non-Prescription Drugs Advisory Committee 
under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, of 1972. With the exception of the industry representative, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws covered by but not limited to those found at 18 USC section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 USC section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government, government employee services outweighs their potential financial conflict of interest, or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the discussions of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children, and for purposes of 18 USC section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, credas, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. Today's agenda involves new data regarding the generally recognized as safe and effective or GRAZE status of oral phenylephrine as a nasal decongestant that ha have become available since FDA last examined the issue. This is a particular matters meeting during which general issues will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by committee members and temporary voting members, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued in connection with this meeting. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements that they have made concerning the topic at issue. With respect to FDA's invited industry representative, we would like to disclose that Dr. Mark Dato is participating in this meeting as a non-voting industry representative acting on behalf of regulated industry. Dr. Dato's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Dr. Dato is retired. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other topics not already on the agenda, for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all other participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have regarding the topic that could be affected by the committee's discussions. Thank you and I'll return the floor to you, Dr. Coyle. Thank you. Uh, we will now proceed with FDA introductory remarks from Dr. Teresa Michelle, followed by Lieutenant Commander Bishop. Of the option drugs. On behalf of FDA and the office, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the meeting of the Non Prescription Drugs Advisory Committee where we will be discussing the efficacy of oral phenylephrine as a nasal decongestant. Now, I especially want to thank our advisory committee members who are offering up their time and expertise today, as well as members of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association who have graciously agreed to represent industry. In addition, I want to thank the academicians and the members of the public who will be stepping forward at the open public hearing to present their views. Next slide. So as I alluded to already, the main objective of today's meeting is to discuss the efficacy of oral phenylephrine as a nasal decongestant. We will be including data that have become available since the committee last discussed this back in 2007. 
We're also asking you to consider the potential safety and efficacy of higher than monograph doses of oral phenylephrine. Now, as you all know, phenylephrine is a very old drug. It's been marketed for more than 75 years for a variety of uses and via a variety of different routes of administration. Anytime a product's been on the market for that long, it's human nature to make assumptions about what we think we know about the product. For the purposes of today's meeting, we're asking you to put aside those assumptions and help us think critically about the data at hand, and in particular, what the data may or may not show. Next slide. Phenylephrine is one of two orally administered alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonists that are generally recognized as safe and effective, or GRACE, in the cough-cold monograph. This indication is for temporary release of nasal congestion, and it's regardless of the underlying etiology. Phenylephrine is also GRACE in the OTC drug monograph for direct intranasal use to treat congestion, for topical use to treat hemorrhoids, and for ocular use to treat redness of the eye. On the prescription side, phenylephrine is approved in a variety of formulations, including intravenous for treatment of hypotension due to vasodilation, and ocular to dilate the pupil. This meeting focuses entirely on the use of oral phenylephrine for the treatment of nasal congestion. Next slide. So this slide is a listing of all of the ingredients in the cough cold monograph, which as you can see encompasses a variety of different active ingredient classes, ingredients, and routes of administration. Again, today we're focusing on the oral decongestants that are shown in the black box, and specifically on phenylephrine, which is shown in red font. There are two different phenylephrine salts, phenylephrine hydrochloride and phenylephrine bitartrate. The bitartrate salt was added to the monograph in 2006 based on PK matching to the hydrochloride salt. Although phenylephrine is also listed as a topical decongestant, we are not considering that use today. Next slide. This slide shows the oral doses for both salts. Highlighted is the monograph adult and adolescent dose of the hydrochloride salt, which is the basis of the original GRACE finding, and it was the dose that was used in almost all of the clinical trials and studies. The dosage is 10 milligrams every four hours, not to exceed 60 milligrams in 24 hours. Now, since efficacy of the bitartrate salt is extrapolated from that of the hydrochloride salt, we will not be discussing the bitartrate salt directly. Likewise, efficacy of phenylephrine in children was extrapolated from adults and so we will not be directly discussing pediatric efficacy. Because of the extrapolation, however, we anticipate that any recommendations of the advisory committee with regard to efficacy of oral phenylephrine in adults may be also applicable to children and to the bitartrate salt. Next slide. So because science continues to discover new things and drug development continues to evolve, it's not uncommon that we learn additional information about drugs that have been on the market for some time, and phenylephrine is no exception. Some of the additional data was brought forward in two citizens' petitions, one in 2007 and one in 2015. The 2007 citizens' petition requested that the agency amend the dosages of both oral phenylephrine salts by increasing the maximum allowed dosage for patients 12 years of age and older. It also requested that FDA withdraw approval, or rather make it not grace, for use in children less than 12 years of age. <clears throat> 
the 2015 citizens petition requested that FDA reclassify the oral phenylephrine salts as not GRACE due to lack of efficacy. Next slide. So because of the additional data that had become available since FDA's GRACE finding back in 1994, we convened an advisory committee in 2007 to discuss the safety and effectiveness of oral phenylephrine as a nasal decongestant. At the meeting in 2007, the committee also considered the original studies supporting the effectiveness of oral phenylephrine. The committee noted that the results are not consistent across studies for nasal airway resistance and recommended that symptoms should be the essential primary endpoint. They also noted that evidence of efficacy consisted primarily of studies conducted 40 years ago, which is now 55 years ago, and it included fewer than 200 subjects who received oral phenylephrine 10 milligrams. Due to the small size of the studies, they felt that nasal airway resistance results may not be generalizable to a wider population. Based on this, the committee recommended that additional data be conducted. Specifically, multi-center, parallel, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials preferably with an active control such as pseudoephedrine to evaluate nasal congestion scores and symptom relief. They also recommended characterization of the phenylephrine dose response and dosing interval, comparison of the PK of single ingredient products versus multiple ingredient products, and a safety evaluation of the effects of phenylephrine on blood pressure. I'm pleased to say that we now have much of the data that was requested by the 2007 Advisory Committee, and we are now bringing this back to this committee for consideration. Next slide. So as you consider the data that are brought before you today, it may be helpful to put it into context of the regulatory standard for effectiveness under the monograph, which is spelled out in 21 CFR 330.10. The standard states that effectiveness means a reasonable expectation that, in a significant portion of the target population, the pharmacological effect of the drug will provide clinically significant relief of the type claimed. It goes on to state that proof of effectiveness shall consist of controlled clinical investigations as defined in 21 CFR 314.126B. So what is that? Well, that reg links back to the definition of adequate and well-controlled studies for a new drug application, which of course you're all familiar with. One of the differences for you to consider with the monograph compared to NDAs in terms of the standards is that because monograph drugs are generally recognized as safe and effective. That means that the data must be publicly available for the public to comment on prior to FDA making a final determination. In addition, under the monograph, rather than talking about a single drug product, the evaluation pertains to all drug products that fulfill the conditions of use of the monograph. Next slide. Finally, I'll conclude with the purpose of proceedings before an advisory committee, which is also spelled out in regulation. Specifically, an advisory committee is utilized to conduct public hearings on matters of importance that come before FDA, to review the issues involved, and to provide advice and recommendations to the commissioner. The commissioner has sole discretion concerning action to be taken and policy to be expressed on any matter considered by an advisory committee. Now, as such, we are not asking you to make a grace determination today on phenylephrine as an oral decongestant. Rather, we are asking you to advise us 
on what you believe the data show in terms of effectiveness. Again, we greatly appreciate your input on this important topic, and we look forward to thoughtful scientific dialogue. Thank you. I'm over to Dr. Ben Bishop, who will be presenting on the regulatory history of phenylephrine. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ben Bishop. I am a pharmacist, and since joining FDA in 2010, I've spent a great deal of time working with OTC monograph ingredients generally. I have also completed uh, numerous assignments working with the nasal decongestant category and phenylephrine specifically. The purpose of my presentation today is to provide background and important context for the regulatory history of oral phenylephrine. Next slide, please. Although the agency first took regulatory action in 1976, this action was based on the conclusions and recommendations of an advisory review panel, which was convened in November of 1972. Not to be confused with other types of panels or advisory committees, that panel and others like it are known as DESI review panels. DESI stands for Drug Efficacy Study Implementation. And the DESI, the DESI panels represented one of the agency's pivotal first steps in a long process of rulemaking. Almost 20 years later, the final monograph for nasal decongestants, part of the larger cold, cough, allergy, bronchodilator, and anti-asthmatic monograph, was published in 1994. I will describe the agency publications issued throughout this process as well as additional events on this timeline theme later on in my presentation. But first, the impact of the DESI panel's review on the inclusion of oral phenylephrine in the monograph merits a closer look. Next slide, please. In 1962, a retrospective evaluation of drug efficacy was authorized by the Kefauver Harris Amendment. Notably, the law mandated that FDA evaluate effectiveness, whereas previous approvals had required only a, de a determination of safety. For non-prescription drugs, the Drug Efficacy Study Implementation, or DESI review, began 10 years later when FDA assembled a list of over 400 active ingredients being marketed without a prescription and categorized them into 26 therapeutic categories. One of these became known as the cold cough, allergy, bronchodilator, and anti-asthmatic monograph, or CCABA monograph. And this included nasal decongestants. Next slide, please. The DESI panel was charged with making recommendations based on their best scientific judgment and the available data to establish conditions of use with respect to dosing, directions, and warnings. At that time, a definition for OTC drug effectiveness standard was established in 21 CFR 330.10, as Dr. Michelle uh, described, and the DESI panel was charged with applying this standard, which states, effectiveness means a re reasonable expectation that in a significant proportion of the target population, the pharmacological effect of the drug, when used under adequate directions for use, and warnings against unsafe use will provide clinically significant relief of the type claimed. Next slide, please. The DESI panel report published in 1976 defined nasal decongestants as agents that reduce nasal, de nasal congestion in patients with acute or chronic rhinitis. They evaluated phenylephrine, hydrochloride, and pseudoephedrine as oral nasal decongestants and concluded that phenyl phenylephrine hydrochloride is safe and effective as an orally administered nasal decongestant for OTC use at the specified dosage. Next slide. With this information, FDA was responsible for creating and implementing the regulations which govern the OTC monograph. After considering the DESI panel's recommendations, 
The agency applied a th the three-step rulemaking process used at the time, sometimes referred to as notice and comment. In step one, the 1976 advanced, advanced notice of proposed rulemaking announced the agency's proposal to include phenylephrine in the OTC monograph based on the panel's recommendation. The agency decided to issue the unaltered conclusions and recommendations of the panel and stated that the purpose of this approach was to, quote, stimulate discussion, evaluation, and comment on the full sweep of the panel's deliberation. In step two, the 1985 tentative final monograph or proposed rule included the agency's evaluation of all available data and comments received after the ANPR. At that time, the agency maintained its position that phenylephrine be included in the monograph. At this stage, the numbered categories, category one representing generally recognized as safe and effective, category two representing not generally recognized as safe and effective, and category three representing insufficient data available and further testing required, were used to classify each active ingredient relative to its therapeutic claim in the proposed rule. Topical and oral phenylephrine were proposed as category one, or GRACE. In step three, the 1994 final monograph or final rule established the agency's classification of oral and topical phenylephrine hydrochloride as monograph conditions. Next slide, please. Phenylephrine bitartrate is an effervescent tablet dosage form formed with the bitartrate salt. FDA received a citizen petition in 2002, which requested that the CCABA OTC monograph be amended to add this dosage form of phenylephrine. The petition did not include efficacy data. It was, however, submitted with domestic and global marketing history data and pharmacokinetic data showing that phenylephrine hydrochloride and phenylephrine bitartrate have comparable bioavailability profiles. FDA issued a proposed rule in 2004 and then a final rule in 2006 to add phenylephrine bitartrate as a monograph condition. Again, we note that this determination was based on pharmacokinetic matching data, not efficacy. Next slide, please. I will briefly describe two other active ingredients as they are relevant to phenylephrine's use as an oral nasal decongestant. Pseudoephedrine is the only other oral decongestant listed in the CCABA monograph. The Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act was enacted in 2006, restricting public access to pseudoephedrine. The act required that pseudoephedrine be sold behind the counter and also lim limited purchase quantities. This led to many products being reformulated to contain phenylephrine instead of pseudoephedrine and dramatically affected the OTC nasal decongestant market. These effects will be discussed later. Phenylpropanolamine was recommended as safe and effective by the panel in 1976. However, by 1985, FDA had received numerous comments and data related to, the, to phenylpropanolamine's use both as a nasal decongestant as well as a, a weight control drug. It was not found grace as a nasal decongestant and was later removed from the weight control monograph after additional safety data demonstrated an association with hemorrh hemorrhagic stroke in women of childbearing age. Next slide, please. In 2020, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act, modernized the way that OTC monograph drugs are regulated in the United States. The burdensome rulemaking process was often ca characterized by delays, whereas the administrative order process is expected to improve efficiency and facilitate innovation. All OTC monographs have now been reviewed and posted as orders, specifically the CCABA OTC final monograph was posted in, on October 14, 2022. This concludes my presentation. I hope I've been able to adequately review and clarify phenylephrine's long regulatory history. Thank you.
Thank you. We will go ahead and take a short 10 minute break. Panel members, please remember that there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during this break. We will resume at um, 9.45. 9.45, we'll see everyone back here. Thank you.
Recording in progress. Welcome back. Uh, we will now proceed with FDA's presentation, starting with Dr. Yun Zhao Ren. My name is Yun Zhao Ren, the Clinical Pharmacology Acting Team Leader from Division of Inflammation and uh, Immune Pharmacology, Office of Clinical Pharmacology from FDA. I have been uh, reviewing the phenylephrine products um, since 2014, the clinical pharmacology part um, in FDA. My slides today will briefly cover the clinical pharmacology aspect of phenylephrine. The role of clinical pharmacology presentation in this meeting is to provide a magnetic explanation to the lack of nasal decongestive effect following the monographed oral dose of phenylephrine that was observed from recently conducted randomized placebo-controlled clinical efficacy trials with relatively large sample size. Next slide, please. I'll first introduce the metabolism and pharmacology of phenylephrine. Then I will explain in detail why phenylephrine has very low bioavailability via oral administering route when compared to IV administering route. And this low oral bioavailability of phenylephrine only results in a small and transient systemic of one adrenergic activity observed from clinical trials. Of note, because only phenylephrine hydrochloride drug products were used in the clinical PK trials, whenever I cite phenylephrine product in my presentation, I mean phenylephrine hydrochloride drug product. Next slide, please. Following the oral administration, more than 80% of the phenylephrine dose is absorbed into human body. However, mostly in the form of metabolites. That's because extensive metabolism occurs when phenylephrine passes through the intestinal wall during the absorption. Glucuronide conjugated phenylephrine, sulfate conjugated phenylephrine, and hydroxymandelic acid are the three major metabolites detected in the systemic circulation and account for approximately 90% of the systemic exposure and urine excretion of the phenylephrine-related molecule. Meanwhile, the parent phenylephrine only accounts about 3% of the total urine excretion of phenylephrine-related molecules of the oral administration. Next slide, please. When phenylephrine is applied locally, via intranasal administration route. Its nasal decongestive effect is attributed to its direct of one adrenergic agonistic pharmacology effect, which constricts the blood vessels in the nasal mucosa that reduces local edema and perfusion. Sharon Plow compare the in vitro alpha-1 adrenergic pharmacology results of phenylephrine and its major metabolites in the 2007 Non-Prescription Drug Advisory Committee meeting. The results confirmed the selectivity of phenylephrine as an alpha-1 adrenergic agonist, as the EC50 values for alpha-1 receptors are lower than alpha-2 receptors. In addition, the in vitro results demonstrated that three major phenylephrine metabolites identified in human body did not have any adrenergic agonistic activity at the highest tested concentration, which is consistent with the approved phenylephrine drug label that says the metabolites are considered not pharmacologically active. Next slide, please. In the same 2007 AC meeting, Sharon Plow also compared the parent phenylephrine PK profile with the total phenylephrine PK profile following the monographed 10 milligram oral dose. The total phenylephrine, which is a coined term in this field, including both parent phenylephrine and the phenylephrine that was hydrolyzed from major conjugated metabolites during the sample pre preparation. And that's because um, due to the convenience of binocular assay. I'll, I'll um, uh, explain this more later. The results show that the parent phenylephrine system exposure is less than 1% of 
of the total phenylephrine system exposure. And since the amount of the total phenylephrine system exposure is less than the phenylephrine oral dose, the oral bioavailability of parent phenylephrine is concluded to be less than 1% of the oral dose. We acknowledge that this is the inference, but this inference is airtight. And let me explain a little bit more about the bioidentical assay for this total phenylephrine um, measurement. Uh, since CHPA I raised this question during, the, during the, uh, their presentation later. So here, the concept is that if you compare the exposure, especially AUC value, from one molecule to the other, a fair comparison will be compare the molar ratio, not the uh, exact nanogram per ml or the concentrations uh, in, in this unit. So therefore, I will describe here how this black curve, the total phenylephrine, is measured. Here, what I'm measuring is generally the phenylephrine itself, including parent phenylephrine, which is just teeny tiny uh, component, and uh, also the phenylephrine that was hydrolyzed from the metabolites, uh, especially the conjugated metabolites during the sample preparation, because for measuring the total phenylephrine, you need to incubate the samples with acid to hydrolyze the metabolites to relieve, release the phenylephrine. So here, one molar of metabolite, conjugated metabolite, will give you one molar um, phenylephrine. So it's tight one-to-one -one ratio, even in the um, molar ratio. Okay, next. More importantly, the mean maximum plasma concentration, or C max value, of parent phenylephrine is about 0.65 nanogram per ml, following the monographed 10 milligram oral dose, which is lower than that in vitro alpha-1 adrenergic agonistic EC50 value, as shown in the next slide. Next slide, please. Here, you may appreciate, uh, I think that's not the, um, can you go back to the uh, previous slide? There's a slide missing, yes, that's a slide. Here you may appreciate, the in vitro phenylephrine EC50 values are 16.9 nanogram per ml and 2.3 nanogram per ml for alpha-1A and alpha-1B receptors, respectively. These EC50 values are within the range of literature reported values. However, the in vivo phenylephrine mean Cmax value is only about 0.65 nanogram per ml following the 10 milligram oral dose in Sharon Plus PK study. Of note, the result of low bioavailability of parent phenylephrine following the oral administration route was not available at the time of the original gray status determination for oral phenylephrine about 30 years ago. Next slide, please. The Sharon Plus PK comparison results were independently confirmed by clinical pharmacology review of NDA 022565, which was approved in 2010 and the 55B2 path rely on the efficacy and safety of oral phenylephrine monograph. The PK profiles of phenylephrine, of, of parent phenylephrine as shown in red color, and total phenylephrine as shown in blue color, following a marketed single dose 10 milligram oral phenylephrine product that are compared in this slide. The PK profiles on the left is on log scale, and the PK profile on the right is on linear scale. The table listed here compared the systemic exposure between the parent and total phenylephrine. The Cmax of parent phenylephrine is only about 0.3% of the value of the total phenylephrine. And AUC of parent phenylephrine is only about 0.1% of the value of total phenylephrine. In addition, the half-life of parent phenylephrine is also shorter than the total phenylephrine. Next slide, please. We have compared in vitro and in vivo phenylephrine concentrations in the previous slides. Next, let's examine the in vivo pharmacology effect of phenylephrine following the oral administration route. Here, the in vivo pharmacology was measured as systemic alpha-1 adrenergic activity, mainly the systolic bar pressure changes from baseline as an indicator. In 2015, McNeil Consumer Healthcare published a phenylephrine clinical trial 
which was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, single-dose, dose-ranging crossover study to evaluate the PK and PD following up to 30 milligram oral dose of phenylephrine hydrochloride immediate release tablet in 28 healthy subjects. The PK profiles, as shown in the left, demonstrated a roughly dose proportional increase of parent phenylephrine system exposure across threefold range. The PD profiles, as shown in the right, demonstrate that the mean maximal systolic blood pressure increased approximately 4 millimeter mercury from the baseline, following the 10 milligram to 30 milligram oral dose of phenylephrine at about 30 minutes post dose. By the way, the T max of phenylephrine following oral dose is about 30 minutes. The magnitude of systolic blood pressure increase from baseline following 10 milligram oral dose of phenylephrine is considered relatively small. The duration of the systolic blood pressure peak is also short, less than one hour. In addition, there's no clear dose response relationship observed for this small and transient increase of systolic blood pressure across threefold dose range. Next slide, please. On the contrary, a clear dose or exposure response relationship was observed for phenylephrine following six minutes continuous IV infusion in healthy subjects from a literature report. Here, the left panel is the parent phenylephrine plasma concentration at a steady state following the IV infusion. And the right panel is the blood pressure profile at a steady state following the IV infusion. When phenylephrine is infused with the lowest dose in this study, 0.5 microgram per kilogram body weight per minute, there was an increase of three millimeter mercury of systolic blood pressure from the baseline at a steady state, with parent phenylephrine plasma concentration around three nanogram per ml. The result is consistent with the orophenylephrine PK and PD results observed from the previous slide. Let's go to the next slide. As we have mentioned, following IV infusion at a steady state, three nanogram per ml of parent phenylephrine concentration result in three millimeter mercury of systolic blood pressure increase. Here, following an oral administration, a parent phenylephrine Cmax value ranged from 1.4 to 4.5 nanogram per ml, which results in four millimeter mercury increase of systolic blood pressure. The results are consistent with each other. Of note, at this level, the exposure of phenylephrine major metabolites following the 10 milligram oral dose is estimated to be at least 40 fold higher than following the six minutes 0.5 microgram per kilo per minute IV infusion. Yet, we did not observe any substantial change of blood pressure from baseline compared to the IV infusion, which is consistent with the in vitro pharmacology results for phenylephrine metabolites. Next slide, please. Let's go back to this IV, IV infusion study again. It takes an infusion rate of one microgram per kilo per minute to reach a steady state concentration of approximately 10 nanogram per ml of parent phenylephrine to achieve about 10 millimeter mercury increase of systolic blood pressure from baseline. And this one microgram per kilo per minute infusion rate is within the range of the approved IV phenylephrine dose for the treatment of hypotension resulting primarily from vasodilation in the setting of anesthesia. Therefore, we consider the systemic alpha-1 adrenergic agonistic effect about 10 millimeter mercury increase of systolic blood pressure in healthy subjects with parent phenylephrine plasma concentration of 10 nanogram per ml are both pharmacologically and clinically meaningful. Based on the PK and PD results and the relationship following the IV infusion of phenylephrine, it is estimated that an oral dose of approximately 100 milligram is needed to achieve a Cmax value around 10 nanogram per ml in order to achieve about a 10 millimeter mercury increase of systolic blood pressure from baseline. That's about 10 times of the currently monographed oral dose of phenylephrine. Indeed, later Dr. Stark would display more systolic blood pressure results from some early clinical trials in his section. 
this res these results demonstrated that 100 milligram orophenylephrine not only distinguished its effect on the magnitude of the systolic blood pressure increase from baseline, but also the sustainability of this increase. However, just to clarify, FDA neither suggests 100 milligram is appropriate oral dose for treating nasal congestion, nor indicates that there are any clinical evidence to support this dose. Although we acknowledge the comments from 2007 AC meeting, which recommended a higher oral doses of phenylephrine be explored for treating nasal congestion, a noticeably sustained increase of blood pressure following higher oral dose of phenylephrine, if observed, will certainly raise safety concerns. Next slide, please. We acknowledge that there's no clinical trial conducted to translate or compare the real-time systemic alpha-1 adrenergic activity of phenylephrine on blood pressure to its nasal decongestive effect in patients with nasal congestion. However, there are no in vivo or in vitro results published to demonstrate that the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors in nasal mucosa is more sensitive than in systemic circulation in humans. Neither are studies conducted to show that phenylephrine can be enriched in nasal mucosa following the oral administration route. Let's take this translatability question from a different angle by looking at the marketed phenylephrine concentrations in the monographed intranasal phenylephrine products. These concentrations ranged from 0.125% to 1% or 1.25% to 10 milligram per ml. These monographed phenylephrine concentrations in the nasal solution to be directly applied to the nasal mucosa is at least one million fold higher than the parent phenylephrine plasma C-max value following the monographed oral dose. The one million fold difference of concentrations can be roughly demonstrated by taking just one drop of an elephant intranasal product and put it into 10 gallons of water and you mix it very well, now the phenylephrine concentration in that 10 gallons of water is the roughly the plasma phenylephrine C-max value following the monograph, the 10 milligram oral dose. We acknowledge that 1.25 to 10 milligram per ml phenylephrine concentration in nasal solution for treating nasal congestion is based on expert opinions, and that the therapeutic concentrations for intranasal products were not well explored in the past as well. However, the fact that there's a one million fold drug concentration difference between the intranasal and oral administering route for the same indication with the same target tissue, which is nasal mucosa, provides a useful context in which to consider the potential efficacious dose range for oral phenylephrine. From literature report, we know that oral phenylephrine can cause substantial increase of blood pressure at a concentration far below 1.25 milligram per ml. For example, a study reported that following 250 milligram oral dose of phenylephrine, which is 25 times the monographed 10 milligram oral dose, the mean systolic blood pressure increased by approximately 30 millimeter mercury. Next slide, please. Uh, okay. the next, uh, previous slide, it should be previous slide. Okay, here are some takeaway take values. The plasma C-max value of parent phenylephrine is approximately one nanogram per ml following the monographed 10 milligram oral dose. It is lower than the in vitro alpha-1 adrenergic agonistic EC50 values. And it is about one magnitude lower than the concentration following the IV dose within the approved dose range of phenylephrine for treating hypotension. And it is lower than approximately one millionth the value of phenylephrine concentration of the monographed phenylephrine nasal solution products indicated for nasal congestion. Of note, there's a typo at the end of this slide, 
which the values in the parentheses of the note, uh, the footnote number three should be 0.125% to 1%, uh, not 0.125% to 0.5%. Next slide, please. In conclusion, following 10 milligram oral dose of phenylephrine, the oral relative bioavailability of parent phenylephrine is less than 1%. Meanwhile, although phenylephrine major metabolites are higher, have higher bioavailability, they do not have detectable alpha-1 adrenergic agonistic activity, both in vitro and in vivo. The systemic alpha-1 adrenergic activity as measured by systolic bar pressure increase from baseline following the 10 milligram oral dose is considered relatively small, only about four millimeter mercury. We acknowledge there's a lack of dedicated clinical data to elucidate the translatability of this systemic alpha-1 adrenergic activity to local nasal decongestive effect. However, we do have clinical trial data looking directly at the efficacy of phenylephrine on nasal congestion, which Dr. Stark will present in detail in the next section. Last but not least, the optimal dosing frequency of oral phenylephrine for the treatment of nasal congestion has not been sufficiently explored in the past. As the half-life of parent phenylephrine is only about 1.5 hours, in the systemic circulation, whereas the monograph, the dosing interval for oral phenylephrine is four hours. This slide concludes my presentation, and I'll pass the podium to Dr. Stark. Thank you, Dr. Rem. Good morning, I'm Dr. Peter Stark, and I will present the clinical data regarding the efficacy and safety of orally administered phenylephrine as a nasal decongestant. Before beginning, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm a pediatrician. I was in practice for over 22 years before joining the pulmonary allergy, now the pulmonary allergy and critical care division in 2000. I served in that division for over 18 years until I retired in 2018. I returned in January of 2022 to lead the clinical review group looking at issues with the cough, cold, allergy, bronchodilator, and anti-asthmatic over-the-counter monograph, also known as the cough, cold, or CCABA monograph. Next slide, please. Today, you're going to hear about two sets of data. One that was used to establish the GRACE status of oral phenylephrine, which was reviewed for the 1976 ANPR and finalized in the final decongestant monograph in 1994. And a second set, which starts after that time, but really begins with presentations made by industry at the 2007 advisory committee meeting. The two sets of data are markedly different, and a lot has changed since the original DESI panel reviewed the data and made recommendations to the agency in 1976. In fact, changes to drug development, clinical trial design, and clinical review practices would be a whole talk in and of itself. But the science has also advanced and this talk will focus on the efficacy and safety data through the lens of current best clinical drug development and review practices. I will start by briefly summarizing the scope of the new database, including summarizing what was presented at the 2007 advisory committee meeting, after which I will discuss the results from the new clinical trials. However, a full understanding of the new data can only be accomplished within the context of understanding all of the available data, including the original studies, which were also discussed at the 2007 Advisory Committee meeting. So I will present the original data as well. Next slide, please. First, the scope of the new database. Next slide, please. 
This table summarizes the database of clinical trials with new data. There are five trials, starting with two EEU, or Environmental Exposure Unit, studies that were discussed by Sharing Plow Merck at the 2007 Non-Prescription Drug Advisory Committee meeting, and three large clinical trials conducted since then. I will pre be presenting each of these studies as we go through the data. Sharing Plow and Merck worked together on the various parts of this program and merged in 2009. So for convenience, I'll be referring to the clinical program interchangeably as Sharing Plow Merck or just Merck. Next slide, please. This table summarizes the number of subjects randomized to each dose. The first trial was a crossover study and the rest used a parallel group design. Next slide, please. First, some historical context. Next slide. As you heard before, in 2007, the agency received a citizen petition requesting that we amend the dosage of both oral phenylephrine salts by increasing the maximum dosage for patients 12 years of age and older and to withdraw approval for use in children less than 12 years of age. The agency decided to hold an advisory committee meeting in December of that year to discuss the scientific merits of whether higher doses of oral phenylephrine would be warranted in adolescents and adults. The second proposal to remove approval for use under 12 years of age was not discussed because the use of cough and cold medicines in the over-the-counter cough cold monograph had been discussed at a joint non-prescription drug pediatric advisory committee meeting held in October of that year. And by the way, I was at that meeting and I presented at that meeting. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the meeting and recommendations. Both the petitioners and industry presented meta-analysis of the original studies. Additionally, an FDA statistician looked at all the studies and both meta-analyses. At that meeting, Sharing Plow and Sharing Plow Merck presented quote unquote, new pharmacology and bioavailability data that had not been available prior to that time. Along with two environmental exposure unit or EEU studies, that showed no efficacy at monographed doses. The advisory committee recommended that more clinical data be obtained to evaluate higher oral doses of phenylephrine than the monographed dose. They also recommended that symptom scores be used rather than nasal inspiratory resistance, or NAR, which is the primary endpoint that had been used in all the original studies. Next slide, please. Sharing Plow and Merck presented and subsequently published receptor binding, clinical pharmacology, and clinical data at the 2007 Advisory Committee meeting. You heard about the receptor binding and clinical pharmacology data from Dr. Wren. I want to put Sharing Plow and Sharing Plow Merck's Advisory Committee rec uh, presentations into some perspective. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the publicly available information about several sharing plow Merck programs that involve the use of oral phenylephrine. After conducting receptor binding and PK studies, sharing plow and Merck performed the two environmental exposure unit studies that were reported at the 2007 advisory committee meeting. Although the EEU studies were conducted for entirely different purposes, the results showed a lack of efficacy for oral phenylephrine at monographed doses. After which, Merck performed two large clinical trials, one each for immediate release and extended release products. The publication for one of those studies, the immediate release dose ranging study, states that Merck first conducted safety studies and identified 40 milligrams as a safe dose to study. And the publication for the 30 milligram extended release product reports that they had conducted a bioequivalent study that failed to match the exposure from three 10 milligram tablets dosed every four hours with their 30 milligram extended release product. 
Next slide, please. These are the sharing plow Merck trials, two EEU studies followed by the two large clinical trials. Next slide, please. I'll cover the two EEU studies first. Next slide. EEU studies are considered proof of concept, pharmacodynamic, or early phase two studies. They are often used in the early evaluation of an allergic rhinitis drug to establish whether a dose might be effective before proceeding to larger dose finding studies. Subjects with seasonal allergic rhinitis, or SAR, are first primed by multiple exposures to pollen in the EEU chamber. And when symptoms are sufficient, are treated and observed for the drug effect. As I am sure you're aware, SAR includes the symptom of nasal congestion. Sharing Plow Merck performed two such studies. One compared phenylephrine with pseudoephedrine and placebo, and one compared phenylephrine with the test product and placebo. The primary efficacy assessment in both studies was changed from baseline and average nasal congestion scores over six hours. Although nasal airway resistance and or peak nasal inspiratory flow, or PNIF, were also evaluated. In both studies, phenylephrine was no more effective than placebo. Next study. Next slide, please. This slide describes the first study which compared a 12 milligram dose of phenylephrine, the European oral dose, with 60 milligrams of pseudoephedrine and placebo in 39 subjects with SAR. It was a randomized, investigator-blinded, single-dose, three-way crossover study. It was conducted in January of 2006, shortly after the Combat Methamphetamine Act was passed and several months before the act actually took effect. As such, the publication for this trial infers that it was conducted to help transition from pseudoephedrine to phenylephrine-containing products. Next slide, please. Here are the results. Focus on the left, where nasal congestion scores are plotted over time. There was no difference between phenylephrine and placebo for nasal congestion scores whereas pseudoephedrine showed a significant effect, as evidenced by a sustained decrease in congestion scores. On the right is nasal rhinometry, with a positive score denoting improvement. Pseudoephedrine showed an effect, whereas phenylephrine and placebo did not. CHPA has raised concern over several issues with this study. First, the primary endpoint was out to six hours, whereas the monograss phenylephrine dosing interval is every four hours. But you can see visually on the left-hand side that if one made a cutoff at four hours, it would not have changed the results. In fact, it's likely that the primary comparison for nasal symptom scores between pseudoephedrine and placebo would have been statistically stronger, and that the same conclusion would have been reached for each of the treatment comparisons with placebo. Second, CHPA argues that because the study was only investigator blinded and subjects knew what treatments they might be getting, there might have been a crossover effect for those subjects who received pseudoephedrine prior to receiving placebo, thereby creating a positive bias in those subjects. However, the same might be said for the arm crossed over from phenylephrine to placebo if phenylephrine had shown a positive effect, suggesting that a crossover effect did not significantly bias results against phenylephrine. Next slide, please. Now, this slide shows the same nasal rhinometry on the right, but peak inspiratory flow, or PNIF, on the left. Again, Pseudoephedrine showed a significant effect, whereas phenylephrine and placebo did not. In fact, if you look, PNIF tracks better with nasal congestion symptoms than does NAR. Um, next slide, please. 
This is sharing Plow's slide from the 2007 Advisory Committee meeting, showing the mean change in nasal congestion scores for each treatment. Phenylephrine on the left, pseudoephedrine in the middle, and placebo on the right. As you will see in tiny print on the bottom left, which I expanded for visibility, the only comparison that was statistically significant was pseudoephedrine versus placebo. Next slide, please. This is the second study. It was a large, randomized, double-blind, double-dummy, placebo-controlled, single-dose, parallel group study in 379 patients with SAR to ragweed. It was conducted primarily to evaluate a test product of loratadine combined with Montelukast. As such, it included phenylephrine as a so-called positive control. Next slide, please. Here are the results. These figures are taken directly from Sharing Plow's Merck's, Merck's presentation. On the left are mean changes from baseline and congestion symptom scores, with the test product in blue, phenylephrine in green, and placebo in gray. Within the boxes are the ends for each treatment arm, which were substantial. On the right are mean changes in symptom scores over time. There was no statistically significant difference between phenylephrine and placebo in this study. Next slide, please. Here are Sharing Plow's conclusions that they shared at the advisory committee meeting, and I'm quoting. A single dose of oral pseudoephedrine, 60 milligrams, showed the expected decongestant response namely in symptoms and airflow, compared to placebo. A single oral dose of phenylephrine, 10 or 12 milligrams, overall showed no decongestant response compared to placebo, and that was replicated in two studies. Next slide, please. Next slide. There were three large trials conducted since the 2007 Advisory Committee. Two by Merck, conducted between 2011 and 12, and published in 2015 and 16, and one by Johnson & Johnson, conducted in 2017 to 18. Next slide, please. The Merck clinical trials first. Next slide, please. Merck's two large cl clinical trials were both conducted in subjects with SAR. One was a phase two dose ranging study that evaluated 10, 20, 30, and 40 milligrams of immediate release phenylephrine versus placebo, and one evaluated a 30 milligram extended release product versus placebo using an extended release formulation, which we know provided a higher systemic exposure than three 10 milligram immediate release doses dosed every four hours. The results of both trials were published in peer reviewed journals and at clinicaltrials.gov. The size and primary endpoint for these trials were reasonable and similar to phase two and three trials for drug registration of antihistamines and intranasal products for allergic rhinitis. I will also note that seasonal allergic rhinitis provides a more stable environment than colds, which is the population evaluated in all but one of the original studies, although that's primarily because catching subjects at the right moment in a cold presents an enrollment issue. Nasal congestion was rated twice daily on a 4.0 to 3 scale following the FDA guidance on development of drugs for allergic rhinitis, with the primary endpoint being change in reflective nasal symptom scores over one week of treatment. Neither trial showed efficacy of any dose of phenylephrine compared with placebo, and no meaningful safety issues were noted. Next slide, please. The publications for the two large trials state that Merck supported the dosing used in these trials with safety studies. The publication for the IR 
10 milligram to 40 milligram dose ranging trial reports that those studies showed support for up to 40 milligrams, the highest dose studied. However, those studies were never published, so we do not have the results to share with you. What you see summarized in this slide is a seven-day ambulatory safety study that Merck conducted as part of drug development for the 30 milligram extended release product. The primary outcome measure was average systolic blood pressure over a five-hour range around the time of maximal concentration, or Tmax. No meaningful differences in systolic blood pressure were noted for either 30 milligram extended release or placebo. Next slide, please. First, the dose ranging trial. Next slide. This trial was published, and the results are also on, at, on clinicaltrials.gov. It was a multicenter, randomized, dummied but only partially blinded, placebo controlled, five arm, parallel group trial conducted in healthy adults with SAR caused by spring allergens. All subjects received background treatment of the antihistamine loratadine, 10 milligrams, which had previously been demonstrated in two factorially designed clinical trials to have no effect on congestion. And the publication references the two publications for those trials. After a four-day baseline run-in period, all subjects were dosed with immediate release phenylephrine every four hours for one week. The reason that it was only partially blinded is that they used a similar but not identical placebo. But the fact that the study was placebo dummied, along with the partial blinding, would have made it more difficult for a subject to guess which dose they might have been randomized to receive. That said, if a subject did guess at their allocation, treatment allocation, it would likely have favored finding an effect for phenylephrine because there were four phenylephrine arms and only one placebo arm, meaning there was a four to one chance they might think they were taking an active treatment. The primary endpoint was mean change from baseline in daily reflective nasal congestion scores over the treatment period. 539 were randomized and 519, or almost 96%, completed the trial. In the blue boxes, you see the ends for each treatment group, which were quite reasonable and far larger than in any of the original studies. The treatment groups were comparable. In retrospect, we are aware that there are some potential limitations to the design of this study. First, it was only partially blinded, although I've explained why that should not have mattered. Second, it did not include a positive control, which would have been ideal. That said, based on our review, we consider this trial to have been adequately designed and conducted, and we do not believe that the limitations I mentioned detract from the interpretation of the results. Next slide, please. Here you see the results shown graphically over the course of the trial with mean reflective nasal symptom scores on the y-axis and the four days before and the seven days after randomization on the x-axis. You also see the number of subjects in each treatment group on the top right. Note that baseline symptoms were about 2.4 to 2.5, which is in the moderate range. Not only were there no statistically significant differences between any oral phenylephrine dose and placebo, there were no meaningful differences between doses. Next slide, please. Now the Merck Extended Release Trial. Next slide, please. This trial was published and the results are available at clinicaltrials.gov. It was a phase three trial performed after a bioavailability study fared to show bioequivalence two and with higher systemic exposure than three 10 milligram immediately release phenylephrine tablets. It was a multi-center, randomized, double blind, double dummy, placebo controlled, two arm parallel group design that compared a 30 milligram modified release phenylephrine with placebo. 
This is the largest trial ever conducted to evaluate the efficacy of phenylephrine. And with enrollment of 287 and 88 subjects in the respective arms, it was comparable to what, might one, to what one might expect to see in phase three allergic rhinitis trials. The treatment was twice daily for seven days with no background treatment except loratadine as an as-needed rescue. The primary endpoint was mean change from baseline in daily nasal congestion scores over the treatment period. 575 subjects were randomized and 574 completed the study. Treatment groups were comparable. Based on our review, we consider this trial to have all the features of an adequately designed and well-conducted trial. As such, this trial provides the best information available to date regarding the efficacy of oral phenylephrine. Next slide, please. Here are the results for the primary endpoint of mean change from baseline in reflective nasal congestion scores over seven days. On the left, you see placebo in blue and the modified or extended release phenylephrine in red. There was a similar response to each with no statistically significant difference between the two treatments. On the right, you see the, the results expressed in tabular format with baseline and mean change shown. Next slide, please. I use the data available at clinicaltrials.gov to make this graphical representation of the mean daily reflective nasal congestion scores over the course of the study. With nasal congestion scores on the y-axis and time starting with baseline on the x-axis. Again, placebo is in blue and extended release phenylephrine is in red you see no meaningful separation of the two at any time point over the course of the trial. Next slide, please. Now, those two trials were conducted by Merck in subjects with allergic rhinitis. We also have available the results of a subject of a study conducted by Johnson & Johnson in subjects with a common cold. Next slide, please. This study was conducted in Canada during the 2007-18 cold season and published only at clinicaltrials.gov. It was a randomized, double-blind, double-dummy, placebo-controlled, three-arm parallel group trial in adults with nasal congestion due to the common cold about 72 hours into symptoms. Treatments were a 30 milligram extended release phenylephrine tablet taken twice daily, two doses, 12 hours apart, and the European dose of phenylephrine 12 milligrams as an IR capsule, taken four times daily, four doses, four hours apart, and placebo. Again, all treatments were double dummied for blinding purposes. Assessments were reflective nasal congestion severity scores, or NCSS, assessed on an eight point zero to seven scale, where zero equals none and seven equals severe and performed at baseline and at two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 24 hours after the first dose. While we do not have PK data from this particular extended release formulation, note that the trial included both their extended release formulation and a 12 milligram immediate release product. Next slide, please. The primary endpoint was mean change from baseline and NCSS over zero to 12 hours after the first dose analyzed for the ITT population using an ANOVA model with treatment group, study center, and baseline nasal scores as factors. Demographics were similar between the three arms and no adverse events were reported. Unfortunately, while Johnson & Johnson planned to enroll 450 subjects, they were unable to enroll the full number and terminated the study at the end of the cold season, having enrolled only 193 subjects.
So while it's still a relatively large study, it was not nearly as large as originally contemplated. Nevertheless, we consider this the best data available for use of oral phenylephrine as a decan decongestant in the setting of subjects with colds. Next slide, please. Here are the results, which I took from clinicaltrials.gov and converted to a figure, which you see on the left and in tabular format on the right. Placebo is in blue, immediate release is in red, and the extended release formulation is in green. There were no meaningful differences between the three treatment groups and the comparisons, <coughs> excuse me, the comparisons between either phenylephrine treatment and placebo were not statistically significant. One thing to note and one correction on this slide. First, the correction. The mean change results in the table include standard deviation or SD in parenthesis, when in fact it should have been designated as standard error or SE. The standard deviation should be much larger, around 1.25 in this case. Second, note that the results are expressed as positive numbers for all three treatment groups, with either, which either suggests that the results are expressed as absolute change or that everyone got worse. Because based on the scoring system, higher numbers would reflect more severe congestion scores. So I suspect it was expressed as absolute change. Next slide, please. Here you see a graphical representation of those results, which I created from information available at clinicaltrials.gov. What appears to be absolute change from baseline is on the y-axis, and time is on the x-axis. As you see, there were no meaningful differences between treatments at any time point. Next slide, please. Our statisticians created this slide, which summarizes the treatment difference in change in nasal congestion scores for each dose in each of the four published studies from Merck. The studies are color coded by trial. As I showed you in a previous slide, the HORAC 2009 study included pseudoephedrine, which is marked with the blue arrow, and showed the expected positive result. A confidence interval was not available for the day study in green. And the J&J &J trial was not included in this plot because it used a variation in nasal scoring, whereas all four of the Merck trials used the same scoring. Note the arrow of confidence, I'm sorry, note the narrow confidence intervals around the results with all of the confidence intervals for phenylephrine versus placebo comparisons overlapping zero. The only result that was significant was the comparison between pseudoephedrine and placebo. Also shown in the next to the bottom line are the results of a comparison that our statisticians performed with placebo when the results were all for 10 to 40 milligram phenylephrine doses in the dose ranging study are pooled. Next slide, please. I turn now to the data that was that supported the GRACE recommendation in the monograph. First, I will discuss the meta-analysis of the original data that were presented at the 2007 advisory committee meeting, after which I will discuss the studies themselves but through the lens of current clinical trial design and review guidance. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. At the advisory committee meeting, the petitioners and industry presented meta-analyses, each of which used a different number of the original studies and each of which used different statistical methodology. Not unexpectedly, the petitioner's analysis did not confirm the original findings, whereas the industry analysis did. But what do the meta-analyses actually tell us about the studies themselves? Next slide. 
Here you see a summary slide of the petitioner's meta-analysis. It shows all the studies that they included. One of their key findings was that two studies performed at the Elizabeth Biochemical Lab's study site for Sterling Winthrop, the manufacturer of neosinephrine, were the two most positive studies. You will see this both visually and in the column showing the percent NAR decrease difference. They also suggested that not only did the results of those two studies drive the results of the meta-analysis, these two studies were outliers when compared with the rest. A third study also performed on, by, on behalf of Sterling Winthrop, but at a different laboratory, Syntest, was also positive and also appeared to drive the results. Next slide, please. The FDA statistician, Dr. Lin, reviewed both sets of meta-analyses and pointed out that the two included different studies and different analyses of the nasal airway resistance endpoints than had been used in the original studies. He also noted that NAR is no longer accepted by the agency as a primary endpoint, and we'll get to that later. When he looked at the studies themselves, he found evidence of a treatment by study site interaction, which both indicated heterogeneity and limited poolability. But that was as far as he went in interpreting the variability of the, of the results. His final assessment was that neither meta-analysis was conclusive. Next slide. I turn now to our reassessment of the original studies through today's review lens. But I want to be clear that in doing so, I am not in any way denigrating the fine work of the original panel did. They provided the agency with recommendations based on their best assessment of the data available to them at the time. It's just that the science has changed in the interim. Next slide, please. Next slide. This slide summarizes the safety data available to the DESI panel. <clears throat> 16 studies were reviewed for safety with doses mostly between 5 and 60 milligrams, but several up to 100 milligrams. The graphic on the right shows that the pharmacodynamic effects on blood pressure were considered inconsistent and transient until close to 100 milligrams, with no meaningful cardiovascular side effects at the monograph 10 milligram dose. There are no other safety issues noted, and from here on, I will only focus on efficacy. Next slide. <clears throat> For efficacy, 14 studies were considered with oral doses up to 40 milligrams. All but one study were in subjects with colds. All used as the primary endpoint nasal airway resistance, or NAR, as measured by ranometry. Symptoms were secondary endpoints, and they generally were not considered if the primary endpoint was not successful. Most all evaluated pharmacodynamic endpoints of blood pressure and heart rate. Next slide. Here's the breakdown of those 14 studies broken down by parallel or crossover design, along with the study, a brief description, and the results. One was a parallel group study, the results of which were considered positive, and the remaining 13 were crossover studies, of which six were considered as positive. Next slide. Two studies, one from the University of Maryland and one preliminary study from Sterling Winthrop, had no interpretable or useful efficacy data, so we could not uh, we did not have any data to review, so that leaves 12. The parallel group BEI study, 10 Sterling Winthrop crossover studies, and a crossover study from Columbia University. Next slide, please. I will discuss the BEI 1025 study next. <clears throat> 
The BEI-1025 study was performed by Whitehall Laboratories. It was the largest study and the only study with a parallel group design. It's also the only study not conducted by Sterling Winthrop that was considered to be positive. It was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, parallel group design in 200 subjects with a common cold. All subjects received four doses of 10 milligrams of phenylephrine hydrochloride or placebo over 12 hours. Whereas all 200 subjects, 100 per arm, were evaluated for symptoms, only 50 subjects, 25 per arm, received rhinometry, which was the primary endpoint. These measurements were performed at 0, 15, 30, 60, and 120 minutes after the first dose. As you see in the graphic on the right, no differences were seen in systolic or diastolic blood pressure, implying that a pharmacodynamic effect on blood pressure was not seen in this study. However, they did report changes in both NAR as well as for symptoms of nasal congestion, runny nose, and sneezing, which they judged to be significant compared with placebo, with no improvements in the symptoms of cough or muscle ache. That said, there were issues with the study, including that the methodology to reduce bias and the scoring methodology for symptoms were not specified, and no adjustments were made for multiplicity. In fact, the protocol is referred to in the study report but was never submitted to the docket. There are also significant issues in interpreting the symptom results, which were secondary endpoints. While it appears that baseline symptoms were rated on a scale of five from mild to severe, it appears that improvement may have been rated on a zero to two scale, with zero being no change and two being much improved, and that this evaluation was performed by the subjects and investigators. Have we, however, we do not know the frequency of the scoring, whether it was instantaneous or reflective, and how much weight was placed on investigator judgment. That said, one must ask why a nasal decongestant, which would only be expected to help obstructive congestion symptoms, would also help runny nose or sneezing symptoms, which throws suspicion on the results for the obstructive symptoms. Next slide, please. Here you see the results that were reported for NAR over two hours following the first dose. The study used percent change from baseline as the primary endpoint, which is on the right. And absolute change is on the left, and percent reduction at each time point is shown in the box on the right. Next slide, please. Next, the so-called negative study from Columbia University. Next slide, please. This study was conducted over several years and the results were published in several journey, journals as the study progressed, both by Pickerman and Rogers. It was performed at Columbia University. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study conducted in 57 patients with reversible non-atopic nasal congestion. Now, the ANPR only reported on 20 of these subjects, whereas in this slide, I'm showing the full study results. The investigator had spent several years studying and developing new methodology to have more accurate nasal airway resistance measurements, including designing their own measurement instrument based on naval diving equipment. They had also looked at 47 healthy volunteers over an extended period of time including over the course of a day between each nostril and when they became ill with a cold. So they had a significant baseline of information upon which to evaluate drug treatments. Treatments included placebo, pseudoephedrine 60 milligrams, phenylpropanolamine 40 milligrams, and three doses of phenylephrine 10, 20, and 40 milligrams. As you see in the graphic on the right, there was no change in NAR for placebo or the 10 milligram phenylephrine dose. 
but significant reductions were noted for pseudoephedrine and phenylpropanolamine. Not shown in the graphic are the 20 and 40 milligram doses, which are reported as having been negative as well. It's also important to note that this study contained not one, but two positive controls that clearly showed an effect, whereas both placebo and three doses of phenylephrine did not. Next slide, please. Now we come to the 10 studies conducted by Sterling Winthrop, of which six were considered positive and four were negative. Next slide, please. And the Sterling Winthrop studies were conducted at three different sites, but all used essentially the same protocol and endpoints. They were randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, two-way cross of studies in subjects with colds. The primary endpoint was nasal airway resistance, and the secondary endpoint was symptoms, which were generally not considered if NAR was not positive. That said, there was no clear delineation in the study reports for how symptom results were collected. Next slide, please. This table shows the number of completed subjects in the 10 studies. On the left, you see the site names and the study numbers, which I've grouped by site rather than in chronologic order. Studies considered positive for NAR results are in red font. Across the top are the various phenylephrine doses studied, as well as doses of several positive controls. All subjects were crossed over with placebo, and the number of completed subjects for each study dose are shown within the table itself. The monographed 10 milligram dose column is shown in pink. I want to point out two things here. First, note the very small number of subjects studied at each site and each dose, especially when compared with the table I showed for the new trials. Second, all the studies performed at the Elizabeth study site were positive, as were all the doses studied. That is the group of five studies listed first. And in the second group, representing two other study sites, Neither of the two studies at the Huntington site and only one of the three studies at the Sintest site were positive. One has to ask the question of why that is. At least part of the answer is that there is no standardization of the NAR methodology, resulting in a procedure that's highly technician and equipment dependent. This may be the reason that the Huntington one study listed immediately below the five Elizabeth studies, all the also found no effect for phenylpropanolamine when it should have shown one. You also see that doses up to 25 milligrams also failed at several of those sites, whereas they were positive at the Elizabeth site, again reinforcing that the procedure is not sufficiently standardized such that it is difficult to transport from one site to another. That said, none of the studies documented an effect on systolic blood pressure, suggesting that an alpha-1 receptors, that, I'm sorry, that the alpha-1 receptors were not activated by any of the phenylephrine doses studied. Next slide, please. Further, two of the Elizabeth studies, four and five, were terminated early due to insufficient enrollment at the end of the cold season. Hence, the number of subjects in these two studies are even more limited than in the other studies. And I might add, it's Elizabeth II, V, and Sintest I that drove those origin that original meta-analysis that the citizen petitioners, should, uh, that slide that I showed you earlier from the citizen petitioners. Next slide, please. I will not show all of the results from, this, from these studies, only this one slide, which compares the results of the 10 milligram dose at, um, in two of the Sterling Winthrop studies 
that resulted in markedly different results. Elizabeth II on the left and Sintes III on the right. And you'll see that Elizabeth II was positive and Sintes III was negative. Look at the general curves because the reports use different y-axes with objective change from baseline for Elizabeth II on the left and change from baseline as a fraction of the reading for Sintest III on the right. So they're not directly comparable. Yet, you can still visually see that there's a vast difference in the curves, which provides some illustration of how different the results were from one study to the next. I will not touch on symptoms because the study reports are such that the manner in which they were captured is entirely opaque. Next slide, please. Going back to the DESI panel's conclusions, they concluded that the data were, quote, not strongly indicative of efficacy, unquote, but in the absence of a safety issue, they recommended that the 10 milligram dose, which was the marketed oral dose, be considered grace. That said, they knew there were significant failed studies and that the positive data were weak. They also knew that it takes an oral dose of close to 100 milligrams to have a consistent pharmacodynamic effect on systolic blood pressure. While they did not know what we now know about the bioavailability profile, namely less than 1%, data that were not available until better assays were developed around the turn of this century. Next slide, please. Now I will discuss our evaluation of those studies. Next slide. And the first thing to say here is that these studies were performed in a much different era. Before ICH, or the International Council for Harmonization, was established, or guidances for how to design and conduct clinical trials were published. But I want to be really clear about this. Just because these studies predate those guidances does not make them bad or unacceptable. However, in this case, we have reason to go back and look at these studies. And when we do, we look through the new lens and we see anomalies and huge variability in the results that cannot be easily explained. The study reports are not specific and systematic, and the protocols were never submitted to the docket. So it's impossible to verify that the, that the design and conduct of these studies were sufficient to prevent the introduction of unintended bias. And more specifically, it's unclear if appropriate study monitoring and auditing occurred. Procedures that might have identified the issues that we see with the data anomalies. I will also add that these in these studies, clinical symptoms are poorly documented as to how and when they were collected or scored and by whom, subject or investigator. Therefore, they cannot be relied on to provide helpful information. So one has no choice but to rely on the primary endpoint, which was NAR. There are three problems with this approach. One, the NAR procedure isn't standardized. It's highly variable and it's subject to numerous methodological issues related to the measurement tools, measurement technique, and technician training and competence. This may explain why there were so many failed studies and a lack of reproducibility at and between study sites. Two, the endpoint point of NAR was never validated, meaning that we have no information that allows us to translate changes in NAR to a clinical benefit in nasal congestion. So there is no information on clinical relevance. And three, and probably the most important, NAR is a surrogate endpoint. And the use of surrogate endpoints is fine when we don't have a way to directly measure the effect. There are lots of examples of that. But in this case, we have a validated and accepted endpoint of nasal congestion symptom scoring that has been used for the last 30 plus years. 
and phenylephrine is monographed to treat the symptom of nasal congestion. As a result, FDA would no longer accept NAR because we have available an accepted way to directly assess, assess the symptom itself. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I addressed the issue of blinding protocols and bias in the previous slide, so I'll skip the first bullet. All were single center studies and all had extremely small ends with no sample size calculations, no statistical analysis plans, and no controls for multiplicity. Further, as I showed you before, two of the five positive studies from the Elizabeth site ended early due to enrollment issues. The bottom line is that none of the original studies stand up to modern standards of study design or contact. Next slide, please. As we reviewed the 10 Sterling Winthrop studies, we also noted, as had the petitioners and Dr. Lin in 2007, that, that the findings at the Elizabeth site were highly inconsistent with those from the other two study sites. In fact, in retrospect, we found evidence that there may have been data integrity issues at the Elizabeth study site. Some of this evidence was contemporaneous. First, the study report from the Syntest 2 study notes that after being unable to duplicate the results from the Elizabeth site, they visited the Elizabeth site to observe the techniques being used and to ensure that they were doing the same, but that they, they did not find any significant differences. Second, after the Huntington 1 study was unable to duplicate the Elizabeth study, uh, results, they performed a standard deviation analysis of the results from all three study sites that had been conducted in studies that had been conducted thus far and compared them with the standard deviation at their own site. A table in the Huntington 1 study report shows that the standard deviations at the Elizabeth site were 10 times or more smaller than at the other two sites. Finally, we also found that the results from the Elizabeth two and five studies are near textbook perfect. The curves mimic the known PK curve at the time and show no change from baseline in placebo, something that would not be expected based on the study size, variability of the endpoint, and what we now know about the bioavailability of oral phenylephrine. Finally, there was a publication from 2010 that included a forensic analysis on the last significant digit, which is the tenths column, in Elizabeth studies two and five, which were the most positive studies. For the Elizabeth two study, they found an unusual occurrence of the digit five which they believe would not have occurred randomly or by chance. Next slide, please. And there is one additional study that was published but never submitted to the docket and was not considered by the DESI panel, but I present it here for completeness sake. Next slide. This study was published by Cohen in 1972. There appears to, this appears to be the same author as that of the Whitehall's BEI 1025 study, although it also appears from the notations in the publication that it was supported by Sterling Winthrop, who provided the study drug and matching placebo as well as the randomization codes. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, single-dose, two-way crossover study in 48 subjects, 16 per arm, who were experiencing cold symptoms. You see the doses of phenylephrine studied and crossed over with placebo, 10, 15, and 25 milligrams. The primary endpoint was nasal airway resistance, and the second and secondary endpoint was nasal congestion on a five-point scale. That said, this study appears to have the same methodological and statistical issues as I mentioned for all of the other DESI studies. 
Next slide, please. Again, you see no meaningful change in systolic blood pressure with any of the doses and no differences from placebo. Next slide, please. Here are the results, which appear to show a positive effect for each dose of phenylephrine in both NAR on the left and nasal congestion scores on the right. Next slide, please. So to summarize, next slide. I've shown you two sets of data with differing results. How to explain the discrepancies between these two sets of data? You heard from Dr. Wren that only the parent, not its metabolites, are active, and that less than 1% of an oral dose is active parent phenylephrine. So the drug concentrations, namely Cmax, following a 10 milligram dose are far less than the EC50 for the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. This observ observation indicates that an active pharmacodynamic effect is unlikely to be achieved. The lack of a consistent blood pressure effects at 10 milligrams also suggests a lack of alpha adrenergic receptor activation. Together, both the PK and PD data suggest that much higher doses, perhaps 100 milligrams or more, might be needed to achieve a nasal decongestant effect. We also know that what is systemically bioavailable after a 10 milligram overall dose results in a very short half-life. Next slide, please. We found numerous methodological and statistical issues in the original studies do do not match today's clinical design and conduct standards. The studies relied on the surrogate endpoint of NAR, which is not validated. So we have no idea how it relates to clinical relevance. And there were significant inconsistencies in the results between various study centers. Therefore, we do not believe we can generalize the results of these studies to individuals who feel that they need treatment for congestion. On the other hand, multiple data sources support that oral phenylephrine at monograph doses, as well as extended release doses of 30 milligrams and IR doses up to 40 milligrams do not show efficacy. These trials use the accepted direct measurement of nasal symptoms as the endpoint rather than an unvalidated surrogate endpoint. They include two environmental exposure unit studies and three large, well-designed and conducted clinical trials, two in subjects with SAR and one in subjects with colds. In all of these trials, phenylephrine was shown to be no more effective than placebo. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we believe that the original studies were methodologically unsound and do not match today's standards. By contrast, we believe that the new data are credible and do not provide evidence that oral phenylephrine is effective as a nasal decongestant. Further, the data suggests that immediate release doses up to 40 milligrams may not be effective. And finally, the pharmacodynamic data suggests that higher doses, which have not been fully studied, might present a safety issue because they might be associated with systemic blood pressure and circulatory effects. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. My name is Tracy Pham. I am a drug use analyst from the Division of Epidemiology, Office of Savellan and Epidemiology, FDA. To provide context for today's discussion, I will provide the findings on the sales patterns of OTC oral products containing phenylephrine or pseudoephedrine. Next slide. 
We assessed two databases. One database provides sales from manufacturers and wholesalers to assess use patterns over time since year 2000. And another database provides sales from retail stores to assess the most recent use patterns since year 2018. As outlined on this slide, I will provide findings on the sales from these two databases, their limitations, and the summary of key findings at the end of my presentation. Next slide. To gain insight into the use of phenylephrine compared to pseudoephedrine in the context of the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act, we assessed the estimates of bottles and packages of these products sold over time from 2000 to 2022. To achieve this, we analyzed the manufacturer sale database, which measures volumes of drugs sold from manufacturers and wholesalers to retail and non-retail settings of care in the U.S. Note that although the manufacturer sale database captures OTC sales back to 1992, the database are underestimated because the database, the data are underestimated because the database captures less than 50% of sales of all OTC products. Next slide. This graph shows the estimates of bottles and packages of OTC oral products containing phenylephrine and, or pseudoephedrine sold by manufacturers and wholesalers over time from 2000 to 2022. As shown by the red line on the figure, pseudoephedrine sales decreased since 2001. As shown by the blue line, phenylephrine sales increased from 2004 to 2009, but declined from 2009 to 2020, before increasing again in 2021 and in, two, uh, and in 2022. Next slide. To gain insight into the current use of phenylephrine compared to pseudoephedrine, we assess the estimates of bottles and packages of these products sold from U.S. retail stores to consumers from 2018 to 2022. To achieve this, we analyzed the retail sales database, which captures point of sales of OTC drugs to consumers from a panel of retail stores in the U.S., such as grocery and drug stores and super centers. Note that the retail sale data provide a better and comprehensive view of the current sales pattern and should not be directly compared to the manufacturer sale data shown in the previous slide. Next slide. This graph shows the estimates of bottles and packages of OTC oral products containing phenylephrine or pseudoephedrine sold from U.S. retail stores to consumers from 2018 to 2022. As shown by the blue bars, Phenylephrine accounted for the majority of retail sales throughout the study period. In 2022, approximately 242 million bottles and packages of phenylephrine were sold to the consumers, compared to 51 million bottles and packages of pseudoephedrine, as shown by the red, line, uh, the red bars. From 2018 to 2021, Phenylephrine retail sales decreased by 16%, and pseudoephedrine sales decreased by 19%. But from 2021 to 2022, phenylephrine retail sales increased by 31%, and pseudoephedrine retail sales increased by 16%. Next slide. We also assessed the retail sales in dollars Note that the sales in dollars represent the price of a manufacturer's pack before the wholesaler markup is applied. Sale patterns in dollars were similar to sale patterns in bottles and packages. As shown by the blue bars, phenylephrine products accounted for the majority of retail sale dollars throughout the study period. 
In 2022, the total retail sales of OTC phenylephrine products represented approximately $1.8 billion, compared to half a billion dollars of pseudoephedrine products as shown by the red bars. Next slide. On this slide, I would like to restate the limitations of the databases used for the OTC cell analyses. The manufacturer cell data are, are underestimated because the database captures less than 50% of sales of all OTC products. The retail cell data provide a better and comprehensive view of the current sale pattern and should not be directly compared to the manufacturer's sales because the retail sale database captures direct OTC point of sales from a sample of 80% or more retail stores. However, these data may still be underestimated because they do not capture sales activity from internet and phone sales or retail stores such as Costco and convenience stores. Next slide. To summarize, phenylephrine had higher proportions of manufacture and retail sales than pseudoephedrine. Since 2018, phenylephrine accounted for the majority of retail sales in both bottle and packages and in sale dollars. Retail sales of phenylephrine and pseudoephedrine decreased from 2018 to 2021 before increasing in 2022. In 2022, phenylephrine retail sales represented $1.8 billion compared to half a billion dollars of pseudoephedrine retail sales. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Please pull up slide number five. We will now take clarifying questions for the FDA presenters. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question and remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you've asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can, including uh, a slide title or a slide number if that's available. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and the end of any follow-up questions with that is all for my questions so that we can move on to the next panel member. And as we begin, I would also ask that perhaps if you have several questions that you might go ahead and ask them one at a time so that everyone has a chance to speak in the available slot before uh, we break for lunch. All right. So any clarifying questions from our committee members? Uh, yes, Dr. Clement, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Um, very enlightening presentation from all the presenters. Um, incredibly enlightening, actually. Um, I had a question if Dr. Bishop 
is still available. Ben Bishop on the regulatory history. So I'll turn the podium to Dr. Ben Bishop. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, being uh, new to this panel, um, I'm not intimately familiar with all the legislative activity that's been going on. And you had mentioned the CARES Act as being a significant event. Um, you said at 2020, the Coronavirus CARES Act uh, had a significant um, impact on the OTC monographs. Can you explain a little bit more about that and how that impacts our decision and when we're looking at the data? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. So I think the best way to describe it would be to compare the three steps of the previous rulemaking process, uh, which consisted of an advanced notice of, of uh, rulemaking, then the FDA would review any data and comments submitted. The second step would, consisted of the FDA issuing a tentative uh, proposed rule or a tentative monograph. And uh, then again, allowing uh, for the review of any comments or data to come in. And finally, ending with the third step of issuing a final monograph or final rule. Uh, this process took to take months to years and and was was very drawn out. The CARES Act provided for the posting of orders or administrative orders, uh, which the FDA uh, which we can use to post a an order for a OTC monograph. Um, and and streamline that that process considerably. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. This is uh, Terry Michelle, non-prescription drugs. So just to augment what Dr. Bishop said, which was um, a very nice outline of one of the most important changes under the monograph of the CARES Act, I just wanted to highlight one of the things that did not change. So the, the standards for efficacy did not change under the monograph, nor did the fact that the monograph is still a public process and the data need to be publicly available in order for the public to have the opportunity to comment. In addition, monograph reform did not change the fact that the monograph represents all of the conditions of use in the monograph, and manufacturers can come to the market without FDA pre-approval as long as they are following those conditions of the monograph. So an efficacy determination is not just for a particular drug product, but for all of the drug products containing oral phenylephrine that follow the conditions of the monograph. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call on Dr. Pisarek. Please go ahead. Pisarek, um, I just have a question. Um, it seems like alpha adrenergic activity, if it's sufficient, increases blood pressure. And we know that pseudofedrin works to help with nasal congestion. By how much does it increase the stock blood pressure? And as an aside, phenylpropanolamine was effective was taken off the market because of um, hemorrhagic strokes in women. Did that also increase blood pressure? So hi, Terry Michelle, non-prescription drugs. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Wren to answer that question. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Yeah, this is Dr. Wren. Um, so let me clarify a little bit. The magnets for action for pseudoephedrine for treating nasal decongestion is different from the phenylephrine or even phenylpropanolamine. Pseudoephedrine is a non-selective weak alpha and beta adrenergic agonist. The principal mechanism of pseudoephedrine, if you 
if you read from a, a multiple textbook, it was written that it is considered um, to displace the noradrenaline from the presynaptic vesicles, which this noradrenaline is released to active the postsynaptic adrenergic receptors. So that's why the magnetic action is different. It's indirect, unlike phenylephrine, it's directly acting on the alpha adrenergic activity. And talking about um, a literature report, any systemic alpha adrenergic activity, such as blood pressure measurement following the pseudoephedrine, yes, there are some uh, papers published, but they, there's no dedicated paper as as the one we have presented, which uh, the dose ranging study following the phenylephrine, you have intensive measuring, like o o almost uh, f more than five or even uh, more time points within one hour um, following the dose administration to, to exactly follow this uh, uh, blood pressure change. If you're talking about a sporadic studies report about the blood pressure increase from baseline, they are mostly for safety purpose. Let's say, oh, okay, after like one hour, two hour, uh, let's let's measure one time or twice the blood pressure. And you won't uh, notice they are having significant change. I would say it's due to the defect of the data, uh, the time points. And uh, phenol, Propnamine, it's, it's also a non-selective um, adrenergic ag uh, agonist, but mainly it also works directly on the alpha-1 uh, adrenergic activity. And a uh, um, couple years ago, FDA was joined uh, because of the hemorrhage adverse event in the um, in cranially. So um, therefore, uh, uh, we suspect there could be some systemic alpha adrenergic activity out there. Play a role there. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ren and Dr. Pizarek. Um, Dr. Lee, please go ahead. Hi, um, I have several questions for Dr. Ren and one for Dr. Pham. So, I'll start with Dr. Ren. Um, you've indicated in your pharmacology data that. Um, with the recent data, the bioavailability is 1%, and that was very clear. I'm curious as to, uh, has FDA issued a warning letter, advisory memo to, um, to help pharmacists and clinicians know um, and be very aware of this data? As most of the cited, and as you noted in your um, uh, briefing document, that most uh, clinicians and pharmacists would actually cite like about 38% bioavailability. So that's my first question. Okay, I can answer the 38% question and then I'll defer to Dr. Michelle regarding the communication to, uh, to the public and sponsors regarding this. Uh, let's go to um, backup slide uh, 12, page 12, please. Okay, this is a Huxman uh, 1982 paper, came into conclusion that the oral bioavailability for parent phenylephrine was 38%. In this paper, the authors compare the parent phenylephrine PK profile following the oral administering route as shown in white circles in this figure, and PK following the IV infusion as shown in the black circles in this figure. The authors calculate the oral bioavailability by dividing the parent phenylephrine AUC value following the oral administration by the AUC value following the IV administration. This is a standard approach to calculate the relative bioavailability, which FDA did the same thing for today's presentation. However, the effect of this paper, or the defect of this paper was the PK sampling scheme, which was not implemented equally between the oral administration and IV administration. The first PK sample following the oral administration was collected just minutes after the oral dose, which captured the initial absorption phase following the oral administration route. However, the first PK sample following the IV infusion was not collected until the end of the IV infusion, which the infusion itself took up to about 20 minutes to complete in this study. <laughs> 
We all know the effective half-life of an elaborate following IV infusion route is about only five minutes. Therefore, you will miss a lot of phenylephrine systemic exposure or AOC values if you only start to collect PK samples at the end of the infusion. This will artificially lower the AUC values following the IV infusion and consequently artificially inflate the oral bioavailability value. In another word, for a fair and more appropriate comparison, the authors of this paper should collect the first PK sample following the IV infusion starting at minus 20 minutes in this figure. So I'll defer to Dr. Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Ren and Dr. Lee. So just to follow up on your question with regard to communication about these results to the public. So the first thing that I want to note is that all of the data that we presented today is taken from publicly available sources. So all of these data are available to the public. The second thing that I want to note is that the point of this meeting is to help us think about what these data show. And so you'll note that the final question that's in your briefing document is, and in the, the final questions that were submitted to the committee, uh, is to talk about the communication of this information and how that might be best communicated to the public, um, if at all. So I, I rely on this committee. I know that uh, we have several uh, experts on the committee with expertise in public communication and risk communication, and I'll look forward to a meaningful discussion on that point um, on day two. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to continue with the clarifying question for Dr. Pham. Go, go ahead, Dr. Lee. Okay. Um, so in, I believe it was slide 116 that was presented where you were providing retail sales, point of sales uh, data from different um, uh, pharmacies, et cetera. I, and one of the exclusion that was listed was Costco. Now, I know that could be, the data there could be overwhelming um, and significantly in, in, increase the numbers. I'm curious as to why Costco was excluded. I'll turn that question to Dr. Fan. Hi, Tracy Pham, FDA. Um, so we have uh, contracts with uh, outside vendors to get these databases. Uh, and Costco is one of that uh, uh, store, retail stores that would not provide uh, the data to that vendor. Um, so uh, it's it just something that they don't want to, um, you know, uh, publicly share that uh, information. Um, so that that's why we don't have information um, you know, uh, sales from uh, from Costco um, and you know uh, other um, uh, retail avenues such as like uh, uh, Amazon or you know internet sales. Uh, we don't get that information either. Um, it's just because it's just not available uh, to the to the vendor that collect that data. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank That's you. all I have. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Fig, you, you may go ahead. Uh, hi, um, I'd like to follow up with and Dr. Please do state your name for the record. Just Oh, sure, uh, William, William Fig uh, from the National Cancer Institute. Um, I would like to uh, go back to Dr. Wren's slide that he just showed uh, in response to uh, Dr. Lee's question, the, the uh, IV versus oral. Could we have backup slide number 12, please? And I'll turn the podium to Dr. Wren. Okay. So is this the same uh, 10 milligrams uh, for each? Is that correct? No, it's not. As, as you see, um, it's uh, tritium labeled uh, phenylephrine at that time conducted in, in this study. The, the dose is not 10 milligram. It's, well, it's the dose. 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, as I presented on the slide, uh, oh. it's 0.99 milligram. Or okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, and how does that uh, correlate with the C max with the 10 milligrams then? Okay. Or the so, oral. Okay, this means uh, um, from FDA. Um, a completely different method was, bionetical method was used in that 1982 paper. So I can't do like a, a even orange to apple comparison because it's different, very different, very old fashioned uh, bionetical assay. So here you may uh, notice the, um, the, the absolute value on the y-axis, it's the um, uh, log scale. Um, uh, but uh, we can't really compare that absolute value to, to the nowadays value right now. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that, and, and I apologize, but um, it seems to me that the, the, there is more to the difference in, in the bioavailability than simply the sampling time here. Um, but but uh, we'd have to compare those because uh, if I remember the slides you showed previously, you were showing uh, the the C max for ten milligrams to be incomparable to this, and this is is ten times uh, less milligrams being given. Let me ask one other question: um, the the PK associated with the total. Uh, phenylephrine um, is unusual. Most of the time, we do not report all the metabolites uh, to come up with PK. Why was that being done by whoever published it? Okay, so uh, let me go back to history. Because as, sh as, as I have shown, the parent phenylephrine concentration, the plasma concentration following the oral dose, is very, very low. It, it has been a a challenge in the last century to accurately, reliably, to measure that this parent phenylephrine concentration in the last century, and uh, barely successful. So therefore, that's why different sponsors, investigators, they turn to measure the total phenylephrine concentration, which, you know, including the phenylephrine, which uh, is hydrolyzed from the metabolites. metabolites. That's how it come into uh, the PK measurement. Um, it, was not, it was not until uh, the turn of this century that some more sensitive LCMS um, methodology was developed uh, so that uh, more sponsors and investigators they can measure the phenylephrine, parent phenylephrine more accurately. And here I said this is a very old fashioned, um, uh, probably not even uh, HPRC method. Um, and it, because it's a very different method, you, you can't really compare uh, the absolute value from this study to, to the current studies. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been doing pharmacokinetics for 35 years and have never published a, a, where I report the total uh, metabolites plus the parent for pharmacokinetics. It's very unusual. So um, I, th I thank you for the insight. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Thank you. I'm looking to see if there's any further questions from the committee. So since we do have some time, um, I may ask a question of my own. Um, so this question, so it's Maria Coyle, uh, and this question would be directed to Dr. Stark. Um, I'm wondering if you could revisit or um, re-explain a couple of points from um, the uh, more contemporary trials that you uh, walked us through so expertly earlier. Um, in particular, the dose ranging trial from Merck, you had discussed how the finding, how the findings could be interpreted in the context um, of the study method only being partially blinded. So uh, I think it would be helpful for me and maybe others to hear that explanation um, again, if, if you don't mind. Could we have slide number 62 up, please, from the main slide deck? Hi, this is Dr. Stark. 
So um, it's a little complex to try to describe what happened here because the publication and the, uh, the results that are at clinicaltrials.gov don't quite mesh. Clinicaltrials.gov describes five placebo um, doses for each, uh, up to five uh, for each, meaning that it was dummied with placebo and uh, along with the active. And patients could see the difference because one had, well, they were both red, but one had some concave uh, in, in the tablet. So they looked a little different. Uh, that is uh, both the explanation for the partial blinding and also there's some confusion in terms of how many tablets each subject got at each time point. Did I answer your question or do I need to go further? Um, that's very helpful context. I, you had gone on to provide some additional um, sort of explanation of how you felt this might potentially have impacted the results. Um, so if you could maybe just restate that for my benefit. Thank you, uh, Maria. Oh, certainly. Um, so this is Dr. Stork again. So as you see in the blue boxes, there were four doses of phenylephrine given, but only one dose of placebo. So you have, if patients were to guess their allocation, they would uh, have a four to one chance of guessing that they were on some dose of phenylephrine. Now they might be able to, or might not, based on the partial blinding, be able to guess the approximate dose. Um, and if you think about patients thinking that they're on an active versus on placebo, it would tend to make it more likely to see a difference between active and control. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to um, call on Dr. Callis uh, at, this, at this time for, for an additional question. Hi, thank you. Karim Callis from the NIH. Uh, my question is also uh, for Dr. Stark. Um, first of all, thank you very much for an excellent overview. That was really very helpful for me. M my, my question has to do with the study endpoints. And you uh, discussed those and, and, and you've identified some of the limitations, for example, with the, uh, the, the nasal airway resistance and so forth. But just kind of, if you can maybe elaborate for me, I don't have expertise in this particular area. Of, uh, so, I, so in terms of what is done in contemporary studies, not studies necessarily with these particular agents, just in, in terms of the, that particular specialty, if you, if you can comment maybe on that and, and why, uh, you know, why one particular endpoint might be favored uh, over another. I'm looking at you know, objectivity, subjectivity of the, the outcome measures, et cetera, but if you can elaborate more on contemporary uh, studies in this area. Certainly, this is Dr. Stark. Um, I'm happy to, and I know there's also a panel member who's an expert in this area as well, and he may um, actually maybe more than one, and they may want to chime in as well. Um, so e yes, it is entirely correct. And you can go to slide 97, main slide 97. Um, it's entirely correct that nasal airway resist resistance is theoretically an objective measure. Um, and um, it's, it's reasonable to expect under normal circumstances that an objective measure might have some meaning. There's a problem, however, with this measure, and I outlined it. Um, in the talk, and let me just briefly hit on them. Uh, first, it's not a standardized measure. So there's multiple publications that suggest ways to get the results from this NAR measurement. And um, 
Each of those uses a slightly different technique. As I described in the Columbia study, they actually started, they, they, they attempted to, if you read that publication, you see that they attempted to, to um, look at the various techniques that had been published, and they couldn't come up with one that was uh, able to be um, repeatable, to get demonstratively repeatable results. So what did they do? They actually used a, a naval um, mask, diving mask to create their own methodology. And um, so what you have is a, is a, a non-standardized technique. That's number one. And it doesn't necessarily translate from one study center to another. Number two, there's no information about how those NAR results, those objective results, which theoretically ought to be reasonable, translate to a clinical benefit in nasal symptoms. There's just no information we looked. Um, the best you can do is actually that EEU study that Sharing Plow Merck did and it used pseudoephedrine, which was effective, but phenylephrine was not compared to placebo. Uh, and finally, here you've got a surrogate endpoint. Um, instead of actually using the symptoms themselves, all the later studies, all the newer studies use symptom scores. That has actually been what has been used for the approval of all, as far as I know, all the allergic rhinitis drugs, including all the second generation antihistamines and various other intranasal products, the intranasal corticosteroids, intranasal antihistamines, and so on, since the early 90s. NAR has not been used in drug development for any of these drugs that I am aware of. So we have no correlation between the one and the other, and we wouldn't go back and use NAR with that, that correlation. And you can't use the same studies to validate as to use for the results. So we don't even have the validation from the original studies because of they are entirely opaque in terms of how the symptoms were collected. Thank you. Thank you. Did that, did that address your question? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Uh, so Mar Maria Coyle here. Dr. Um, Dr. Stark, before you step away, could I ask one follow-up question? Uh, you mentioned that there is no... Um, clinically significant known change in, in airway resistance, nasal airway resistance, um, that, that would demonstrate, you know, tell you that something is, is efficacious um, in relief of symptoms. Is, is there a, a, a change in that nasal congestion symptom score that we would consider clinically significant that's accepted as the standard? Um. I don't have um, the, this is Dr. Stark. I don't have the results for nasal symptom scores um, in terms of minimally effective difference uh, for um, the various uh, drugs that have been approved. But I know that um, Dr. Dykwitz, one of the panel members has published on minimally important differences, um, and perhaps he can uh, help in elucidating the answer. Yes, doc, Dr. Dykowitz, you have the floor. You, your hand is also raised. Uh, yes, I'm responding to the request. <laughs> uh, so Mark Dykowitz, um, I published in a number of areas, not only minimal uh, clinically important differences, but also been um, co-editor on national rhinitis guidelines where we've looked at all this type of data. And I guess I would summarize and, and make a couple points. Um, 
we view the uh, patient reported symptom scores as being the uh, real benchmark uh, by which we judge the impact or the effectiveness of medications. Um, physician or investigator assessed uh, improvement in symptoms has really been set aside. And this is relevant to consideration of the legacy studies. Where we're not really sure uh, what the basis of the symptom score recording was, how much of that was investigator, how much of that was uh, patient reported. Um, the other important point is that in terms of uh, nasal airway resistance, um, that has also been over time uh, reduced in importance in the sense that you don't always get a great correlation uh, between a symptom report of congestion and the um, so-called objective measures of nasal airway resistance. So as we look at the data, I think uh, I hang my hat on the the symptom scores, uh, you know, in terms of congestion specifically, it could be assessed in the morning, in the evening, you can do reflective uh, symptom scores over the previous 12 hours, uh, looking over an entire week. Uh, there are different ways you can mix and match the data. But these are these are all um, ways of uh, trying to get a sense as to not only shorter term but longer term impact on nasal congestion over a day and over a week, which of course is relevant to our uh, deliberations. Um, that would end my formal comments. Thank you, thank you, and that addressed my question as well, uh, Doctor Doctor Datto. I see your hand raised. Please go ahead. Hi, Mark Dato. Um, uh, a, a question either to Dr. Stark or Dr. Dykowitz, I guess now, is um, can either of you comment on what looks like overall response differences between the different patient populations, um, specifically you know, allergic rhinitis versus cold, and why you posit those differences? Uh, and it, it can be... Um, any of the agents, uh, but there seems to be response differences. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Terry Michelle, non-prescription drugs, FDA. So just to make a couple of comments about the differences between the platform of allergic rhinitis and the platform of colds. And this was mentioned by Dr. Stark in his presentation. So allergic rhinitis tends to give you a um, more consistent symptom score over time uh, because typically during the allergic rhinitis season, as long as the pollen counts are up, people tend to have fairly consistent symptom scores from day to day, whereas everyone understands the natural history of a cold is quite variable and tends to be quite short. So enrolling subjects in a, in a study of the common cold can be quite difficult because you can't get those consistent symptom scores um, from day to day or even from hour to hour, and it's a very short window. So I'd, I'd note that first of all. The other thing that I would note with regard to the data is that most of the studies that were done in the common cold were the studies that were from the original DESI data set. And so those studies had all the methodological limitations that um, we've just elucidated and gone over in great detail. Um, the one study that was done in the common cold in the um, newer era, if you want to put it that way, is the J&J &J study that was stopped early for lack of enrollment. Um, and that study did show no difference between um, placebo and um, phenylephrine, but as I noted, it, it was stopped early. So I'll stop there and thank you for that question. I don't know if other members of the panel wanted to respond to that as well. So just real briefly, thank you for that. So and what I'm hearing then is you attribute the differences to methodologic differences, not pathophysiologic differences between AR and cold. Is that a true statement? 
Yes, I'd also note that the indication for phenylephrine in the monograph is for um, nasal congestion, and it does not differentiate between etiologies. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dato, and thank you, Dr. Michelle. Um, I do not see additional questions uh, waiting, and it is, uh, according to our agenda, now time to break for lunch. Um, so we will go ahead and do that, and we will plan to reconvene at 12.55 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, panel members, just a reminder that there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during this lunch break. Um, additionally, we would ask that you plan to reconvene around 12.45 p.m. to ensure that you are connected before we, re before we restart the meeting at 12.55. Thank you.
Welcome back. Both the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and the public believe in a transparent process of information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the advisory committee meeting, FDA <clears throat> believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages all participants, including industry's non-employee presenters, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with industry, such as consulting fees, travel expenses, honoraria, and interest in industry, including equity interests, and those based upon the outcome of the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your presentation to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your presentation, it will not preclude you from speaking. We'll now proceed with industry presentations. Thank you. My name is Marcia Howard. I am a Vice President of Regulatory and Scientific Affairs at the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, or CHPA. CHPA is one of the oldest trade associations in the country. For more than 140 years, CHPA has worked to ensure Americans have access to safe and effective OTC medicines. These are products that consumers can count on to be reliable, to be accessible, and to save them time and money and to deliver products to get and stay healthy. We bring a science-driven perspective to all our work from regulatory interactions to consumer education. CHPA's membership includes the leading manufacturers and suppliers of consumer healthcare products, including the nine member companies involved in the manufacture and repackaging of OTC oral phenylephrine medications. These companies comprise the CHPA phenylephrine task group. The logos of the task group member companies are shown on this slide. We appreciate the opportunity to be part of today's discussion about OTC oral phenylephrine and to review the newer studies of this ingredient. We'll do this in the context of the body of science that established its efficacy. Here you see the phenylephrine drug facts label that illustrates the uses. Temporary relief of nasal congestion due to the common cold, hay fever, or other upper respiratory allergies. However, our presentation on monograph studies will focus on the common cold as most were conducted in that indication. CHPA member companies currently offer 10 milligram phenylephrine under the marketing authority of a final administrative order. The adult dose is 10 milligrams every four hours, not to exceed 60 milligrams in 24 hours. Phenylephrine is a decongested active ingredient the category of OTC nasal decongestants includes nose drops and sprays, eye drops and tablets, capsules and syrup. Not all decongestants, however, are easily accessible to consumers and consumer preference by three to one is for oral formulations rather than intranasal. Phenylephrine and pseudoephedrine are the only oral decongestants available over the counter However, only phenylephrine is available on shelves without restriction, meaning, meaning PE is not restricted to behind the counter like pseudoephedrine. Phenylephrine products occupy a substantial amount of shelf space among cough and cold products and is sold as single ingredient products or as combination products, which make up 92% of sales. Oral phenylephrine has a dosing duration of no more than seven days. FDA has also identified a few alternative treatments, including intranasal steroids and intranasal and oral antihistamines. I'd like to briefly review phenylephrine's regulatory status. By way of background, there are two pathways for a medicine to get OTC status and be marketed in the United States. One pathway is through a specific individual new drug application or NDA. NDAs typically are submitted to FDA with clinical studies to support OTC access for individual products if granted FDA marketing approval. The second pathway, and the pathway relevant for this meeting, is the OTC monograph system, 
It is a methodical scientific process in which FDA used expert advisors to systematically and efficiently review the data and literature of hundreds of established ingredients already found in thousands of medications at that time. Monographs are often referred to as a rule book or recipe for therapeutic categories. They establish the active ingredients, the uses and indications, doses, routes of administration, labeling and testing requirements that are allowed for a particular category. When FDA's advisors found that there were sufficient data to confirm the safety and effectiveness of an ingredient, that ingredient was included in the relevant monograph as generally recognized as safe and effective or grass grain. Products that meet the rules for being grass gray can be marketed without prior FDA approval, and they do not need to submit additional clinical data. This system gives the FDA the framework to regulate most of the OTC medicines American families rely on today. Oral phenylephrine was first used in the U.S. 85 years ago, before the monograph system was even created. Since then, there have been multiple key expert reviews of oral phenylephrine. Today's 2023 meeting of the Non-Prescription Drugs Advisory Committee, or NDAC, will be the third formal review of the data supporting oral phenylephrine safety and effectiveness by FDA's expert advisors. FDA's advisory review panel first collectively reviewed clinical data and the literature regarding phenylephrine in 1976. This successful re review led to the establishment of its safety and effectiveness and its grass gray status. FDA finalized the monograph for nasal decongestant products to include phenylephrine hydrochloride in the mid-1990s and amended it in the mid-2000s. In response to a 2007 citizen petition, FDA held a second advisory committee review. There was an additional citizen petition and supplement a few years later that was filed by the same petitioners. This NDAC meeting is being convened to discuss oral phenylephrine as grass gray. We believe the data support continued grass gray status in the monograph. Phenylephrine has played an important role in consumers' temporary self-treatment of nasal congestion. It is the only available oral non-prescription medicine for nasal congestion that is sold without having to show an ID or to complete a logbook. Oral phenylephrine comes in both brand name and store brand versions. Nasal congestion is one of the most bothersome symptoms associated with colds and upper respiratory allergies and is linked to decreased work productivity and quality of life and to sleep disturbances. Consumer satisfaction with oral phenylephrine is high. According to household panel data, half of American households rely on phenylephrine, and over two-thirds of these households chose to repurchase the medicines on average four times over the year, which is a strong indication of satisfaction. These products are available to consumers on grocery, drugstore, and other retail store shelves, as well as being available online. Oral phenylephrine is available in the United States and globally in places like Canada, Australia, and the UK. It has a wide margin of safety. In response to FDA's notice for this meeting, we wanted to ensure we understood the voice of the 2023 post-pandemic American consumer. CHPA fielded a cross-sectional consumer study to better understand their awareness and attitudes of phenylephrine and importantly, their experiences with effectiveness. This was an online survey of 1,200 adults who reported using oral phenylephrine within the past 12 months. They told us they rely on phenylephrine again and again. Their reasons, first, they recognize its effectiveness in treating their nasal congestion, and they see physical and personal benefits from these medicines. We heard this especially among older consumers and those living in rural, often underserved communities. They also made it clear that removing oral phenylephrine would create new burdens on them and on the healthcare system. Let's dig deeper. 83% said phenylephrine helps relieve nasal congestion. This benefit is meaningful to consumers. Two thirds of consumers reported this relief has a positive impact on them and it helps them get through their day. The need for congestion relief, which 78% reported, is clear. 
Almost 70% said that mild to moderate nasal congestion has a negative effect on their daily activities, on sleep, and on their work. In particular interest, given the FDA's briefing document, we also asked consumers what they would do if oral phenylephrine were no longer available. 42% would try to obtain pseudoephedrine, which is behind the counter. A large percentage of consumers who would otherwise self-treat their temporary nasal congestion would unnecessarily burden the healthcare system if they didn't have phenylephrine. This means engaging with the pharmacist, doctor, or other healthcare provider. 39% would make an appointment with a doctor. 26% would go to a clinic or an urgent care. In addition, 14% would go without treatment. The voice of the consumer survey underscores how your discussions today could have unintended consequences on millions, including the more than 50% of American households that rely on phenylephrine and find it effective for their needs and on the overall healthcare system. First, we know that many consumers would turn to pseudoephedrine. However, there are challenges with pseudoephedrine's availability due to the Combat Meth Act. It would take more than 12 to 18 months for consumers, excuse me, for manufacturers to increase the amount of pseudoephedrine that they can make due to regulations involving licenses, security requirements, and the Drug Enforcement Administration or DEA quotas. These are all due to the potential for methamphetamine diversion. That's on the manufacturing side. To sell pseudoephedrine, a retailer needs to register with the DEA, conduct and certify employee training, and follow strict record keeping and reporting requirements on sales. There is also limited shelf space behind the counter. And as a practical matter, this significantly limits the numbers and types of outlets selling pseudoephedrine. Focusing on the consumer most importantly, Pseudoephedrine is available only behind the counter or retail counter. It has daily and monthly purchase limits and requires signing a logbook and showing identification. These restrictions pose unequal burdens on consumers who live in areas with limited access to pharmacies based on geography, such as rural areas and other areas in pharmacy des deserts, those whose work schedules don't coincide with when pharmacies are open, and those with other socioeconomic factors. As we saw in the survey, many self-care consumers may try to go to a doctor's appointment or to urgent care, which would mean new and increased re resource burdens, or they would go without treatment. This could lead to potential for worsened clinical outcomes. During our review today, we'll address issues cited by FDA in its briefing materials and misconceptions about phenylephrine, specifically, we oppose removing oral phenylephrine from the final monograph. Our position is that the totality of the evidence supports its status as generally recognized as safe and effective. Consumer repurchase data indicate high consumer satisfaction, and through the attitude survey, the voice of the consumer reinforces their satisfaction with oral phenylephrine's effectiveness. We will also address misconceptions about phenylephrine's efficacy as it relates to bioavailability, in vitro potency and clinical PK, and the lack of clinically significant adverse pressor effects at its label dose. We'll also address our position on nasal airway resistance. This primary objective endpoint was used in the monograph studies along with subjective measures. Our position is that NAR remains an appropriate objective endpoint to assess phenylephrine's labeled indication, temporary nasal decongestion. FDA refers to the monograph studies in its briefing document, but the scientific basis and the measurements of these studies are nonetheless still appropriate and relevant today. We'll also discuss the post-2007 allergic rhinitis studies, which FDA contends do not support efficacy. Certainly, these newer studies have limitations, so we look forward to this committee's thoughts on their interpretability. We'll also discuss the two meta-analyses presented at the 2007 NDAC. FDA refers to them as inconclusive. However, we'll show that Dr. Kohler's meta-analysis used some more clinically relevant endpoints and methods.
Lastly, we will also provide our perspective on the potential for significant unintended consequences of a change in fennel efforts grass gray status. Our position is that this is a safe and effective medicine and its removal will result in increased demand for pseudoephedrine and a shortage of FDA approved on shelf medications. It would have supply chain implications and would cause an, un, an increased burden on the consumers we serve and on the healthcare system. We appreciate the committee's attention for these discussions today. Here's our agenda for the rest of the presentation and the experts who will speak to these issues. All outside speakers are being compensated for their time. We also have two additional responders with us today. Thank you, and I will now turn the podium over to Dr. Drews. Thank you, Dr. Howard, and good afternoon. My name is Howard Drews. I am a practicing allergist, immunologist, and clinical professor of medicine at Rutgers New Jersey School of Medicine in Newark, New Jersey. I have specialized in researching and treating conditions such as allergic rhinitis, non-allergic rhinitis, the common cold, and sinusitis for over 30 years. I am here today because of my clinical and research background in nasal physiology, as well as clinical practice. I have spent most of my career developing clinical endpoints for symptoms such as nasal congestion, cough, and other re respiratory symptoms. Before I address issues regarding the efficacy of phenylephrine, I would like to walk you through the pathogenesis of nasal congestion. It is well known, and it is my clinical experience, that most people who have upper respiratory allergies who I, whom I will refer to as sufferers, have limited, transient, or mild symptoms and self-manage their condition appropriately. If they need medication, they can go to a drugstore or supermarket and buy what they need at the time to relieve their symptoms even when the pharmacy is closed. For a common cold, the proportion is even higher. Sufferers rarely need to seek care from a healthcare provider for a cold. Oral phenylephrine 10 milligrams is fit for purpose in my perspective because it is labeled to provide temporary relief of nasal congestion caused by the common cold and upper respiratory allergies. As you will see in this presentation, I will demonstrate ample evidence based on appropriate clinical endpoints to justify its specific labeled indications. Let's consider temporary nasal congestion. How does it occur and what is the pathology behind it? Sufferers who have a common cold or the early symptoms of upper respiratory allergies experience dilatation of the blood vessels in the lining of the nose overlying the turbinate bones. They may also have increased nasal drip. The inside of the nose is lined with tiny blood vessels, arterioles and venules which connect to the capillary sinusoid bed. Blood flow is increased to these blood vessels when the nose is irritated regardless of the trigger. This causes swelling within the nasal lining, blocking the nasal passageways, making breathing difficult. Also, mucus glands within the nose secrete more mucus to trap allergens or other irritants, contributing to nasal congestion and creating a sensation of stuffiness. Nasal decongestants act upon sympathomimetic alpha-1 receptors within the nasal mucosa. The alpha-1 receptors are found on blood vessels throughout the body, with large numbers found in the arterioles and venules supplying blood to the capillary sinusoids inside the nasal turbinates. The turbinate mucosa is the major site of local action for decongestant drugs. <clears throat> 
the capacitance blood vessels within the mucosa above the turbinates alternate between congestion and decongestion during the nasal cycle. The degree of swelling of the nasal lining varies throughout the day on a cyclical basis. Usually, we only detect this by noting we are breathing through one nostril or the other. The left plot shows a sufferer's spontaneous changes in unilateral nasal airway resistance over time, perceived as nasal congestion while suffering from an acute respiratory tract infection. This nasal cycle is only perceived as congestion when the cycle is exaggerated with conditions such as colds and upper respiratory allergies. On the right plot is the same person six to eight weeks later showing virtually no increased nasal resistance. Dilatation of the blood vessels within the lining of the inferior turbinates is the major feature of temporary nasal congestion, but also there is increased nasal fluid containing mucus, which together results in the narrowing of nasal passages and the perception of nasal congestion and stuffiness. The mechanism by which decongestants produce their action is activation of postjunctional alpha adrenergic receptors found on the precapillary and postcapillary blood vessels in the nasal mucosa. Activation of alpha receptors is by either direct binding of the sympathomimetic agent to the receptor's binding site or by the enhanced release of norepinephrine. This results in vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction decreases blood flow through the nasal mucosa and results in shrinkage of the tissue. Nasal congestion is the most bothersome symptom of the common cold and upper respiratory allergies. Common cold and seasonal allergic rhinitis are different conditions based on their etiology, pathophysiology, time course, and their different response to medications. However, the mechanism of vasoconstriction is the same in both cases. In established allergic rhinitis, the inflammatory IgE-mediated hypersensitivity response affects the overall tissue recoil of nasal turbinates, and using vasoconstrictors alone may not remediate nasal congestion. Congestion due to the natural cold or due to upper respiratory allergies is an acute condition that is self-diagnosed and self-treatable by the vast majority of consumers using over-the-counter products without healthcare professional consultation. Let us now look at the histopathology. Common cold and allergic rhinitis have different histopathology, but of note, there are no differences seen in the blood vessels. In the common cold, we see sloughing of epithelial cells in the nose with completely intact epithelial lining, early neutrophil migration, and by the second day, no involvement of mast or other cells. Allergic rhinitis, on the other hand, includes a thickening of the basement membrane, goblet cells, and squamous metaplasia, an increased number of mast cells, and eosinophilia may be present. Stromal markers also show edema and fibrosis, which characterize remodeling and subsequent turbinate hypertrophy. Nasal congestion is the most frequently reported and most bothersome symptoms for cold sufferers. Based on symptoms reported by sufferers throughout a cold episode, nasal congestion in blue starts on day one and is the most frequently reported symptom across the seven days of a cold. By days two through five, this symptom has become the most bothersome cold symptom. This time course illustrates the importance 
of using a short-acting decongestant such as phenylephrine in the treatment of the common cold, whether as monotherapy or in combination. Most of the phenylephrine used for common cold symptom treatment is found in combination products which can treat other concurrent nasopharyngeal symptoms. An oral combination product containing a decongestant can provide a more complete and clinically meaningful benefit to the sufferer. I want to switch now to discussing the use of phenylephrine in upper respiratory allergies. I make an important distinction between sufferers with allergies which last for a few hours or days and patients who have been diagnosed by a healthcare professional as having seasonal allergic rhinitis. The majority of sufferers self-manage their symptoms. Adequate symptom relief is obtained by lifestyle modification, such as avoiding allergy triggers, using over-the-counter antihistamines for sneezing, drip, and eye symptoms, and taking over-the-counter decongestants for congestion. For these sufferers, nasal congestion is typically transient, lasting hours or days, occurring more frequently on peak allergy exposure days. On the other hand, patients who are diagnosed with seasonal allergic rhinitis typically have persistent symptoms for several weeks of an allergy season and may require other treatments. It is important to note that phenylephrine and phenylephrine combination products are not intended to replace other treatment choices in established seasonal allergic rhinitis. In summary, it is well understood that upper respiratory viral infections such as the common cold and upper respiratory allergies are different conditions with different pathophysiology. When we review the scientific literature, we see no difference in the blood vessels and the mechanism of congestion and decongestion. What is different is that it is more difficult to detect evidence of decongestion in established and persistent seasonal allergic conditions, which we will show. And it is critical that the most appropriate clinical trial endpoint is chosen to reflect this. Before I discuss the studies that support the efficacy of phenylephrine, I will pass the presentation to Dr. Gelot to describe the pharmacology. Thank you, Dr. Druce, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathleen Gelot, a clinical pharmacology consultant currently working with CHPA. Previously, I was employed by Johnson & Johnson for 25 years supporting OTC medicines, but have since retired. During my tenure at J&J, I conducted studies on the pharmacokinetics of phenylephrine following the 2007 NDAC meeting. Today, I will briefly review the clinical pharmacology of phenylephrine, which is consistent with the dosing directions and labeled indications. I'll also address a few misconceptions regarding phenylephrine's bioavailability and potency with inferences on efficacy. This figure shows the plasma concentrations of phenylephrine over four hours following an oral dose of 10 milligrams in healthy adults. During absorption, phenylephrine undergoes high first pass con sulfate conjugation in the intestinal wall. When these same concentrations are plotted on the log scale, we see two distinctive slopes. The first is associated with rapid distribution of phenylephrine out of plasma to the sites of action. The second slope reflects the short elimination half-life, about two hours, which is consistent with phenylephrine's dosing interval of four hours. The apparent volume of distribution is very high, much higher than total body water which indicates phenylephrine's preference for tissues outside of plasma and its relatively low bioavailability. 
the absolute bioavailability of phenylephrine was estimated at 38% in one published study using a radio label technique, which has scientific limitations. We are not aware of any new study that used contemporary assay methods to confirm this estimate. Next, I'd like to consider the standard method to estimate absolute bioavailability and then to address misconceptions that low bioavailability indicates a lack of efficacy. Both absolute and relative bioavailability are determined from concentrations of the same chemical form of the active moiety. The 2015 Citizens Petition and other briefing materials estimated bioavailability in a different way. This figure shows pharmacokinetic profiles for a drug assay directly in the plasma compared with total drug, which is the sum of the drug and the drug cleaved from its metabolites. Using the ratio of areas under these two curves, a much lower bioavailability is obtained. For phenylephrine, estimates less than 1% were presumed using this method. But this comparison is not valid because the red line for total drug represents the combined pharmacokinetics of the drug and its metabolites. Basic principles are violated when the AUC of total PE in, is used in the calculations. First, this AUC reflects one or more inactive metabolites with each having different volumes of distribution and elimination rates that alters the overall AUC and concentration data must be corrected for differences in molar masses among chemical moieties. Although the bioavailability of phenylephrine has not been confirmed, it is noteworthy that even when a drug has low bioavailability, it does not mean a lack of efficacy or minimal efficacy. We know that other factors have a role in determining efficacy, such as drug concentrations at the site of action. Like phenylephrine, many FDA-approved medicines have low to moderate bioavailability, and several examples are listed in this table. Some drugs, such as bisphosphonates that treat osteoporosis, are less than 1% bioavailable. However, the therapeutic effects of medicines with low bioavailability were demonstrated at the oral days doses clinically tested. In other words, Clinical dosing of a drug accounts for its bioavailability. For phenylephrine, the 10 milligram dose was tested and found to be an effective nasal decongestant in studies of patients with colds. Regarding phenylephrine's mechanism of action, we know that it stimulates alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, resulting in vasoconstriction of the nasal mucosa. Phenylephrine's decongestive action stems from the constriction of local arterioles that lead to capillaries, which serve as the major site for fluid passage. Arteriole constriction decreases the amount of fluid entering the densely packed capillary beds of the nose and promotes shrinking of swollen terminate membranes. The therapeutic outcome is easier breathing due to diminished nasal airway resistance, along with decreased stuffiness. Notably, minimal adverse pressure effects are observed at the 10 milligram therapeutic dose because much higher concentrations of phenylephrine are needed for significant constriction of peripheral blood vessels. In the next few slides, we'll address the misconception that in vitro potency and clinical PK data are not consistent with oral PE being effective. Potency and efficacy are frequently mixed up, but these terms are not synonymous. Potency is the concentration of drug needed to produce a certain response. It depends on the rates of receptor binding and release and receptor affinity, among other factors. Efficacy is the ability of a drug to elicit physiological responses when interacting with receptors. It has more complex dependencies, but intrinsically relies on the number of receptors. 
stimulation of these receptors may be expressed differently among tissues, leading to different responses. Potency is just one contributory factor of clinical efficacy. Supplements to the 2015 Citizens Petition and today's briefing materials provide examples of in vitro potency data for phenylephrine such as the EC50 shown here. They are generally higher than clinical plasma concentrations, but this does not mean phenylephrine lacks efficacy. Many drugs have clinically effective concentrations that are lower than estimates in in vitro potency. In a published analysis of 164 registered drugs, the ratio of the effective plasma concentrations at steady state to in vitro potency was estimated for each drug. This figure shows the cumulative frequencies of these ratios sorted by the type of potency measured, including the EC50. About 70% of the ratios were at or below unity with the median ratio of 0.32. Data for a few allergic rhinitis drugs from this analysis are summarized in this table and compared with data for phenylephrine. I'd like to point out that the measured clinical concentrations include drug both unbound and bound to plasma proteins, but it's the free unbound drug that distributes to tissues and interacts with receptors resulting in efficacy. The speculation that orally administered phenylephrine cannot achieve effective concentrations based on in vitro potency data is without merit. The plasma concentrations of phenylephrine measured over four hours are consistent with 10 milligram phenylephrine being effective because the time course and intensity of effects depend on drug con concentrations at the site of action. To illustrate the pharmacodynamic relationship with measured concentrations, we overlay data on nasal airway resistance, a measure of nasal congestion, from a subset of clinical studies from the monograph review. Note that data for the percent reduction in resistance is inverted on the right axis for an easier comparison with the plasma data we see a slower onset where the response curves are shifted to later times compared with the time course for phenylephrine concentrations. In addition, the overall duration of effect diminishes by four hours, which aligns with phenylephrine's label dosing indication and indication of temporary relief. These data show that the nasal vasculature is responsive to concentrations associated with the 10 milligram dose. Another way to look at the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic relationship is to plot the phenylephrine plasma concentrations and NAR response data at each common time point. This display provides insights into the complexity of drug action and its disposition. For phenylephrine, we see a counterclockwise hysteresis loop. This loop means that there is no direct relationship in time with the concentration. Rather, we see NAR responses increasing over time even after drug concentrations have begun declining. In other words, there continues to be measurable NAR effects at later times following the 10 milligram dose, even though measured plasma concentrations are approaching zero in a pharmacokinetic curve. Possible mechanisms for time delay in phenylephrine's response includes delayed distribution kinetics and uptake into active tissue sites. Next, we'll address the misconception that the lack of significant adverse pressure effects in the recent pharmacokinetic studies supports the lack of decongestant efficacy. Although direct stimulation of the nasal and peripheral vasculature with phenylephrine results in vasoconstriction, the available science suggests that the overall clinical responsiveness varies between tissues. Reason for, reasons for differential decongestion and hemodynamic responses include potential differences 
in distribution and density of adrenergic receptors and differences at concentrations at effect sites. However, the most important difference is the body's homeostatic response to increases in blood pressure where baroreceptors are stimulated. This results in a decrease in heart rate which diminishes the pressure response. Let me walk you through an example of diminished pressure responses using data from a recent pharmacokinetic study. The pharmacokinetic profiles for three doses of phenylephrine in 28 adults are displayed in this figure. The study also included placebo because both blood pressure and heart rate were measured at several times over four hours. Mean changes from baseline for these hemodynamic effects are plotted for each dose and for placebo. We see that the time action curves for blood pressure and heart rate are mirror images of each other. With phenylephrine vasoconstriction, blood pressure increases. This stimulates baroreceptors that respond by decreasing heart rate, which then diminishes further blood pressure responses. Homeostasis is the main reason why clinically adverse increases in blood pressure are not observed at the 10 to 30 milligram doses. But yet, decreases in nasal airway resistance and congestion are observed in the monograph studies. Let's turn our attention to the range of phenylephrine doses where pressor effects are significant. Having minimal pressor effects in the recent pharmacokinetic studies reinforces phenylephrine's favorable safety profile. At the 10 milligram dose, we would expect to see small changes in blood pressure. One published study by Martinson evaluated the relationship between phenylephrine plasma concentration and pressor effects. Increases in blood pressure were evaluated when infused doses of phenylephrine that attained extremely high plasma concentrations, up to 50,000 picograms per mil, when the range of peak plasma concentrations from the 30 milligram oral dose is highlighted on the figure, we see that clinically important increases in blood pressure are unlikely. We know that oral doses from 50 to 100 milligrams phenylephrine are needed to attain concentrations high enough to adversely increase blood pressure. In summary, the concentration profile of phenylephrine shows a rapid distribution to the site of action and supports the labeled four-hour dosing, four dosing interval. Importantly, having low bioavailability does not mean lack of efficacy because clinical concentrations consistent with the PE or 10 milligram dose are effective. Specifically, therapeutic effects as measured by NAR were demonstrated in clinical studies at the doses evaluated. Finally, not having adverse pressor effects does not mean lack of efficacy because the barrel reflex response to phenylephrine diminishes increases in blood pressure. Thank you. I'd like to pass the presentation to, back to Dr. Drews. Thank you, Dr. Gillot. I will first discuss methodology and then present data from some of the several monograph clinical studies that demonstrate the efficacy of oral phenylephrine. Most of the monograph clinical studies used a natural common cold model with an objective endpoint of measuring nasal airway resistance. This was for a very good reason. The short-term effects on the blood vessels are similar in both the common cold and upper respiratory allergies, and extrapolation from the common cold model is valid. I want to stress up front that both objective and subjective measurements provide valuable data. However, a primary objective endpoint is critical to capture short-term decongestant changes typical of drugs like phenylephrine. Nasal airway resistance, or NAR, is an objective measurement of nasal congestion and is the clinical endpoint most appropriate to assess temporary decongestion of over-the-counter phenylephrine as approved in the drug facts label. Subjective measurements of nasal congestion 
such as reflective scoring of symptoms, will be lost in a 12-hour or 24-hour reflective score, especially a 12-hour morning reflective score. Please remember that the dosing interval for oral phenylephrine 10 milligrams is up to four hours to provide temporary relief of congestion. An objective measurement of nasal congestion can be made with multiple techniques, including anterior, posterior, acoustic rhinometry, and peak nasal inspiratory flow. Anterior rhinomanometry has been the most widely used technology for clinical trials because it can measure flow through each nostril separately and is also the method recommended by the International Committee on Standardization of Rhinomanometry. Although this technique is operator dependent, rhinometry is accurate and standardized for small studies. As mentioned in FDA's briefing materials, there have been no recent submissions using an objective endpoint as the primary endpoint. However, it is an important endpoint for the clinical trials you have seen. It remains a useful technique to measure changes in nasal congestion and to provide additional insights together with appropriate subjective measures. With that background, let's discuss the misconception that monograph studies do not support the grass gray status of oral phenylephrine 10 milligrams. I'll start by discussing the limitations in study methodology. Nasal congestion is not only the most bothersome symptom to experience, as I have mentioned earlier, but it is also the toughest to treat and measure. Both the study design and the clinical trial population impact study results. The severity of nasal congestion can be assessed with objective or subjective measurements. The objective measurement that is the most relevant is nasal airway resistance measured with a rhinomanometer, as I have just presented. Subjective measurements are assessed with a diary and include symptom scores based on verbal descriptors or a visual analog scale. Studies performed with different methodologies are difficult to compare. Studies performed and completed after 2007 include randomized control parallel group studies, allergen chamber studies, and open label studies, but are all in an allergic rhinitis clinical model. Patient selection in these studies tended to enroll patients with greater symptom severity than typically self-managed temporary nasal congestion. As you have heard from Dr. Howard, the efficacy of 10 milligrams phenylephrine was accepted in 1976 by FDA review and reaffirmed by the NDAC in 2007. Let's review the data. The 2007 review included 14 studies that evaluated oral phenylephrine 10 milligrams. Seven showed a statistically significant effect on nasal airway resistance. And five of these studies also demonstrated a significant effect based on subjective endpoints. Later in the presentation, we will discuss some of the negative studies. The totality of evidence meets the regulatory standard needed to demonstrate efficacy for the labeled indications of phenylephrine. Shown here is a forest plot of the results from studies that evaluated 10 milligrams phenylephrine versus placebo. Nearly all studies were in the common coal model. All compared oral phenylephrine 10 milligrams to placebo and evaluated the reduction in nasal airway resistance over a span of 120 minutes. The light blue shading highlights those that favor phenylephrine 10 milligrams, with six being statistically significant. One study that did show effectiveness is not shown here as it was not placebo controlled. I will provide further information on the efficacy of phenylephrine 
using the results from three representative studies that utilize technology that met the regulatory standard. Elizabeth number two, Sintest number one, and Cohen 75. Elizabeth number two was a placebo-controlled crossover design study that measured nasal airway resistance and was one of multiple studies to demonstrate the effectiveness of phenylephrine 10 milligrams. The gray line represents the placebo and the dark blue line represents phenylephrine 10 milligrams. There was a statistically significant improvement in nasal airway resistance compared to placebo within 15 minutes, which was sustained for at least two hours. Syntest number one also demonstrated statistical significance of 10 milligrams oral phenylephrine compared to placebo as early as 30 minutes after dosing. This efficacy was sustained for up to four hours. Cohen 75 was a large randomized double blind placebo controlled study to evaluate the effectiveness of phenylephrine 10 milligram tablets for the common cold. Among the 200 volunteers aged 18 and over, this study demonstrated efficacy soon after taking phenylephrine 10 milligrams as shown by objective measurement of nasal airway resistance. The objective nasal airway resistance measurements are plotted here and show nasal airway resistance statistically significantly decreased with phenylephrine compared to placebo after two hours with an early separation. The efficacy of phenylephrine 10 milligrams was sustained for up to 12 hours with repeat dosing compared to placebo when dosing according to labeling. The subjective endpoints in this study are also informative and correlated well with the primary objective endpoint. Within 30 minutes, patients achieved a statistically significant benefit with phenylephrine 10 milligrams compared to placebo and was repeated in the dosing intervals thereafter. FDA and the panel reviewed this study for the 2007 advisory committee meeting. In their briefing book for this meeting, FDA stated that this was a large study, and because of the way the study was described in the Advance Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or ANPR, pushed the panel in favor of a positive recommendation for oral phenylephrine. We agree with the assessment of the panel and see the position today as unchanged as evidence supporting the efficacy of oral phenylephrine 10 milligrams in the common cold. The largest study shows substantial evidence in subjective measures for phenylephrine 10 milligrams that are significant at all time points past 15 minutes, which are cl clinically meaningful. FDA mentioned in their briefing materials that assessment of clinical relevance was not completed and questioned the clinical value of the study. I'd like to share the results of a recently completed reassessment by a statistician from a member company of CHPA that answers this question. The analysis is based on the raw data obtained from the final study report, re-entered and analyzed. The table, shows three different accepted methods of assessing clinical significance based on statistical models from Norman et al. and Barnes et al. The green shading highlights the time points at which a clinically meaningful difference was demonstrated. Both statistical significance and clinical meaningfulness are clear from the study regardless of whether the anchor base or distribution-based method is used to assess, assess the minimally important, minimally important difference. I'd like to turn to the post-2007 studies and address the misconception that these latest studies negate the efficacy of phenylephrine established previously. Since 2007, there have been attempts to reevaluate the efficacy of phenylephrine, albeit with different methodologies. 
Four clinical studies, all in seasonal allergic rhinitis, were published. The first two were conducted in an environmental allergy chamber, and the second two were outpatient clinical studies. The phase two proof of concept study by Johnson & Johnson will be addressed separately as it was posted on clinicaltrials.gov, but we note that the study was an incomplete study terminated early due to the inability to recruit the planned number of subjects. Therefore, the results should not be considered definitive either way. These later clinical studies do not invalidate efficacy already demonstrated in patients experiencing nasal congestion due to the common cold. Not one methodology specifically addresses the labeled indication of oral phenylephrine, 10 milligrams, intended for temporary relief of congestion. My key issue with these methods is the chosen clinical methods. The design of these new clinical studies is not relevant to establishing, evaluating short-acting oral decongestants. Follow a thorough review, we identified some important limitations that are listed in this table. They include inadequate blinding, concomitant use of an antihistamine, 12 hour subjective reflective endpoints inappropriately used as the primary, and in addition, enrollment of inappropriate study subjects. There are also some limitations associated with the earlier clinical studies reviewed by the 1976 over-the-counter expert panel, and they are noted in our briefing book. In the next series of slides, I'll describe these limitations and share our concerns, beginning with the selection of the study populations. Subjects in these studies do not represent individuals who have intermittent nasal congestion in seasonal allergic rhinitis and manage their own care with the use of over-the-counter medicines, including phenylephrine, for the temporary relief of nasal congestion. This table highlights the main selection criteria from each study regarding seasonal allergic rhinitis. We see that enrolled subjects had at least moderate severity of nasal congestion per the FDA guidance, except subjects in the Meltzer 2016 study who had at least mild severity. They needed to be symptomatic within two years of the study and have a positive skin test or in vitro test for specific IgE. We know that in seasonal allergic rhinitis, when people seek medical care due to persistent symptoms, the pathology in their nose is inflammation. This often requires the use of intranasal corticosteroids. Based on the criteria in the last three rows, subjects with more severe and persistent rhinitis were permitted to enroll. Also, having allergic rhinitis over a long duration of years is a risk factor for the onset of asthma. Another consideration, which may affect the efficacy endpoints, is that patients with persistent allergic rhinitis may be less responsive to alpha adrenergic decongestants like phenylephrine. In this published study, the relationship between the duration of rhinitis in years and nasal airflow measured by rhinomanometry was determined in 312 adults. Topical application of nafazoline, a selective alpha-1, alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, was used as a decongestant test. The results are shown in the figure where we see a strong inverse correlation between improvement in nasal airflow after treatment and the duration of rhinitis. A review of study populations described in published clinical trials of antihistamines found that the mean rhinitis duration ranged from 12 to 20 years. These data corroborate our assertion 
that the study populations in the four new allergy studies were not appropriate to evaluate the temporary decongestant effect of oral phenylephrine. Let's take a closer look at each study. We also know that adequate blinding of treatments is critical when the primary endpoint is the subjective assessment of symptoms. This is especially true in a crossover design like the HORAC 2009 study, where each study receives each treatment sequentially. However, this study was single blind for the investigator only, so the color and shape of the products were visible to the study participants. Commercial products were used for the red pseudoephedrine tablet and the yellow phenylephrine capsule. Some subjects may have been familiar with their respective dosage form and color. This figure shows decreases in mean congestion scores over six hours with the greatest decrease observed for pseudoephedrine. The authors noted these results may be biased due to subject recall of pseudoephedrine's efficacy from a previous, time, tre previous treatment period. In addition, this strongly suggests carryover effects that would negatively affect the outcomes for phenylephrine. When efficacy was evaluated by the blinded investigator using objective rhinometry, decongestion was demonstrated for both pseudoephedrine and phenylephrine. Both time action curves overlapped, showing a clear separation from placebo, although differences did not reach statistical significance for phenylephrine. However, dosing 10 milligrams phenylephrine at the four hour time point per its labeling would have been more appropriate for evaluating efficacy up to the six hour endpoint. Let's turn to the Meltzer 2015 study. Although this study was based on FDA's draft guidance for new products for allergic rhinitis, every patient was dosed with an antihistamine, loratadine, a variable complicating the evaluation of phenylephrine. This was an open-label study, implying that blinding for the study was insufficient for subjective endpoints of symptoms as the primary endpoint. Regarding the study population, subjects have persistent nasal congestion. We know that in seasonal allergic rhinitis, when patients seek medical care, the pathology in their noses is inflammation. So it is unsurprising that this resulted in a negative study. Let's look at two limitations in more detail. The first is the daily use of loratadine while four doses of phenylephrine were evaluated. Our concern is that loratadine, an antihistamine, provides a halo effect such that the subject's reduced perception of the severity of other rhinitis symptoms biases the scoring of nasal congestion. Let me walk you through an example. In this published study of seasonal allergic rhinitis, Nasal congestion was evaluated after treatment with loratadine alone, a combination tablet of pseudoephedrine with loratadine and placebo. The mean improvement in congestion for the combination tablet over four days was superior to both loratadine and placebo. But after 14 days, the combination tablet with pseudoephedrine was not superior to loratadine alone we see that relief from allergy symptoms with loratadine over this longer duration provided a halo effect, which improved the congestion scores. Therefore, the overall sensitivity of the clinical model to detect differences among treatments is decreased. A major limitation of the Meltzer 2015 study is that the phenylephrine doses were not compared with placebo but rather with loratadine, like this example. The primary endpoint in Meltzer 2015 doesn't make sense for phenylephrine, a short-acting decongestant 
because it relies on reflection of changes in congestion severity over the previous 12 hours. This endpoint was developed to evaluate once or twice daily treatments for seasonal allergies, whereas oral phenylephrine is dosed around the clock every four hours for temporary relief. In the Meltzer 2015 study, dosing compliance was low, especially overnight due to the high frequency of dosing. On average, patients took 4.5 doses, which is about four to four to five doses out of the six doses per day. Taking fewer doses overnight provides less benefit over the previous 12 hours, thus negatively biasing the morning scores. This is not an appropriate endpoint for evaluating temporary symptom relief. This next study by Meltzer and colleagues evaluated an experimental modified release phenylephrine tablet. Two study elements diminished the sensitivity of the clinical model to detect efficacy versus placebo. The first was the daily use of loratadine as needed for allergy symptom relief. Mean exposure for both treatments was about four out of the seven days. Most placebo-controlled clinical trials of oral antihistamines with and without a decongestant do not permit as-needed treatment with rescue medication. The second was the inclusion of subjects with documented seasonal allergic rhinitis for at least two seasons who reported nasal congestion scores of mild. This grade of severity does not meet FDA's guidance for moderate severity. We see that there is no score between non and mild that would allow for improvements in congestion severity. Improvement would require a complete resolution. And without an active control, these changes in the model cannot be interpreted. The final study that I'd like to review is a phase two study that investigated an experimental extended release 30 milligram phenylephrine tablet in the common cold. This was a placebo controlled non inferiority study of an extended release phenylephrine 30 milligrams evaluated over 12 hours and dosed twice compared with four total doses of phenylephrine 12 milligrams taken every four hours. Patients were required to have common cold symptoms for up to 72 hours prior to entry. This study included various subjective endpoints, including some that were exploratory. The study was characterized as proof of concept. It was terminated early due to the inability to recruit the planned number of subjects, even after relaxing an inclusion criterion. Inferences may be made from incomplete data, but should not be considered definitive. In summary, oral phenylephrine 10 milligrams provides temporary relief of congestion due to the common cold and upper respiratory allergies, which is the labeled indication. There is ample clinical evidence based mostly on the common cold model to justify the labeled indication, with FDA determining regulatory status as grass gray based on what I consider an appropriate clinical endpoint. The monograph studies are methodologically sound and are still relevant to support grass gray status. No compelling data have been presented to date to challenge this existing efficacy data because the subjective 12 hour reflective symptom score in established seasonal allergic rhinitis patients does not have the capability to detect short term efficacy. No novel technology or clinical trial design has emerged to negate the established data or warrant reinvestigation of phenylephrine for its labeled indication. FDA has reanalyzed the pre-2007 data 
based on deficiencies in selected trial endpoints. We asked the NDAC and FDA to consider the post-2007 studies from a similar perspective. Thank you. I will now turn the presentation to Mr. Mullen to discuss the meta-analysis. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Mullen. I'm a biostatistician with NAMSA, a contract lab and research organization. I'd like to briefly summarize meta-analyses of phenylephrine that were reviewed by this committee in 2007, those by Hatton and by Collar, touch on some of the criticisms subsequently raised after the 2007 meeting, and explain why these criticisms do not alter the original conclusion of effectiveness of Collar. I will show that the difference in the stated conclusions by the authors is not surprising and that it can be attributed to methodologic differences. I will also briefly touch on the newer studies conducted since 2007 and attempt to provide some additional context for these studies. First, let's discuss the 2007 meta-analysis by the petitioners, Drs. Hatton and Hendelis. This was based on a literature search of randomized placebo-controlled trials of oral phenylephrine at 10 milligrams as a single agent. Studies using multiple agents or against a non-placebo control were excluded. This included seven crossover studies and one parallel group study. The endpoint chosen for analysis was the maximum reduction in nasal airway resistance whenever it occurred within the first 120 minutes. This endpoint was identified as problematic by FDA in 2007, since it potentially obscured differences at time points. This meta-analysis employed a random effects model and used aggregate summary data from each study. The meta-analysis concluded there was insufficient evidence that oral phenylephrine is effective. However, it actually reported, reported a point estimate of approximately 10% for the difference in percent NAR decrease in favor of phenylephrine. The second meta-analysis conducted in 2007 was by Collar. This analysis used essentially the same seven set of randomized controlled crossover studies as Hatton. Of note, their publication also included an assessment and reanalysis of the parallel group study by Cohen that was included in the meta-analysis by Hatton. Their chosen endpoint was assessed at specific available time points through 240 minutes. Note that the presentation of results at the available time points, whether or not those results were significant, mitigates the concern regarding multiplicity. In other words, the collar analysis did not simply pull out and present only the significant results. They also provided non-significant results for disclosure and context. Another very important difference was that the collar analysis was based on individual patient data. It was not based on combining summary measures from previous publications. The approach using individual patient data had advantages. For example, it allowed adjusting for the baseline value for each subject as a covariate. It is well known that adjusting for baseline measurement when assessing an outcome based on change can increase statistical power. The conclusion of the collar meta-analysis was that oral phenylephrine is effective. On this slide, on the left, we see the estimated treatment effect from Hatton, as noted in the FDA briefing book. The analysis shows a point estimate of approximately 10% that favors phenylephrine. We see very similar results in the collar paper at 60, 90 minutes, as seen on the right. Again, approximately a 10% difference in favor of phenylephrine. So despite all the potential statistical complexities, the results are relatively consistent. The conclusion of collar was based both on the results of the meta-analysis and reanalysis of the individual studies, and on reanalysis of the crossover study of Cohen. This re represents multiple sources of data supporting the conclusions. When we focus on just the crossover studies for a moment in this forest plot, we note that three studies appear to individually show an effect, and four studies do not. I'll discuss study-specific issues of the positive studies in some detail, but first, it is important to point out that several of the negative studies have a clear issue that calls into question their individual conclusions. One study included a positive control but failed to show a significant benefit of the positive control over placebo, and two other studies did not include a positive control group at all. In other words, the three of the four negative studies did not demonstrate assay sensitivity. Accordingly, including these studies in any meta-analysis can arguably bias things towards the null. So in this sense, the collar meta-analysis provides a conservative estimate of benefit. Finally, I'd like to discuss concerns that were raised regarding some of the studies included in the meta-analyses. 
One concern was based on post hoc analyses that showed the distribution of the last significant digit in baseline values for one study appears to have a disproportionate occurrence of the number five beyond what would be expected by chance. The authors argued this was potential evidence of irregularities, but there are simpler explanations for this finding. First, for context, these criticisms came more than 40 years after the study was performed and two years after the advisory committee meeting. It's not clear how many post hoc exploratory analyses were performed to identify this issue. And second, the issue of digit preference has been previously reported in the scientific literature in other areas, in studies of blood pressure, for example. And it does not necessarily mean there are issues with the underlying data. It may be simple human psychology and rounding error. Additionally, non-random digit preference in baseline values for a blinded randomized trial would not be expected to introduce bias. The other criticisms related to specific studies was that the data from some of the small studies is suspicious because they exhibit superior efficacy estimates. FDA's briefing document notes particular questions about the small variability at the Elizabeth Labs. Their table is reproduced here, but note this table is derived from an earlier study report by Huntington. First, the results for PPA 50 milligram come from a separate study not used in the meta-analysis. Also, FDA makes no mention of the extremely large standard deviations reported at the Huntington Lab with values of 79 and 166 and 180 and 240 minutes, values three to four times larger than those at either Syntest or Huntington for any other study formulation. This suggests potential issues with the results from this lab, a lab that produced negative results in the studies included in the meta-analysis in terms of poor potential conduct. Considering for a moment the concerns about the significant findings at the Elizabeth lab studies, there are certainly other potential explanations for the results of the studies in question. Bornstein, Hedges, Higgins, and Rothstein discussed the general issue in their introductory textbook on meta-analyses, referring to the concept of a small study effect. They note that it may be the case that the effect size is truly larger in a smaller study, as a smaller study may involve more highly skilled investigators. Authors from one of the negative studies in the meta-analysis, in fact, noted insufficient training and the use of different technicians pre- and post-dosing as possible reasons for their lack of a positive study. More generally, concerns about bias should be symmetric, and so small studies cannot be said to inappropriately bias the mean effect upward any more than the large studies can be said to inappropriately bias the mean effect downward. While we agree that variability is a concern with all studies in this area, this is precisely why conducting studies in this area is so challenging. It is important to critically review the newer studies to a similar degree as the monograph studies. I'd like to start with the J&J study that was performed after 2007. The J&J study discussed by FDA in their briefing materials does have limitations that suggest treating the results with care. This cannot be considered a negative study. It does not demonstrate phenylephrine is ineffective. The study was not powered or designed for direct comparisons of phenylephrine to placebo. While it was larger than the monograph crossover studies, it was designed as a parallel group study, which may be less efficient and require a larger sample size than a crossover study. Also worth noting is that this study was less than two thirds of the sample size per treatment of the largest cold study, the Whitehall Lab study that Dr. Drews discussed. In FDA's materials, they noted the study initially appears to have been designed as a phase three study to support approval of phenylephrine. However, the protocol directly states this study was designed as a phase two proof of concept study. Additionally, as FD noted in their briefing materials, it lacked a positive non-phenylephrine control group, which could be used to assess assay sensitivity. Also, the study was terminated early due to the inability to recruit the planned number of subjects. Regardless of the reason for stopping, the smaller sample size reduces the power for any subsequent analysis. Despite all these limitations, there's still value in examining the results from clinicaltrials.gov. These were also reproduced in the FDA briefing document. And just a note regarding FDA slide 71 from this morning, uh, please note that a positive change, uh, that a positive value for mean change does correspond to an improvement from baseline. The results here are actually consistent with the benefit of phenylephrine. While the primary endpoint was based on a subjective severity score, one can note that both doses of phenylephrine show point estimates in favor of the drug compared to placebo. Further, while the lower confidence bound for the difference from placebo for phenylephrine falls below zero, the upper confidence bound is 0.662, showing that we can't rule out a treatment effect this large. 
So rather than this study supporting the conclusion that 10 milligram phenylephrine is ineffective, its results do not contradict the monograph studies. Additional information on this study was submitted to the docket. A few additional studies of oral phenylephrine have been performed as Dr. Drews discussed, but for various clinical reasons, they're not appropriate for inclusion in meta-analysis. Horak used the Vienna cha challenge chamber and studied subjects with seasonal allergic rhinitis and had carryover bias that may have altered results. Zay and Meltzer 2016 studies looked at different formulations of phenylephrine, a quick root dissolving strip and a modified release formulation respectively. While Meltzer in 2015 used phenylephrine in combination with loratadine, so the potential for confounding is too great. These substantial differences would create interpretation challenges if the studies were incorporated into meta-analyses. Furthermore, Dr. Drews previously stated that common cold and seasonal allergic rhinitis are different conditions with different responses to medications. Overall, criticisms of the meta-analysis and new studies do not change my confidence in the effectiveness of oral phenylephrine. To reiterate and conclude, both the Collar and Hatton meta-analyses included similar studies and produced similar estimates and superficial differences regarding statistical conclusions can be explained by methodology differences. While several small crossover studies from the monograph do show significant results, the size of the effects themselves and the small degree of variability may simply demonstrate well-conducted, highly controlled studies. Several of the so-called negative studies are not free from limitations, specifically a lack of demonstration of assay sensitivity. Finally, the new studies are also not without flaws. They do not address the current labeling for 10 milligram phenylephrine and the indication for relieving nasal congestion due to the common cold, and the results do not contradict the monograph studies. Thank you. I will return the presentation to Dr. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. And thank you to this committee for your attention this afternoon. To close this presentation, I'd like to take a few moments to provide our assessment of the overall benefit risk profile of OTC oral phenylephrine and summarize the CHPA task group's perspective on the key issues. The CHPA task group on phenylephrine remains convinced of the favorable benefit risk profile of oral phenylephrine for the temporary treatment of nasal congestion. As we all know, this is a common symptom that is bothersome. It disturbs our sleep, leads to decreased productivity, and can affect our mood. When considering benefits, it is clear oral phenylephrine has a broad consumer satisfaction. Half of the American households purchased oral phenylephrine products for nasal congestion last year, and these phenylephrine buyers, over two-thirds, chose to repurchase the product again and again. This is a strong indication of consumer satisfaction. This high level of consumer satisfaction aligns with our scientific data review. The efficacy of oral phenylephrine has been supported by two FDA advisory expert panels. It was established by seven monograph studies and reconfirmed by the color meta-analysis that Mr. Mullen explained earlier. Another important factor is the convenient availability of this oral medication on retail shelves and online. And consumers prefer oral formulations over other types of medication. This is in stark contrast to the potential risk of consumers if they faced a phenylephrine market that where phenylephrine was removed. This would leave only pseudoephedrine on the OTC market for oral treatment of nasal congestion. One of the main concerns with this possibility is that pseudoephedrine is only available behind retail counters and is subject to other sales and restriction, sales restrictions and quotas by the DEA. Quite simply, in terms of access, pseudoephedrine could not meet the needs of consumers, especially for those in underserved communities. As noted in the agency's background materials, no safety issues with oral Administry, orally administered phenylephrine products have been identified. Pseudo, excuse me, phenylephrine's overall safety profile remains favorable. Let me say that again. So phenylephrine's overall safety profile remains favorable. Due to many of these unintended potential risks, some consumers might not be able to choose medication or might choose to leave their symptoms untreated. This could lead to worsened outcomes 
like sinus infections or sinusitis. The bottom line is that oral phenylephrine is safe and that it works. Multiple clinical studies using subjective and objective endpoints support its efficacy at 10 milligrams. Multiple consumer surveys also highlight how Americans recognize the physical and personal benefits of oral PE and would be significantly burdened if this effective medicine were not available OTC. The totality of the evidence satisfies FDA's criteria for inclusion in the OTC monograph. Phenylephrine should remain in the OTC monograph and it should remain conveniently available to consumers who need it and who already rely on it. Throughout this meeting, various speakers will offer various interpretations of the data. There are a few fundamental points I'd like you to keep in mind as you consider this information. First, there are clinical data with both objective and subjective endpoints that support the efficacy of oral phenylephrine at the 10 milligram dose. The monograph studies used to establish grass gray status meet the regulatory standards for inclusion in the OTC monograph that justify the labeled indication of temporary relief of nasal congestion. Not every study was positive, but no one would expect every study to be positive when studying nasal congestion due to colds and upper respiratory allergies. And of note, there are no safety signals associated with OTC phenylephrine. Second, there is no scientific rationale, no new clinical trial design, or no new innovation that negates or invalidates the body of science and established data in the monograph. As discussed in our presentation, the post-2000 studies discussed today have limitations and therefore should not be used to inform decisions about the grass gray status for phenylephrine. Third, as Dr. Jalot explained, it is critical to understand that phenylephrine's low bioavailability and lack of significant adverse pressor effects do not mean phenylephrine has minimal efficacy. Statements to the contrary are wrong. Fourth, we also discussed both 2007 meta-analyses and showed how the Kohler meta-analysis utilizes more clinically relevant endpoints and well-accepted statistical methods. Its assessment supports efficacy for phenylephrine at the 10 milligram dose. And lastly, there could be significant negative unintended consequences of removing phenylephrine from the monograph for consumers and to the healthcare system. It could add to the burden of the 50% of consumers who rely on this ingredient and those consumers who have told us that they know it helps relieve their bothersome congestion. Thank you and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Um, we will now move to uh, uh, clarifying questions for the presenters from the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, um, who we've been referring to as CHPA uh, going forward. Uh, please do use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question. Remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you've asked your question. When acknowledged, please do remember to state your name for the record before you speak and to direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and the end of your follow-up question with that is all for my question so that we can move on to the next speaker or to the next panel member. Okay, um, let me go here. Uh, Dr. Lee, please go ahead. Hi there, Jennifer Lay from University of California, San Diego in the, the SCAD School of Pharmacy. So I do have questions for each of the um, uh, presenters. Um, so I'll start first with Dr. Howard. Um, I'm trying to ascertain the significance of the consumer's perspective using the survey that you've presented here. Now on slides 10, 
Maybe we can go to slide 10. Okay. May we share a screen? Thank you. Okay. So on this slide, as well as the next slide, slide 11, um, did your consumer survey specifically pertain to only oral formulation of phenylephrine or did it also include the nasal? We only ask about oral phenylephrine, but I'd also like Mr. Tringell to come and address, uh, provide additional context. Thank you, Mike Tringell, CHPA. So our survey only included respondents who had told us that they used an, a product with oral phenylephrine either in single ingredient or combination in the past 12 months. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Jellett. Sorry if I mispronounced your name here. Um, on slide 31, you mentioned that um, briefly, you mentioned the, the scientific limitation of the study um, presented by the FDA in evaluating the bioavailability um, that conclude as one. Can you... Actually, I take that back. Um, you mentioned during the presentation of this slide that um, the absolute bioavailability of 38, and there was specific limitation, scientific um, limitation in this study. Can you elaborate on that? Dr. Jalot. Kathy Jalot. Certainly one of the limitations is what was bring up pre previously about the infusion rate being over 20 minutes is, is one of them. The second limitation is that the study itself, the oral dose and the IV dose was um, measured in different individuals. Typically what we do today it would be a crossover design. So that would be the second. And the third is when a figure was brought up showing the um, IV and the oral dose that the oral dose seemed to have concentrations for one milligram that was similar to 10. So that's sort of suspect of what's going on there. So those would be considered limitations. And that's why this value is probably unreliable, but there are no reliable data to estimate the absolute bioavailability. And I have a few other follow-up questions for you. So if you can remain okay. there, that'd be great. Um, also on the same slide, actually, slide 31, um, you have listed there a high volume of distribution of 24.8 uh, liters or more liters. Um, I wanted to know, um, do you have data specific to the site of action of how the distribution is as site of action in the nasal mucosa? No, we do not. The volume of distribution here, the, it was called the apparent because it's divided by um, F. So in other words, if we don't know F, we don't know the exact, um, no, what that number is. What, what we can, information we can get from a very high volume of distribution is that if it's more toward the concentration or the volume of the um, um, human body, it would be a smaller number. A large number tends to mean it goes out to the tissues, but we cannot measure what those concentrations are. So that number, uh, while high, we don't know if it's actually getting to the nasal mucosa, correct? Oh, no. It, it, phenylephrine is in the nasal mucosa, but you can't measure it. So we don't actually take tissue and measure it there. We can only measure what's in the plasma in a pharmacokinetic study. Correct. Um, but do you know what the penetration is? For example, for a bone infection, we would try to estimate what's in the bone and the serum and get a ratio from there. Do you have any um, thoughts mechanistically in the penetration of, of uh, nasal mucosa and the amount? No, we do not. Okay. And then slide 33. So I know the limitations and I do agree with you. Um, and I think Dr. Fig mentioned before about the use of um, a consistent uh, variable, either total drug um, or total drug and metabolite, given that both the red and the blue line would be similar in terms of what is measured. Now, um, I, I want to ask, how would you, let's say if the blue line also included metabolites, or for example, 
I'm trying to figure out if the metabolites happen to be active metabolites rather than inactive metabolites, how would you go about in um, measuring bioavailability? Well, what, what's done nowadays and now um, in the current assays, you really need to measure the active mo moiety or the, the, the particular ingredient. So you would not be measuring a mixture. So the assay right now can measure phenylephrine. You would need to conduct a study with IV um, phenylephrine and oral phenylephrine and measure, measure just the parent phenylephrine to actually get that number. And that does not exist. Right. But what if you had active metabolites? Would that change at all? Would you measure that in addition to, but have it? Yes, you would measure it. You would, if it's measurable and quantifiable, and oftentimes it can be, you would also measure the active metabolite. So that wouldn't be a bioavailability number. That would be, um, you know, how, what, what is the relative bioavailability or the, or, or the conversion? So we wouldn't be looking at absolute bioavailability for phenylephrine or a drug a parent. Okay. Um, and then my last question for you would be slide 39. So this is what's very helpful. So I really like this slide in, in, in terms of um, showing, I believe you presented this, um, in, in showing the data here. I'm just curious because it was mentioned that the sample size for many of these studies, I think one was 88, the rest were less than 25 or so. What the standard uh, deviation bars of these time points would look like to kind of show the spread of the data. You, can you provide some thoughts on that? Maybe it was you or maybe Dr. Juice can, can talk. Yeah, I believe we have some of these curves in Dr. Juice's, Juice's presentation where the error bars are, are, are shown. So I don't know if we want to bring up one of those, please, in the core. Slide number. Oh, well, while they're bringing it up, is, is um, besides that, is there anything else you want to ask about the slide until they locate that one? Um, I think that's part. That's what I just wanted to ask. Oh, oh okay. This, um, in terms right. of the standard deviations for some of these um, time points that were listed here, um, to kind of better show um, the the variation in what we have. Okay, so here is one slide uh, that shows the variation in the nasal air resistance for ten milligrams, sixteen subjects. It shows the, I believe, standard error. So it looks. Do you have it for all the other studies? Because this is Elizabeth uh, two have study, an, correct? We have. So. Here's another one. So there's more variability in this particular study. Okay, seems like there there is quite a bit of variability. Okay, um, I think that's the only questions I have for you um, related to your slides there. I do have um, questions for Dr. Druce. Okay, if you'll pose your question while he is sure. Um, Dr. Lay, I might ask this be your last question just so that I can move on okay. to some other members of the panel as well. I will. This will be the last question. So it's, it's clear that um, you have a uh, favor for the use of NAR as the more favorable primary endpoint since it is objective. And I agree with you for the need for an objective endpoint, just as, for example, I would want a blood culture to confirm resolution of bacteremia in an infected patient. Um, a blood culture is a gold standard and highly likely to provide definitive results. So I'm trying to ascertain what this the nasal airway resistant test is like appreciating the user variability and the reproducibility of such a test. If you can comment on that, that would be yes. great. Yes, I'd like to, Howard Drews. Uh, can you pull up slide AA8, please? So one of the important things, as you mentioned, uh, is the advisability, the importance of an objective measurement. 
And really, we're talking about what's going on at the time. We're not talking about eight and 12 hour reflective measurements. On this particular slide for um, the um, uh, objective measurements in several of these uh, studies, uh, we show a plot between the nasal airway resistance and the subjective score. Now, this is not a reflective score. This is an instantaneous subjective score. So this is in intended to mirror what happens with these particular sufferers. They're people that get transient, sudden, short-term congestion, and you measure what's there at the time when it is, and not for somebody who's got established congestion throughout a season. Okay, um, and can you provide more comment in terms of how this is done, who does it, and what is there a, a coefficient of variation for such a test? So rhino manometry, uh, as I showed in previous slides, there are different techniques which di answer different questions. Uh, the most common technique, which is anterior rhinomanometry, um, in, in some of these studies, none of which, uh, or rather in some of the studies which didn't really drive the efficacy um, at the panel review, uh, for example, the Bickerman study, they were developing techniques. But there are standard machines now that are made to um, uh, to measure anterior rhinomanometry, and these can be deployed uh, in uh, in uh, wider contexts uh, when necessary. Um, so th that's one thing. Number two, there is a correlation, as you've seen, between the objective measurement and the uh, the short term or uh, instantaneous uh, congestion. Uh, method. Um, yes, it's a matter of training, but the same is true for other uh, measurements such as pulmonary function, other uh, uh, objective measurements. Yeah, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm going to call on Dr. Clement. Please go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, please, please state your name for the record. Yeah, Steve Clement, um, Anova Health System, Northern Virginia. Um, being the endocrinologist, I'm on a steep learning curve, but I'm, I'm getting a lot of information on this. So Dr. Drews, I wanted to address my question to you if you're still close by. He is. Yes. Yeah, um, no, I, I, I really enjoyed your presentation and it was, your slides were great and description of the physiology, I think was very helpful. Um, you had mentioned the uh, rhinomanometry, I may have said that wrong, as the most widely used measure of clinical trials in this area. Can you just give me an example? I mean, um, we, we've got the data from the FDA saying that the Merck sharing plow studies, which were the, they stated were the biggest studies to date in this condition, um, didn't use it. So I'm just curious, what studies are you talking about? Right. So how it drews. So yes. You're, you know, this is a, a, a quite right. And as you've heard from the FDA, that they do not accept the validity of nasal airway resistance in this particular measurement. So really, it's not surprising that one would not submit uh, um, an application, you know, uh, with this particular type of technology. Um, the... Um, Technology has been used widely in other parts of the world, uh, in, yeah. in Europe. Um, and the other thing that I would note is that really there haven't been any recent submissions, to the best of my knowledge, for single entity decongestants. And so if, if you are only going to address that one endpoint, which uh, is relevant here, this is the measurement specifically for that and not necessarily for composite nasal scores for seasonal allergic rhinitis. Okay, one last question then I'll be done. Uh, it looks like there are a lot of other questions. So based on your interpretation of the Merck sharing plow data, is that, um, which I, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, you're saying this was the wrong study of patients, wrong subset of patients to do, because these are chronic patients that are less responsive to any drug. Is that what you're saying? 
So these, these, these patients, I say, are less responsive to alpha adrenergic agonists. Okay. They're not necessarily, necessarily responsive to other drugs such as intranasal antihistamines, intranasal steroids, et cetera. So there are other conditions for which, as you've heard from the FDA, they are used. However, again, these are not substitutes for primary efficacy measurements. They provide adjunctive evidence. They, as it were, stress the system. When these chambers were developed and when they were utilized in, 20, in 2005, 2008, the amount of antigen that was introduced into the nose at a single time was first of all after nasal priming re with repeated doses and more antigen than you would ever inhale during a complete allergy season. So there's been an evolution in the technology, even within uh, the use of challenge chambers. So again, my, my conclusion, yes, is that for this particular drug for this particular indication, this was the wrong application of clinical trial model. Okay, thank you very much. That's my last question. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I'd like to call on Dr. D'Agostino. Uh, Please go ahead. Hey, yes, this is Dr. D'Agostino. Um, my question I think is gonna be for Dr. Howard. Um, you spoke about how there would be implications on consumers um, particularly potentially drug shortages and supply chain issues. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Absolutely. Uh, as we talked about, as Mr. Stang, I'll ask Mr. Spangler to also provide additional contact, context, but as we talked about pseudoephedrine, while it is an OTC oral medication, it is only sold behind the counter because of the risk of diversion to convert to the pseudoephedrine to methamphetamine. And so there are additional restrictions that apply to OTC products that contain pseudoephedrine. David Spangler, Consumer Healthcare Products Association. Yes, in addition to what Dr. Howard just mentioned, just very specifically, if you do want to change to pseudoephedrine, one, you would need to be already licensed with DEA. If not, you'd have to be applying, have to institute certain security controls, um, <clears throat> compliance with state law requirements. Then you would have to request your quota. Quota uh, requests go in in the spring, uh, manufacturing in May, uh, procurement in April. You then get your quota then some months later. And then as a practical matter at the retail level, uh, typically they're doing their planograms, i.e. what the store is going to look like. Those get adjusted in the spring and then implemented typically in the fall in most major retailers. So you get a significant lag. Plus, as Dr. Howard mentioned, there's a, a limit on the number of products that a retailer would be willing to carry behind the counter because of limited space. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And in addition to impacts on um, pseudoephedrine, would you anticipate um, I guess additional impacts on other products of people who maybe wouldn't go to pseudoephedrine, but would go to things like intranasal phenylephrine or um, other allergy medicines? Could you see downstream effects? And could you elaborate on what those might be? Yes, there is the potential that there would be other downstream effects um, because as you said, if people didn't want to use uh, products that contain pseudoephedrine, we indicate we, we showed in our data that consumers prefer to have oral formulations, so they may not choose to use one of the alternate formulations. Um, they also um, would, if others, uh, if other people decided to, or consumers decided to purchase some of the other formulations, manufacturing has a certain capacity and may not be able to ramp up to provide additional uh, products to consumers if there uh, was a conversion for uh, to the other products that were prov provided as alternatives. I'll also ask Dr. Drews to, to speak. Howard Drews, um, just a very brief point, and that is that the uh, oral pseudoephedrine 10 milligrams, I use the word fit for purpose. And I did that deliberately because it does one job. It relieves a stuffy nose. 
And it's not an anti-inflammatory, it's not uh, an antihistamine, it's not intended for somebody to take constantly throughout an allergy season. You've seen that it can be dosed up to seven days. Uh, and one of the graphic ways that I like to explain that is, is that, you know, nasal congestion when it's temporary doesn't hit you uh, on a schedule. It doesn't hit when the pollen count uh, first starts in August for ragweed. And so when you can't breathe and you just can't breathe through your nose, I would really defy anybody to see how long they can manage like that without going for something for relief. And if the pharmacy's closed, certainly I would like to be able to go to the supermarket or the store and get something that would make me less miserable. Thank you. Just one more question. Um it Dr. D'Agostino, I've got a few others waiting, so if you don't mind, I'm going to move on, but please hold on to your question. We may have time to revisit at the end of the uh, day today. Thank you. I'm going to uh, call on Dr. Dins Dr. Ginsburg. Thank you. Ginsburg University of Texas at Austin College of Pharmacy. First and foremost, thank you and your team um, for your very informative presentations. I uh, appreciated getting the information. Dr. Howard, I have a couple questions related to the consumer survey that you presented, specifically slides 9 through 11. Um, you had you and on slide number nine, in talking about the demographics, you said that at the footnote at the bottom, there was oversampling in terms of ages 50 plus, as well as rural areas. Do you have any breakdown of what that is in the 1,200 individuals that were part of the study? I'm, I'm trying to get a sense is, was it a lot of people 50 and older? Was it a lot of people in rural areas? Or, you know, by that virtue of that term, oversampling? Okay, I'll ask Mr. Tringale to respond. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, our total sample of population was 1,200 adults, 21 years and older. And by oversampling, we, we specifically had developed a purposive sample to get at least 25% of the respondents either age 50 plus or, or in rural or and in rural communities. And actually we ended up with 30% in rural, so about two, 360 respondents. And for 50 plus, we had over 300 respondents as well. So they make up the total oversample, which allowed us to do in that subgroup more descriptive, you know, reliable descriptive statistics on those particular subgroups. Okay, stay there because I think you're going to be able to answer I just two follow up questions to that and related to that. In capturing that data and demographics, were there any questions related to um, other conditions being treated or anything that might have had any impact related to their responsiveness um, to uh, decongestants, to oral decongestants? There were not. Okay, and um, sorry. And just one smaller question, and I'll be done. So the, the questions like on slide 11 and let me go back and slide number 10, um, what were the response options with those questions? Was it yes, no? Was it on a Likert scale? What? We gave, we gave uh, it varied depending on the question, and actually the full instrument is included in our docket. Um, so you'll find some of the questions we had uh, multiple choice and other questions we had a, a more of a liquor scale, exactly. Appreciate it, thank you very much, I'm done. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Schwarzot, uh, we have just um, a few minutes for a very brief question, so I'll go ahead and, and allow you um, to ask your question uh, if possible. Yes, I'm, um, I was wondering if I could um, ask the FDA to respond to one of the statements that the um, association has made. Is that possible done during this part? Uh, it's, Ms. Schwarzoff, it's, we're, we're gonna defer that until a little bit later. We may have an opportunity to come back um, okay. and to ask FDA to respond, but for now, this is um, CHPA's time. Okay. okay. Um, Dr. Dykowitz, do you have a very brief question you would like to share? Um, well, one brief question for Dr. Drews on slide 67, which was on the HORAC study, uh, the VA, Vienna Challenge Chamber. So that was looking at rhinomanometry. 
And so looking at that four hour period of 240 minutes when phenylephrine should have been active, um, we don't see much difference versus placebo. So your explanation, again, as to why we should not look at this as being evidence of lack of effectiveness would be what? Uh, Howard Drews. Um, this uh, slide, which was taken from the, the publication, uh, does not uh, obviously show any variability uh, data. Um, what we, we do note uh, is that and then for, at that particular time point, th th there really is a, a, a sort of crossover between the phenylephrine and pseudoephedrine um, action curves. Um, and, and, and really, we see separation from placebo. Um, so although the, there's no statistical significance at that point, um, it, it does not indicate to us that there's no activity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we will uh, wrap this up. We'll take a quick 10 minute break. Uh, panel members, please remember that there will be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during this time, and we will resume at 3 o'clock uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Standard Time, or I'm sorry, Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you.
We will now begin the open public hearing session. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation and for this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the industry. For example, this financial information may include industry's payment of your travel, lodging, or other expenses in connection with your participation in the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and this committee place, place great importance in the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency and this committee in their consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. One of our goals for every participant, one of our goals for today is for this open public hearing to be conducted in a fair and open way where every participant is listened to carefully and treated with dignity, cur courtesy, and respect. Therefore, please speak only when recognized by the chairperson. Thank you for your cooperation. Speaker number one. Please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number one begin and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You have five minutes. Thank you. I am Asa Abu Daga, a health services researcher at Public Citizens Health Research Group. We have no financial conflicts of interest. I note that in the context of oral congestion, we petitioned the FDA in 2000 to ban, to ban phenyl fibronolamine PPA due to safety concerns before the agency removed it from the market. We believe that even when safety is not a concern, ineffective drugs should not be on the market. We concur with the conclusion of the FDA briefing document that the current collective evidence strongly demonstrates that oral phenylephrine hydrochloride is not effective for temporary relief of nasal congestion at the monographed dose of 10 milligrams and at the monographed dosing frequency of every four hours, nor at larger potentially safe doses up to 40 milligrams given at the same frequency. Mainly the FDA's clinical pharmacologists have confirmed that based on updated technological methods, the bioavailability of phenylephrine when taken orally is less than 1% because the drug is broken down, is broken down during absorption. The, these scientists also have concluded that the half-life of oral phenylephrine is significantly shorter than the four-hour dosing interval. Additionally, FDA's new analysis of the original efficacy studies of oral phenylephrine uncovered many methodological and statistical problems that make these studies equivalent to phase one studies by current standards. Notably, two of these original studies generated unbelievable near textbook perfect results that were not duplicated in other similar studies by the same sponsor, according to the agency's scientists. Furthermore, the FDA clinical reviewers examined publicly available data from three adequately controlled industry-sponsored clinical trials conducted since the 2007 NDAAC meeting. These trials represent the largest and, most well and, and the most well-designed available studies evaluating the efficacy of oral phenylephrine for nasal congestion. They clearly illustrate the lack of efficacy of oral immediate release phenylephrine at doses up to 40 milligrams and extended release, dose, extended release doses of 30 milligrams. Based on the current credible, this uh, current credible and consistent evidence, the FDA scientists concluded that orally administered phenylephrine is not effective at any dose that can be administered with a reasonable margin of safety. As discussed in the briefing, in the FDA's briefing document, the benefits of removing oral over-the-counter phenylephrine from the, from the U.S. market are numerous. 
These include avoiding unnecessary costs and possible delay in care or missed opportunities for using effective treatments when needed, avoiding potential allergic reactions or other adverse events caused by taking multiple products containing oral phenylephrine, avoiding the risks of, drug, of the drugs accidental, accidental use in children, and decreasing overall healthcare costs. These benefits outweigh any industry-related consequences of removing this ineffective drug from the US market. Therefore, we urge the committee to vote no on the questions regarding whether the current evidence supports the effectiveness of, oral, of orally administered phenylephrine for nasal congestion, and whether a higher dosage of the drug would be safe and effective. In conclusion, oral phenylephrine salts should no longer be classified as generally recognized as safe and effective. Consumers wouldn't be served by leaving these placebo-like products on the market. To allay potential concerns, it is imp it's imperative for the agency to couple the removal of oral phenylephrine from the market with disseminating of educational material for consumers and healthcare professionals about the lack of efficacy of these products and the availability of effective treatment alternatives for nasal congestion that require treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, speaker number two, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number two begin and introduce yourself by stating your name and any organization that you are representing for the record. You have 20 minutes. Hello, my name is Eli Meltzer. I'm clinical professor of pediatrics in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of California in San Diego. I have no financial conflict of interest. I'll be speaking on two subjects. The first subject is about two studies I helped to conduct on the efficacy and safety of oral phenylephrine in the treatment of nasal congestion. Second, I'll review other medications that are available and are used to treat nasal congestion. Next slide. The first of the two clinical studies was reported in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in Practice in 2015. Next slide. The background for this dose-ranging trial of oral phenylephrine was that efficacy of the usually recommended dose of 10 milligrams was not confirmed. We enrolled 539 adults in 34 sites across the United States with a definitive history of springtime seasonal allergic rhinitis and positive specific IgE to the pollens prominent in their sites, in their community during that time period. The ages range from 18 to 77. There was a baseline run in time, which lasted seven days. The last four days were the symptom diary that we used for the baseline. And during that time, the patients took loratadine once a day. The next seven days were also taking loratadine once a day, plus seven days dosed every four hours, either placebo or phenylephrine hydrochloride tablets, 10 milligrams at dosages of 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams, or 40 milligrams. The primary efficacy endpoint was the mean change from the baseline over the seven-day treatment period in daily reflective nasal congestion scores, which was scored on a range of severity from zero to three. Next slide. There were over 100 patients in each of the four phenylephrine groups, 10, 20, 30, and 40 milligrams, and 100 subjects in the placebo group. These were analyzed. Next slide. In terms of the efficacy results, the mean medication adherence was roughly 80% for each of the five treatment groups. The key finding for the primary efficacy variable compared with placebo, none of the oral phenylephrine hydrochloride treatment groups had statistically significant greater change from baseline in the reflective nasal congestion scores. 
You can see those numbers. The placebo nasal congestion score was reduced 0.43. 10 milligrams, 0.46. 20 milligrams, 0.50. 30 milligrams, 0.51. 40 milligrams, 0.46. No differences statistically from placebo. And essentially all secondary endpoint comparisons, including nasal congestion at specific times, were not statistically different from placebo for an identified dose of oral phenylephrine. Next slide. We can see visually here in both the placebo and in the active groups, both during the baseline and during the treatment time, no differences between doses and no meaningful differences between active and placebo. Next slide. In terms of safety results, the most common adverse effect was headache at 3%, not dose related. The 40 milligram dose had one case of chest and jaw pain and one case of moderate increase in blood pressure, but generally no sustained or dose related changes in blood pressure. Next slide. So in conclusion of this first phenylephrine dose ranging trial, this was a large and well-designed study. It failed to identify a dose of oral phenylephrine in the range of 10 to 40 milligrams given every four hours that was significantly more effective than placebo in relieving nasal congestion. Next slide. The second clinical study was reported in the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology in 2016. Next slide. The method was similar. This had over 570 adults in 29 sites with, again, a definite history of seasonal allergic rhinitis, this time during the fall. They also had specific IgE to pollens that were ambient at that time in the sites that were part of the study. The baseline run-in was seven days, during which the patients took loratadine as needed. And that was followed by seven days taking every 12 hours either blinded placebo or oral phenylephrine hydrochloride modified 30 milligram tablets. The dosing was thought to be in the modified release formulation to be more convenient, being only twice a day instead of every four hours, and provide sustained levels of active parent phenylephrine and thereby improve efficacy. The primary efficacy endpoint in this study was the same as in the first, mean change from baseline over the treatment period in daily reflective nasal congestion scores in a range of zero to three. Next slide. We see here that the placebo had 287 patients. The 30 milligram twice a day regimen had 288 patients. Again, 29 sites across the United States, fairly widespread distribution. Next slide. The efficacy results, the adherence here was 99% plus for both the placebo and the active treatment groups. The mean loratadine, which was taken as needed, was the same in the placebo and the phenylephrine groups. 3.8 days for placebo groups, 3.8 days for the phenylephrine groups during the treatment phase. And the primary efficacy endpoint is compared with placebo, the oral phenylephrine modified release treatment group had no statistical significant greater change from baseline during the entire treatment period in reflective nasal congestion scores. The placebo reduced the nasal congestion 0.41, the phenylephrine a little less 0.39. Essentially, all the secondary endpoint comparisons showed similar changes from baseline. One additional outcome was looking at quality of life. Generally, patients with nasal congestion have problems physically, socially, emotionally, and mentally, and quality of life can be measured by the rhinoconjunctivitis quality of life questionnaires. In this study, there was no difference in the placebo and in the phenylephrine groups in terms of their assessments of their quality of life by that questionnaire. Next slide. 
You can see on the right-hand side, the baseline for the placebo was 2.2 out of a possible three, and the phenylephrine 2.35 out of a possible, again, three. No difference at baseline and after the treatment. 0.41 in the placebo group changed, a reduction in their nasal congestion. 0.39, a little less in the phenylephrine group. Again, not statistically significant. Next slide. In terms of safety, between the two groups, there was no differences in the blood pressure. There was no difference in the heart rate. There was no difference in the frequency of headaches, both about 3%. There was really no difference in what we sometimes see, CNS stimulation with these agents as manifested by insomnia or irritability, no difference between the two groups. Next slide. And the conclusion was in this large, well-designed study, and it was expected to provide sustained levels of the active parent hydrochloride phenylephrine during the 12-hour dosing intervals, the results showed that although the 30 milligram oral phenylephrine was well-tolerated, it was not significantly more effective than placebo in relieving nasal congestion due to allergic rhinitis. Next slide. We will now turn from the clinical trials that I've just presented about phenylephrine to the subject of other medications that are options for the treatment of nasal congestion due to allergic rhinitis. According to a survey of 2,000 patients with allergic rhinitis, among the symptoms that they experience, nasal congestion is the most bothersome of all their symptoms. You can see in this slide, nasal congestion is selected over 50% by patients, both adults and children, as the most bothersome symptom, more so certainly than runny nose, sneezing, and itchy nose. Next slide. This table is a survey that was done in 2015, around the same time as the studies that I just reported. And this survey had a question related to allergic rhinitis patients regarding which medications they were taking for their symptoms, both over the counter and by prescription, both in adults and in children. And the most common, if you look at the left column, was oral antihistamines. And the second most common was oral decongestants. Further lower on the list in terms of frequency of use was intranasal decongestants, nasal antihistamines, intranasal corticosteroids, and combination agents. I'll show you efficacy of those families. Next slide. Unfortunately, despite it being the most commonly used by patients with allergic rhinitis, when you look at the left-hand column, which is the symptom of nasal congestion, according to the most recent practice parameters from the American Allergy Societies, oral antihistamines have limited efficacy as treatment for nasal congestion. Next slide. This is a study that compared placebo to the oral antihistamine desloratadine. Certainly, that antihistamine improved the symptoms of nasal discharge compared to placebo, nasal itch, sneezing compared to placebo, but the oral antihistamine did not improve nasal congestion. That was the symptom. The next slide shows what about the nasal flow as measured. In rhinomanometry, next slide, which measures both expiratory and inspiratory flow, there was slight improvement in expiratory flow by the oral antihistamine. However, the inspiratory flow, which is really the important functional aspect of the nose, was not improved. Next slide. In contrast to oral antihistamines, intranasal antihistamines do improve nasal congestion. In this study of the intranasal antihistamine, azelastine, the nasal inspiratory flow rate 
improved by 14% from baseline. Next slide. And the improvement occurs rapidly. So when you give intranasal antihistamine to somebody who's congested, generally within 30 minutes, there is a decrease in their nasal obstruction, and that is sustained usually for the pharmacodynamic length of time for those agents. Rapid onset, adequate improvement. Next slide. The oral decongestant Phenylephrine, I have suggested, is not effective. However, oral pseudoephedrine, which is also a nasal decongestant given orally, does improve nasal congestion. In this study, if you look at the four columns on the right-hand side called overall, the column to the farthest right is placebo. That was the improvement in the symptom of nasal congestion. Next to it, to its left, which is black and white, is Sudafed. And you can see a decrease or an increase in the uh, improvement of the symptom with the oral decongestant Sudafredin. Next slide, please. Related to what I have reviewed, I'll list a few summary statements from the practice parameters the consensus-based statements that were published in 2020. First, oral antihistamines minimally effective for nasal congestion and less so than intranasal antihistamines. Secondly, the oral decongestant phenylephrine demonstrated to be ineffective for reducing nasal congestion. Thirdly, the oral decongestant pseudoephed, pseudoephedrine is effective. And if nasal congestion is uncontrolled by an oral antihistamine, considering adding pseudoephedrine to that oral antihistamine would be a worthwhile thought. Certainly, toleration is important. The oral decongestant pseudoephedrine has been restricted to reduce illicit methamphetamine production, and it can cause insomnia, irritability, and palpitations. And lastly, oral decongestants do not cause rebound congestion. Next slide. Along with the intranasal antihistamines, which I suggested do improve nasal congestion, and pseudoephedrine, which I suggested does improve nasal congestion, intranasal corticosteroids are a third monotherapeutic agent known to improve nasal congestion. In the second row of this table, we can see baseline scores for the intranasal corticosteroid mometasone, and we also see one for placebo. And you can see they're both 2.6. That was the rating the patients gave for their congestion. After two weeks of treatment, you can see the mometasone Reflective nasal congestion score was significantly better. It was 25% better in reduction of nasal obstruction. The placebo was only 16% improved. Next slide, please. A combination of an intranasal corticosteroid plus an intranasal decongestant is even better than the intranasal corticosteroid by itself for the improvement of nasal congestion. In the third row, we see that the two-week change from baseline in the peak nasal inspiratory flow, improving nasal inspiration, shows, if you look from the right-hand side of that third row, placebo was improved 23%. The single agent of mometasone, the intranasal corticosteroid, was improved 41%. But the combination of the intranasal corticosteroid plus the intranasal decongestant oxymetazoline improved 57% when one spray was used and 66% when, when three sprays were used. So if we look at the next slide, again, some additional practice parameter consensus statements include intranasal corticosteroids are effective for short and long-term treatment of 
nasal congestion. Intranasal decongestants are effective too, including phenylephrine, the one that's not effective orally for either intermittent or episodic nasal congestion. Short-term treatment is usually three to five days, medicine given twice a day. Thirdly, intranasal decongestants can be recommended for persistent nasal congestion, unresponsive to intranasal corticosteroids. You can add the intranasal decongestant to the intranasal corticosteroid for up to four weeks. It produces faster and greater decrease in nasal congestion than with either the intranasal decongestant or the intranasal corticosteroid by itself. And when intranasal decongestants are added to intranasal corticosteroids once a day for two to four weeks, rhinitis medicamentosa does not occur. Next slide. The last combination I'll discuss and recommend for persistent nasal congestion unresponsive to intranasal corticosteroids alone is intranasal corticosteroids plus an intranasal antihistamine. In the middle column, we see that the combination of the intranasal steroid fluticasone and the intranasal antihistamine azelastine is statistically better not only than placebo, but also the individual components of fluticasone as monotherapy and azelastine as monotherapy. In conclusion, last slide. The bad news is oral phenylephrine is not effective for nasal congestion. However, the good news is there are many fine therapeutic options for nasal congestion due to allergic rhinitis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, speaker number two. Um, I will just pause for a moment to see if there are any brief questions from the advisory committee members, uh, given that we've seen some new data here today. Uh, yes, Dr. Fake, go ahead. Uh, thank you for that, that presentation. Very, very uh, nice and very enlightening. Your conclusion is that pseudoephedrine uh, has no effect. Who no, was no, 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 no. Not pseudoephedrine, pseudoephedrine. I'm sorry. Phenylephrine, I'm sorry, I said that incorrect. I'm trying to get to the point. Your co who funded these studies, Merck? Correct, Merck funded the phenylephrine studies. They were looking to see if they could come with a longer acting phenylephrine. Phenylephrine was only available at the time that we did the studies in the short acting every four hour uh, regimen. And that is from a adherence standpoint, very difficult for patients. So if they could create a modified, the other issue they had was what is the right dose? We didn't have any good studies of what the right dose is. So the first study was to find a dose. We went double, triple, quadruple, showed no benefit. And then we tried the modified release, showed no benefit. And who was the co-author uh, and where did they work on both of those studies? Yeah, the three authors that are listed in both of those studies are myself. I am a practicing clinician and do clinical research. Paul Ratner, who unfortunately has passed away, was a clinical researcher and a clinician in uh, Texas. And the third was Tom McGraw, who worked for Merck. Okay. And Merck did not try to stop the publication of these uh, papers. Not at all. Not at all. I was very, I was very um, happy about their attitude. They said, that's the science. Those are the data. Publish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on Dr. Clement. Um, and do please remember to state your name into the record for me. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Steve Clement, um, Anova Health System in Virginia. Um, I am the non-allergist pulmonologist in this group, so I'm still trying to learn everything. Um, one of the speakers on the industry group uh, was very emphatic when he was reviewing your study that SAR is not the cold and that they're completely different. It, you mentioned that you're a clinician. So how do you respond to that? Or do you think these data um, or would be replicable in a study of patients with just average cold. He was saying that the P SAR is much more refractory and difficult to treat con compared to a common cold, which may still benefit from even mild efficacy. Uh, there's about six questions in there with all due respect. Common Appreciate colds it. are different than uh, the allergic mechanism. The allergic mechanism is not more difficult or less difficult. It depends upon the individual patient, but congestion is congestion. 
And the mm -hmm. etiology of it, whether it's infectious or immunologic, is, is comparable. I think uh, that what works will work for congestion, uh, whatever the etiology happens to be. Um, I think the magnitude of the disease determines the efficacy. Okay. Thank you very much. But, I'm, that's my only question. I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to move on to speaker number three. Speaker number three, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Uh, you may begin and introduce yourself by stating your name and any organization that you're representing for the record. You have 15 minutes. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Randy Hatton. I'm a clinical professor at the University of Florida College of Pharmacy, where I've been for over 40 years. I'm not here representing the University of Florida. I'm here representing myself as a private citizen. I've been interested in this topic for over uh, 20 years with my colleague, Leslie Hindelis, who you'll hear from a little bit later. I got interested because I was the director of the Drug Information Center. And after pseudoephedrine was removed in front of the counter to behind the counter, I received a rash of calls from around the state of Florida asking why oral phenylephrine didn't work. That led me to Dr. Hendeliz, and the two of us have collaborated on this issue for over 20 years. Next slide, please. I don't have any conflicts of interest as is stated on the slide. Next slide, please. Let me state very clearly, there is no modern evidence that shows that oral phenyl effort is effective. Our meta-analysis published in 2007 questioned the effectiveness of oral phenyl effort. The, there was, was a competing meta-analysis we'll I'll talk about a little bit later, but those meta-analyses do not prove efficacy or that there is no efficacy. The several modern studies that came after the 2007 adv advisory committee meeting show that oral phenylephrine is not effective. The reason it's not effective is because not enough phenylephrine gets to the site of action in the nose. So therefore, oral phenylephrine should not be deemed effective and it should be removed from the market. Next slide, please. You've seen this uh, forest plot a couple of times. This is from our original publication back in 2007, where we asked for, through the Freedom of Information Act, to get the raw data that was used by the original uh, monograph for oral phenylephrine. One of the things I'd like you to take from this slide is heterogeneity. You know, those of you that know meta-analyses know that, heter uh, that meta heterogeneity is the enemy in meta-analysis. We were looking at this to see whether there was a, a suggestion as to whether or not oral phenylephrine worked. As you can see, our 95% confidence interval costs zero, and we question the efficacy of the 10 milligram dose of oral phenylephrine. Next slide, please. Uh, could you click one more time, please? Thank you. Uh, th what this, sh because they, there was so much heterogeneity, we looked at the different labs that did these studies way back in the 1960s and 1970s. What we found was a highly suspicious trend in the Elizabeth biochemical studies. As I've shown on this slide, is if you just look at the bars with the cross lines, those are the Elizabeth studies at 10, 15, 20, and 25 milligrams. Interestingly, there was no dose response for phenylephrine from the Elizabeth Biochemical Labs. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. That led us to do some additional analysis. Our statistician, Dr. Jonathan Schuster, he examined the raw data from the Elizabeth Biochemical Studies. Dr. Schuster's analysis suggests either a poor methodology for Elizabeth Biochemical, an unusual patient population, or fraud. And this table, table AII, shows you that over 24% of the final digits, the last digit, had a frequency of five, which according to the method of BICE listed on the slide, suggests that this should, this should not happen by chance, that there is something wrong with these data. Next slide, please. This slide that comes from the Elizabeth Biochemical Study shows no placebo response, another highly unusual finding. Next slide, please. 
Other than Elizabeth Biochemical, the Sentest number one found a positive response. Notice there were two other studies done by Sentest that were negative studies. This study is interesting because we couldn't do forensic statistics on that because of the way the data was presented as percents rather than the actual values. But if you look at the results in the figure on the slide, you'll note that the measurements of nasal airway resistance don't match the pharmacokinetics of oral phenylephrine with the peak occurring at about three hours. And I think you've heard multiple times today that that is not reasonable for our dose of oral phenylephrine. Next slide, please. Next, we have the Huntington Research Center study number one. This study was done to try to replicate what was found at Elizabeth Biochemical. And as uh, 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 was talk, discussed earlier today, they actually went to Elizabeth Biochemical because they couldn't replicate the, the, what they were finding at their study. And um, they were unable to validate Elizabeth Biochemical studies despite, uh, and they also noted the small variability in the Elizabeth Biochemical studies. Next slide, please. So these old studies, not modern studies like we'll talk about in a minute, but these old studies suffer from many of the same problems. Most were done in the late 60s and 70s. They were most not published. They were memos sent to the FDA and they did not undergo peer review. They were in-house studies funded by pharmaceutical companies. They were very small studies and they had unusual data as I've mentioned for the Elizabeth Biochemical and the one Sentest study. So the, and also finally, the nasal airway resistance studies that were done back then used old technology. And there is newer technology that could have been used since the 2007 ADCOM committee to show that oral phenylephrine worked. Next study, next slide, please. This study shows the number of patients we're talking about in this, in our meta-analysis who were on oral phenylephrine that had these very large favorable results and highly influenced the overall meta-analysis, whether it was ours or whether it was the collar meta-analysis. And you can see those are very small numbers, less than 50. Next slide, please. I do want to bring up uh, the Common Cold Center at Cardiff University in the UK. This is run, was run by Dr. Professor Eccles, who'd been studying decongestants for, at the Common Cold Center in the UK for many years. We've been contacted by Dr. Eccles, who supports our position that oral phenylephrine is ineffective. And I'm gonna quote Professor Eccles here. The techniques used to measure nasal airway resistance and the protocols used to obtain nasal airway resistance measurements have greatly advanced since the last data were available for nasal airway resistance for oral phenylephrine that were used in the monograph. Clinical trial design and criteria used to select patients have also greatly advanced and published studies can be more critically as assessed these days. Based on pro Professor Eccles' position, he called in, in an editorial for funding to do modern studies on oral decongestants to show that they're effective using these more up-to-date techniques. What I've shown on the slide here is the results of one of those studies that looked at oral pseudoephedrine. And as you can see, from the figure on the left, the, those are nasal airway resistance values. And on the right, you can see the subjective scores for nasal congestion. And both of those were able to show using this more modern technique that uh, oral pseudoephedrine was effective. Now, uh, unfortunately, nobody came forward. And as a, one of my themes in my presentation is there is no modern evidence like shown for pseudoephedrine that show that oral phenylephrine is effective. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, this is just another Professor Eccles study. And this study again showed that pseudoephedrine was superior to placebo using his new modern, more modern types of of uh, technology. So modern studies of phenylephrine like this one could have been done since 2007. However, they have not. Next slide, please. Just to reflect back on what's been reviewed earlier today, but, uh, but what happened at the 2007 Ad, Ad Advisory Committee meeting, nine out of the 12 members said voted that they wanted new studies, not those old studies from the 1960s and 1970s, which I think we know have some methodological concerns. They wanted new studies. Not only that, but they wanted to have studies that looked at the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics and bioavailability. Uh, and the committee members also brought up the need for uh, 
I'm sorry for the, I, I stated that already, sorry. And CHIPA, or the Consumer Health Products Association, uh, in a statement said that they are committed to adding, adding emphasize here to the existing body of evidence. They have not done so. Next slide, please. We could argue about the methodologies of the uh, different meta-analyses and our statistician went back and forth with their statistician. But I think one of the most important things you can see here, uh, could you click please? One more time. Yes, what you can see is that whether it's our meta-analysis or the color meta-analysis, the Elizabeth biochemical studies had a huge effect on the, the aggregate for the, both meta-analyses. Uh, and we have shown that those data are questionable at best. Uh, and for this reason, we're not too worried about which is the better meta-analysis. We think the modern data have validated our meta-analysis and, and shown that theirs was not accurate. Next slide, please. So I, I won't go through this. You've heard all these studies, the Horak Day and the two Meltzer studies. Dr. Meltzer just did a fantastic job going over his. But let me just point out, that these are published peer-reviewed studies that have been what were published between 2009 and 2016. No similar studies are in the literature peer-reviewed for oral phenylephrine. Next slide, please. This has already been gone over as well. This is the unpublished negative study uh, for, for that was sponsored by Johnson & Johnson that you can find the results for in clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, I, I do want to bring to your attention that the that even though it was stopped early, the differences in in this time frame and this time frame is the I think uh, within two hours uh, between the two phenylephrine treatments and placebo are so small on this eight point scale, and the p values were close to one. That if it had a futility analysis been done. I don't care what sample size you use, there's no way they're gonna find a statistically significant difference between placebo and the active comparator. And I do wanna point out that on clinicaltrials.gov, you'll see that there is, there is a note. There is an agreement between the principal investigators of this study and the sponsor or its agents that restricts the PI's right to discuss or publish the trial results after completion. Negative trial results, could have done a futility analysis, never got published. I also note that there are several other oral phenylephrine studies in clinical trial gov, and none of those were, were completed or published, and that doesn't suggest a favorable effect for oral phenylephrine. Next slide, please. I'm really not gonna talk about this slide. This is an old study from 1942 that showed a 250 milligram dose of oral phenylephrine sh showed effects on blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, and those authors in their paper stated the threshold doses for phenylephrine in the average adult is about 50 milligrams. Next slide, please. I'm also not going to talk about this, but this came from the 2007 advisory committee meeting, and it shows that below 50 milligrams, there's not any effect on blood, heart rate or blood pressure. Next slide, please. Now, there's been some discussion about the Hengstman uh, oral bioavailability that, that everybody has learned incorrectly, that it's 38%. Next slide, please. I want to be clear. The reason why that, that estimate is incorrect is because it's measuring, because it was done with radio-labeled phenylephrine, it's measuring total phenylephrine, of which only a very small percentage is active. Now, this study, although it was said that there is no good data, this good data presented in 2007 by Sharing Plow showed very low levels of, of total parent uh, Phenylephrine. All right, next slide, please. So oral phenylephrine in low levels and bioavailability. Yeah, maybe you could have low levels and still have bioavailability, but whether it's 1%, 1.3% or less, very minute levels of oral phenylephrine make it to the systemic circulation because of the extensive metabolism in the gut. And if you look at the publications by Jalot that you've heard about today, the actual values are very low in the picogram per mil uh, concentrations. Next slide, please. So in summary, I wanna say, it is important to note that no modern evidence shows that oral phenylephrine is at the currently approved over-the-counter dose decreases objective nasal airway resistance or subjective nasal congestion, stuffiness, or pressure measurements. 
our meta-analysis of data in 19, in the 19, of the 1970s suggested that, uh, that oral phenylephrine does not work. And we pointed out the major flaws in the Elizabeth biochemical results. Uh, recent unpublished data, the Johnson & Johnson study, and the four published peer-reviewed studies showed that oral phenylephrine is not effective. And this is due to the low systemic plasma levels that are that occur after the 10 milligram oral dose. So oral phenylephrine should be removed from the market because it does not work. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, open, um, just spend a few minutes here if there's any questions from our advisory committee members for this presenter. Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for your attendance. And we'll thank move you. on to speaker number four. Speaker number four, go ahead and unmute and turn on your webcam. Um, you may begin by introducing yourself, stating your name and any organization that you are representing for the record. You have 20 minutes. Uh, can you see me? It doesn't look like the uh, the video. We can we can hear you. We can't see you. Okay. So, uh, my name is Leslie Hendless. I'm a, a professor emeritus at the College of Pharmacy at the University of Florida. Uh, I have 50, uh, almost 50 years of teaching pharmacists and physicians about drugs for asthma and rhinitis. Uh, my topic uh, this afternoon is quality science tells the true story of oral phenylephrine. Uh, can I have the first slide? And I'll move on to the next slide, please. Uh, I have no financial relationship to disclose. Next slide. My take home messages are, First, oral phenylephrine is ineffective as a nasal decongestant, but safe. Second, 99% uh, of the oral dose is inactivated by first-pass metabolism. The six OTC panel reached a, a specious conclusion about efficacy. Uh, and uh, last but not least, there's several truly effective over-the-counter products that are currently available uh, in grocery stores and, and uh, 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 convenience stores, et cetera. So the, if, if phenylephrine is taken off the market, uh, there is plenty to fill its place. Next slide, please. Uh, looking about phenylephrine many years ago, uh, I read a paper that was presented by Dr. Bickerman to the Proprietary Association, which I think is the uh, predecessor to uh, uh, CHPA. And uh, they had, uh, uh, at Columbia University, developed a uh, methodology that actually was reproducible with uh, uh, measuring uh, nasal airway resistance. Uh, next slide. Uh, what they did is they added pneumotachograph to a, a scuba mask and were able to measure flow and nasal airway resistance. And they compared uh, uh, Non patients with and without stuffiness. Uh, in addition, they had day-to-day uh, uh, -day, uh, variability uh, measured, and they, they did a reasonable job of showing that they had a, a reproducible method. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, they ended with uh, a double-blind randomized crossover design in patients with chronic nasal congestion uh, comparing placebo, pseudoephedrine, 60 milligrams, phenylpropanolamine, 40 milligrams, and phenylephrine, 10 milligrams. And you can see here, uh, this is a change in, in nasal airway resistance that both the pseudoephedrine and phenylpropanolamine uh, significantly reduced uh, uh, nasal airway resistance, and that uh, phenylephrine was no different than uh, placebo. Next slide, please. Uh, there was virtually uh, no uh, uh, product. Well, there was perhaps maybe one product or two products with phenylephrine in it uh, after uh, the uh, uh, panel's re recommendations. Uh, most of the products had phenylpropanolamine or pseudoephedrine. When the uh, co Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act was uh, instituted in 2005, 
uh, manufacturers uh, did not want to lose their income from from their products by putting them behind the, the uh, counter. And so they uh, s- substituted uh, phenylephrine. Uh, uh, there is uh, good evidence that there is a phenylephrine in about 261 products. And uh, I, I have here on this slide that the annual sales is 1.5 billion, but I believe that uh, that uh, somebody from the FDA uh, said said that it was 1.8 billion in in uh, 2022. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Dr. Hatton's uh, uh, study, and I, he has uh, done a great job of uh, explaining it. The only thing I'll add is a, a statement he's. He said, uh, uh, it's too good to be true. Next slide. Uh, after, because, of, because of that uh, uh, meta-analysis sh- showing such a striking uh, lack of efficacy, uh, we uh, decided to submit a, a citizen's petition to FDA in 2007. And we requested the FDA to increase the maximum dose uh, of phenylephrine uh, for, for patients that were 12 years and over. Uh, we asked that Hello, this is Jessica speaking. Um, OPH speaker number four, if you are still speaking, we're not able to hear you. Um, Could you please check if you have accidentally muted? Yes, this is uh, speaker number three. Uh, Dr. Hendelis is rebooting his computer. If you could just give him one minute, uh, we would very much appreciate it. So I believe we'll be able to offer Dr. Yes. Hi, Dr. Coyle. Um, yes, I was going to suggest um, if we can continue on to the next speaker, we'll keep track of where Dr. Hendel is left off, and then um, we'll come back to him if that's okay with you. Yep. Yes, that works perfectly. Um, so speaker number five, if you're available, please unmute. Um, and turn on your webcam. You can begin by introducing yourself, stating your name and any organization that you're representing for the record, and you will have five minutes. Go ahead. Yes, hi, my name is Elizabeth Farrington. I am the current president of the American College of Clinical Pharmacy, and I practice as a pediatric pharmacist in both general pediatrics and pediatric critical care, and I have no financial conflicts of interest to report. Um, Next slide, please. Um, The American College of Clinical Pharmacy represents about 17,000 clinical pharmacists, so I'm here, I'm representing that group. Our mission is to improve human health, but most importantly, to demonstrate the safe and efficacious use of medications. Next slide. Um, I'm... I've already said this since you had me do it at the beginning. Go ahead. Next slide. Um, just to reiterate what the previous speakers have 
um, told us that the bioavailability of phenylephrine is very low and, sh and shows minimal benefit in patients. Um, the bioavailability, although published at about 39%, um, as Dr. Um, Henless and Hatton have demonstrated, it's probably closer to 1%. Um, and it has been demonstrated in numerous more recent studies to be ineffective as a decongestant. Next slide, please. Um, it's a major ingredient in almost every over-the-counter um, combination product since the impact of the um, removing agents that could be used to produce methamphetamine from the market. Um, and published peer-reviewed results clearly demonstrate, as our previous um, speakers have demonstrated, the lack of efficacy, even if you quadruple the dose in the box, up to as much as 40 milligrams. Next slide, please. Despite the evidence that phenylephrine is ineffective as a decongestant, the US FDA has failed to remove it from the OTC decongestant monograph. Um, and we would like to ensure consumers that all drugs on the market are effective. There are some small studies that have been published that although the bioavailability bioavailability is very low of phenylephrine, some patients with hypertension are, can be quite sensitive to that 1% absorption. Um, and there are some case series of stroke reported in adults from elevated blood pressure. There's a series of pediatric patients who became hypertensive from that 1% bioavailability. Um, and there is one published study that demonstrated um, concern and, and pregnancy as well. So the American College of Clinical Pharmacy would like to call on the FDA to remove oral over-the-counter products containing phenylephrine from the market. We feel like there's also adequate other agents, topical um, intranasal products that can be used for decongestants that are efficacious, that would be more beneficial to patients than allowing them to buy a product over the counter that says it's a decongestant that is ineffective. Thank you. Thank you, speaker number six, uh, number five. We appreciate it, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on. Um, we'll um, call on speaker number six at this point and then circle back to catch up thereafter. So uh, speaker number six, please unmute and turn on your webcam. You may begin uh, by introducing yourself, stating your name, and any organization that you're representing for the record. Uh, you have five minutes. Hello, my name is Sophia Phillips. and I'm a health policy associate speaking on behalf of the National Center for Health Research. The medical and public health professionals at our nonprofit think tank scrutinize research on the safety and effectiveness of medical products. And we do not accept funding from companies that make those products. Therefore, we have no conflicts of interest. The National Center for Health Research appreciates the opportunity to testify on the lack of efficacy surrounding orally administered phenylephrine, or PE, as a nasal decongestant, and the need to reclassify both phenylephrine hydrochloride and phenylephrine bitartrate as not generally recognized as safe and effective. Our position is simple. Oral PE should not be on the market if it doesn't work. The public needs to trust the FDA to take products off the market that are proven to not work compared to placebo. Here are very persuasive reasons to amend the gray status of oral PE. First, to prevent a delay in care creating missed opportunities for use of more effective treatments, including a doctor's visit if needed. Second, to avoid the risks of potential allergic reactions or other side effects related to use of PE and combination products. Third, to avoid the inherent risks, especially for combination therapies, of taking more in order to seek some benefit, as significantly higher doses can lead to negative effects, such as potentially clinically meaningful systematic, systemic increases in blood pressure. And fourth, to avoid unnecessary costs for consumers and to restore consumers' trust that FDA approval means a product has benefits compared to placebo. Millions of dollars have been wasted by consumers on a product that has been shown in research to have no more benefit than placebo. The public is being misled and spending their hard earned dollars because of the drug's label specifying it as FDA approved, as an FDA approved effective cold medicine. 
it is the duty of the FDA to make changes based on the known efficacy of its approved medical products. We recognize that FDA should educate consumers about research indicating that PE is not effective and describe alternatives that are effective, including both oral and intranasal products. FDA should work with the media to explain to consumers how to obtain PSE alternatives from behind the counter. These efforts will be essential to facilitate an efficient transition away from PE toward cold medicines that are safe and effective. Lastly, FDA stated that the potential impact on industry will not be discussed at this AC meeting. We agree and want to emphasize that the potential to reduce industry profits should be irrelevant when FDA makes decisions that have a direct impact on public health. This is especially true for a product that has been known for years to be ineffective, but has not been voluntarily removed from the market by the companies that make or sell it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, at this time, we will um, go back to our uh, speaker number four. Uh, welcome back. Please unmute and turn on your webcam. Uh, begin by reintroducing yourself, um, including your name and your organization. And uh, I believe you have about 14 minutes left for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Handless, uh, University of Florida. So uh, where I left off it was uh, after the, the citizens petition uh, FDA uh, uh, arranged for uh, an advisory committee, and uh, if I could have the next slide. Uh, the, the two recommendations from the advisory committee, one was given the available data that exists, the evidence is supportive, that's my uh, uh, enhancement there, the evidence is supportive that the 10 milligram immediate release formulation may be effective. So they weren't very uh, 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 emphatic. It was maybe effective. And they said additional studies are needed to assess the efficacy and safety of higher doses. Next slide, please. When sinus pressure from a cold or allergy start to build, all you want is relief. Relief from sinus pressure, from feeling so stuffed up, so congested, you might just blow. That's why there's Sudafed PE. The medicine in Sudafed PE is clinically shown to relieve nasal congestion in minutes. <sighs> Sudafed PE. Get your head back where it belongs. And for relief of your cold symptoms, try Sudafed PE Severe Cold. So obviously, uh, the the efficacy of uh, what what you've seen so far uh, doesn't match what what's being promoted to uh, to patients, giving them uh, false ex expectations. Uh, just as an example, uh, this is the Horwick study that's been discussed before. Uh, that shows uh, the relief of congestion in an allergen cha chamber where patients got the, the same allergen at the same dose. And they were uh, randomized to receive uh, phenylephrine, uh, which is the circle of uh, pseudoephedrine or placebo. And this is the change in, in nasal congestion score uh, you can see that it was uh, significantly different from placebo with pseudoephedrine, but not with uh, phenylephrine. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Meltzer has already discussed his, his study in detail. Uh, the only thing I would add to, uh, to his uh, uh, comment is that uh, antihistamines, uh, right here, Antihistamines uh, uh, suppress histamine, and nasal stuffiness is not mediated by histamine. So the fact that that uh, loratadine was uh, uh, included in in his two studies is uh, is is not likely to to have caused a problem because uh, not only is is uh, loratadine has no other uh, pharmacologic action than being an antihistamine. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we were so impressed with uh, Dr. Meltzer's study that we uh, then uh, submitted the second uh, petition. And in this one, we specifically asked 
that uh, phenylephrine be removed from the market. This was in in 2015, and it was based upon uh, the uh, not only efficacy but also clinical pharmacology studies showing that that less than one uh, percent of the dose of active drug uh, reach the systemic circulation. Next slide, please. Uh, CHPA uh, mentioned in their briefing that low oral bioavailability bio does not mean lack of eff efficacy. Well, I, I disagree. I think at least for phenylephrine, it sure does. And the EC50, which has already been shown to you, uh, was several times greater than the, the peak plasma concentration. And, and therefore, it's very unlikely that there was uh, enough attachment to alpha receptors and then that, that's really confirmed by, by really five modern, well-designed clinical studies showing that phenylephrine was equal to a placebo. Next slide, please. So uh, for the common cold, there uh, are nasal uh, spray decongestants. Phenylephrine is extremely uh, effective, and I'll show you some data in, uh, in a second. Uh, it, it's uh, short acting and there are longer acting uh, products like oxymetazole and uh, afrin. There's no risk of uh, uh, re uh, rebound congestion with a common cold because the duration of the cold is short lived and uh, so patients don't need to treat themselves for an extended period of time. And of course, th there is uh, oral pseudoephedrine. For allergic rhinitis, uh, the most effects that effective medications over the counter are nasal steroids, and there are three different uh, products that are over the counter. Uh, the uh, another product is an antihistamine mast cell stabilizer, and the reason why the topical uh, spray antihistamines seem to have more efficacy for uh, stuffiness is because they actually have a mast cell stabilizing effect uh, and uh, uh, prevent the mast cells from uh, degranulating. Azelastine is the is the drug, and Astipro is the uh, brand name. And of course, there is oral uh, pseudoephedrine that's combined with uh, uh, antihistamines, and there are three products uh, behind the counter. Uh, next slide, please. And, and this is a study that uh, compares the. Uh, decrease in nasal airway resistance with uh, uh, topical phenylephrine, which is drops down almost 80% decrease. It, uh, and then by two hours, it, uh, it's, it's lost a lot of its efficacy. Uh, the uh, box, the squares are uh, phenylpropanolamine, uh, less effective than the topical uh, uh, spray, but uh, longer duration of action. And then the triangles are uh, a VIX inhaler, which uh, it, it's a mix, mixture of uh, uh, levo uh, methamphetamine and camphor and menthol. Next slide, please. And this is a study of patients with seasonal allergic rhinitis uh, that were treated for a month in a double blind randomized crossover design with uh, either fluticasone or loratadine. And if you look at the uh, blockage, you can see very clearly that the uh, nasal steroid is a, much more effective than, than uh, the antihistamine. Uh, and it does, uh, uh, even in perennial allergic uh, rhinitis, uh, for most patients, the over-the-counter uh, nasal steroids are all they need to have relief of stuffiness and, and the other symptoms as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a comment that was uh, submitted to the docket by the American Pharmacists Association. It says, APHA represents our nation's pharmacists who have tremendous experience with OTC oral phenylephrine products. They often receive feedback from patients who are seeking relief for nasal congestion, relying on claims that oral phenyl phenylephrine products will relieve their symptoms. These patients often complain of the ineffectiveness and lack of nasal congestion relief from oral phen phenylephrine products. Next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, uh, the take home messages are oral phenylephrine is ineffective, uh, is an ineffective as a nasal decongestant, but safe. 
99% of the oral dose is in, inactivated by first pass metabolism, and that makes a, different, a difference for this drug. The, the uh, 1976 OTC panel, uh, although they were well-meaning, uh, the studies were, were, had many methodological problems and uh, possibly even some fabrication. Uh, so they reached a specious conclusion about efficacy and last uh, but not least, uh, there's several uh, products on the market now that patients can get, uh, and they don't, and they're sold in grocery stores as well. So they they don't have to wait in line or, or go to a pharmacy and uh, get something sued with them from behind the counter. And I'll, I'll stop at this point and thank you for your time and especially for accommodating my computer glitch. Thank you, Dr. Hendel. Is, um, I'm going to open up um, a few minutes for any questions for Dr. Hendel is from the panel. Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Um, as we have some additional time left in our agenda today, we are going to um, return to take some remaining clarifying questions from uh, earlier today. These can be directed to CHPA um, or uh, could also be directed to FDA. So please raise your hand. Um, remember to state your name for the record uh, before you speak and to direct your question to a specific presenter, if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. And as a gentle reminder, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your remarks or your questions with a thank you and the end of, end of any follow-up questions with that is all for my questions so that we can move on um, to the next panel member. Okay, I'm going to scan my roster here um, and we can begin um, with Uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Schwartzoff, if you had a question remaining from um, earlier today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak and then we can um, go back to uh, our roster here. My question was actually about the... Um, please, please state your name for the record. Oh, Jennifer Schwartzoff, patient representative. Thank you. Um, my question was um, towards the FDA in regards to the concept of the bioavailability and the efficacy, and it was also brought up by some of the people that were speaking. Um, I'm a patient, so I'm not a doctor or scientist. Um, so this is like something that was confusing me because I'm hearing differences from both sides. I was wondering if the FDA could address the um, association statement that the low bioavailability Bioavailability um, or potency does not um, mean that it it's not uh, or doesn't affect the efficacy. Efficacy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Could the FDA address that? Hello, this is Dr. Teresa Michelle at the FDA. So. I'm going to put this in patient-friendly terms, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wren, who will give the um, more precise answer. So in patient-friendly terms, the thing that matters when you are dosing a drug is how much of the drug gets to where it needs to be and whether it is a high enough concentration to affect the receptor that it's trying to affect to make the change. So in this case, we need the drug to get to the alpha receptors in the nose so that they can constrict the blood vessels and reduce the amount of congestion. So the actual amount that's absorbed is somewhat irrelevant. What we really care about is the fact that the um, concentration that affects the receptors is higher than the concentration that you can get into your body because it's extensively metabolized by the intestine. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Wren and he can give a more precise answer. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Um, that's a very good explanation. I'll try to be um, um, using the, as, uh, the plan language as well. So here, um, as a pharmacologist, we believe if a drug works, that means it should work at the site where it's working. For nasal congestion, you should, we believe that how the drug work at the nasal congestion is at the nasal mucosa. The, the amount or the concentration of the drug, let's say following oral administration, should reach certain level to be efficacious or to, or, um, to, or at least as potent as those animal studies, cellular studies, molecular studies indicating that concentration should work. And the results show that the following the oral administration route, the amount of the phenylephrine or the concentrated phenylephrine failed to reach that threshold concentration um, from the in vitro or, or, uh, or the cellular level. There's a concern raised in the morning by saying, hey, phenylephrine has a very wide Distri uh, tissue distribution, which means when phenylephrine enter the human body, there could be some other organs which can absorb this um, phenylephrine so that it can be uh, enriched in certain organs, but I, I, I shouldn't use enriched, but distribute to those organs and bind to something. But there's no evidence to showing that the nasal mucosa, this tissue can enrich um, the phenylephrine amount or concentration at that local site. And in addition, as a pharmacologist, we believe that how this uh, uh, phenylephrine works is through adrenergic receptor, which is located in the blood vessels. And therefore, in this scenario, the tissue distribution, I mean, let's the organ concentration, or irrelevant tissue distribution concentration doesn't matter here. What matters here is the blood concentration, the plasma concentration. So we, me we do measure, everyone here in this field measured plasma concentration, and it's lower than the EC50 value. So that's why, um, from a pharmacology perspective, uh, we can provide this evidence to support um, or explain the lack of efficacy from the clinical trials. Does Thank that you. clarify your question? Yes, I'm understanding it. I wanted to clarify because that's what I thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call on Dr. Uh, Clement. Please go ahead. Remember to state your name for the record. Yes, yeah, Steve Clement, ANOVA Health System in Northern Virginia. Um, I have a question for the FDA. It could be, um, I'll leave it up to you, either Dr. Stark or any of you. Um, when I got the binder and started reading all this information, Frankly, I was shocked. And what I was shocked about, what took so long, is that these data were available on the lack of efficacy studies in 2015, and we're pretty, we're pretty deep into almost to 10 years, almost eight years. So I'm just curious, why does it take so long? I mean, this, I was a little disturbed why this didn't come to the surface earlier. So thank you, Dr. Clement, for that question. This is Terry Michelle, um, non-prescription drugs. <clears throat> so, unfortunately, science is a slow process, and the regulatory yeah. process is also a slow process. So one of the things that we're particularly excited about under monograph reform is it does give us the opportunity to move things along a little bit more quickly. Um, but what we do with the data is we allow it to accumulate, and so that's what we've done with this. Um, and Thanks. I'm delighted that we now have the data that was asked for by the committee back in 2007, and we're pleased to be able to bring this forward for public discussion so that we can really hear the thoughts of the committee on, on what these data show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Maria Coyle here. I'm going to uh, ask a question of uh, CHPA, and this is in regards to uh, a slide that was presented by Mr. Mullen, uh, slide 78. 
Uh, but it may be a question uh, more for Dr. Drews as a, as a clinician. Um, when reviewing the, the meta-analyses um, that are represented uh, on slide 78 of, of your presentation, um, the estimated treatment effect for phenylephrine in both cases was um, reported at, at around 10%, um, and a 10% change in um, uh, the nasal airway resistance. And my question is just simply, is this clinically significant? Is there any way to know that this relatively small change from my perspective as someone who is not um, maybe as familiar with this measurement or um, working directly with patients um, in this area um, who's not familiar with this objective measurement, is this meaningful? Okay, I'll ask Mr. Mullins to start and Ms. Dr. Drews to uh, provide scientific commentary if he has any. Thank you, Chris Mullen. So um, the rationale for reporting the slide with the 10% and referring to that was because that's what's available, right? We don't necessarily have a responder analysis available to speak to that issue. Uh, but I would note that a small difference in means can actually be consistent with a substantial shift in two groups leading to a, a differences in percentages between patients receiving a, a degree of relief. Um, but I think Dr. Drews can speak to the clinical question. In particular, I think, uh, his slide CO60 that he may display does speak to some of the clinical relevance of the studies. And as Dr. Drews is approaching, may we share our screen? Thank you. At the time, Howard Drews, at the time these studies were done, um, there was no requirement, pre-requirement to pre-specify what was a clinically important difference or a minimally important difference. Um, it, it was generally understood that for uh, rhinomanometry, 15% um, changes in, um, in nasal airway resistance will, would be appreciated by patients. In fact, if we take the largest uh, of the studies that were done, this is, the, in my view, the best way to look at this, which was the Cohen study, there were three different methods that were applied to looking at clinically meaningful difference. And whether you use the methodology of Barnes or of Norman, I'm not an expert in, in biostatistics, but with these two different standard uh, methods uh, of calculating um, and um, looking at that, uh, these time points were not only were they clinically significant, but they correlated with the instantaneous subject. These are instantaneous subjective assessments. So thank you. Um, may, may I ask just one follow-up question? So uh, Maria Coyle again, are, are you saying that you believe for your patients, a 10% change would be clinically uh, meaningful? I'd like to draw, draw the, the distinction when you say for my patients, um, as an allergist, seeing patients with seasonal allergic rhinitis throughout the season, uh, that's a, a different issue. Uh, for, pe for people who do not need to come to a healthcare provider and have temporary nasal um, obstruction, it's clear to me uh, that that sort of uh, uh, of a clinical effect is perfectly adequate to treat their symptoms. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, and if the chair would allow, Dr. Jalot would like to also provide some additional context to the bioavailability question that was asked. Um, sure, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, I guess to answer the question, when I first um, heard that the bioavailability is 1% that was um, discussed as, as what the bioavailability is, we really don't know what it is. And I think um, we do have some data that um, I'd like to go over. First, before going over that is in a few of my studies that we have seen today, we have also looked at the metabolites in the urine. And so the metabolites give you an idea of what's going on. So it is not 1% and 99% through pre-systemic metabolism, which would be the sulfate um, um, metabolite. 
that's only 47% that we determined in the, u in the urine. The other major metabolite is through monoamine oxida oxidase, which makes 3-hydroxy mandelic acid. And that's about 25% of the urine. So that represents phenylephrine that was circulating in the, ur um, in the plasma concentration before it was metabolized. So, so having 1%, we really don't know what the bioavailability is. There really is no good data. Now, in terms of, sorry. Okay, in terms, I'd like to return to this slide once again, because I think it's a really important slide because we hear the word potency, the in vitro potency, um, if because the clinical concentrations that we measure in the plasma it can't be effective because it's lower than the potency measured in vitro. Remember, potency measured in vitro is a closed system. So you add a concentration and you look at some type of effect, but it's closed. What we have in the body is an open system where plasma concentrations and the drug is circulating around. I'd like to bring your attention once again to the table and you can sort of get a sense of how complicated this might be. If you look at Montelukas, where you see plasma concentrations, if we were going to measure it in the bound, is about 153 bound circulating in the plasma. But circulating the plasma is unbound drug, which for Montelukas is only 0.31 nanomolar, which is lower than phenylephrine circulating around. And drug theory is that unbound drug is what can leave the plasma, go to the site of action, and attach to a receptor. Bound drug, even if it's not metabolized or it's in an unmetabolized form, cannot leave. So you can see that phenylephrine has an unbound plasma concentration based on the pharmacokinetic data of 1.29. So again, there's a lot of complexity going on here. And I think the bottom line is there, we really don't know what the bioavailability is and 1% is not an appropriate number. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll go on and, and move on. I'm gonna call on Dr. Pazarek uh, with a reminder to state your name for the record. Thank you. It's Paul Pasarek, and I have a question for the CHPA on their survey of consumers. When I ask a patient what they're taking for their cold or allergy symptoms, a lot of times I get, I'm taking, um, I'm taking, I'm taking um, mucinex. And I ask them, well, what, what type of mucinex? And, and they have no idea what type of mucinex they're taking. There's 15 varieties of mucinex. So in the survey, how, how accurate were these patients' recall as to what they took? How do they know they took something with a decongestant in it? Okay, I'll ask Mr. Tringale to approach. Thank you. Hi, Mike Tringale, CHPA. So we were very careful to your, to your point about making sure we very narrowly identified uh, this purpose of sample of people who had actually used a product with PE. So again, in the briefing materials is the full instrument, but I'll read the question, the screening question we use to try to get to that specific patient population. We said, in the past 12 months, have you used any medicine that you can buy without a prescription, also known as over-the-counter or OTC medicine, that you take by mouth that includes treatment for symptom relief of nasal or sinus congestion due to cold or nasal allergies, often referred to as stuffy nose? In addition, we also gave them examples of actual products to further ensure that we got patients and consumers who actually used those specific products, either single ingredient or combination that included PE. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going, uh, we'll call on Dr. Ginsburg. Please go ahead. Thank my camera was work. Diane Ginsburg, University of Texas at Austin, College of Pharmacy. And my um, questions are also to CHPA, specifically to two comments that Dr. Truce made um, through, his, it, through his presentation. And I want to make sure that I'm interpreting these two statements correctly. Dr. Truce, the two comments that are that are sticking with me right now is you made the comment that 
the studies and things that were done in the past met the regulatory requirements at that time. And obviously, since 2007 and forward, and as studies, and as we've gotten more information, are you stating that just because it met the regulatory requirements at that time, that we should just accept that information today, knowing that we have more information? And perhaps I'm misinterpreting what how you were meaning that. Thank you, Howard Druce. Um, I'm not a regulator. Uh, I'm a clinician uh, and I'm a researcher. Um, my interpretation of the data is that the product has a labeled indication for temporary relief of nasal congestion and that the data that was analyzed by the panel the committee and has been realized, reanalyzed re multiple times, addressed the drug and that specific indication as on the label. The data that has been uh, amassed since 2007 in the seasonal allergic rhinitis model looks at people who have already been diagnosed with seasonal allergic rhinitis and have sustained nasal congestion to be able to enter the trials. In other words, when I look at the body of data, um, what I see is a certain amount of data that supports a labeled indication. And I see other data, which is interesting, but to me does not address the question of whether this product is effective for its indications. I appreciate that, sir. I have one more question for you, if I may, related to another statement that you made. And this is getting, I think, to the heart of your being a, a, a data person as well. You talked, you, you made the comment, and again, I want to make sure that I read this correctly, that you said that the clinical study design wasn't relevant. And I would like to know what you what you meant by that. And that's yes. my last question. Thank yes. you. So what I mean is the following. Uh, I would, if we're simply looking at allergic rhinitis or allergies, which we're not, because we have a dual indication for the common cold and upper respiratory viral infections, and we have upper respiratory allergies. And you've heard from Dr. Meltzer, as well as me, that the mechanism of action of decongestion is the same. We're looking at temporary nasal congestion. In other words, if you look at people that have sustained congestion and you look at 12-hour endpoints in sustained congestion, it's interesting, but it's not the population for whom this drug is intended. So that's why I would characterize that as not relevant. I think it's interesting. I think it, it makes some answers some questions about people who are already diagnosed with seasonal allergic rhinitis, but it does not address those people who are quite well treated and derive benefit without seeing a healthcare professional. Thank you, sir, for answering my questions. Appreciated. And one thing I'd like to ask, add, if I may, I mean, sure. about, about so, uh, the record. Yes, Marcia Howard. Thank you. Uh, the question, there was a question raised about the science, uh, scientific rigor today versus that from when the monograph studies were evaluated. And we certainly do agree that science continues to advance, but that does not necessarily mean that the older studies should be, um, that they cannot, that they no longer apply or that those studies uh, should necessarily be run to the standards of today's time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to Dr. Uh, Lay. As, as we do so, or as I call on her, um, I just want to encourage any other panel members who might have questions uh, to go ahead and, and raise your hands and get in the queue, particularly if you've not had a chance uh, to ask questions or to clarify comments from either FDA or CHPA um, as we move into this final, uh, final 30 minutes of our meeting. So Dr. Lay, you may, you may begin. Yes, Jennifer Lay from um, the Skag School of Pharmacy, UC San Diego. This question is for the FDA, um, any member. Um, 
I'm trying to put my wrap my head around this, and I've been on the advisory committee for FDA for four years now. Um, and this is the first time, actually, I I'm I've have become very concerned um, about public health and safety perspective in relation to some of the published studies that led to the original um, approval and stat- the, the grace status of um, phenylephrine. Of course, this underscores the utmost importance of data integrity, where data should be complete, consistent, accurate, trustworthy, and reliable. And the need for review of, thorough review, in fact, of data integrity before approval. I'm curious as to what the FDA does now um, to in terms of policies and procedures. And I know there's the International Council for Harmonization and Good Clinical Practice um, Standards, their guideline. But I'm curious as to what the current policy and procedure are for ensuring and maintaining data integrity. And also, if there are allegations that is um, that has forensic um, statistic analysis provided, are there any repercussions that are in- integrated in this? Hi, this is Dr. Michelle. I'll take that question. So I'm going to dissect it a little bit because you've actually asked quite a few questions embedded in one. So the first question I believe you asked is, what are current practices at FDA for reviewing data and ensuring data integrity of the data that have been submitted? Is that your first question? That is correct. All right. So currently, um, FDA reviews data, and when we do that, we look for a number of things. So we generally review the primary data from the study when we can get it. When we can't, we will review peer-reviewed journal articles, but in all cases, we require that um, there is sufficient information in the study reports for us to make an independent assessment of those data. Um, When we get full clinical trial data for an NDA, we will typically do inspections of the clinical trial sites Um, that is guided by our statistical analysis of the data, and we will choose representative sites to visit and have actual audit of those sites. For the monograph, we're looking at peer-reviewed articles most frequently, but we also do look at data that are submitted that are um, full clinical trials. And certainly any time there is a question of data integrity, we would do a for-cause audit of that particular site. Now, what happens, depending on what is found, um, is a compliance determination. And I'm not going to get into it for the purposes of this meeting because it's really not relevant. But what we do do is then the statisticians go back and look at the trial to make a determination of whether those um, data can be thrown out and the trial still maintains its integrity if it's just a single site or if the entire study is um, really not supportive and we do not consider those data further. Does that answer that question? Yes, it does. Do you want me to repeat my second question? Yes, please. The second question I have, and I think this should conclude um, my line of question here, um, are there any policies in place? Let's say once you find a compliance issue, especially with forensic analysis that shows um, lack of integrity of the data, what are the policies and procedures that you have currently? Yes, so there are a number of policies and procedures for current contemporaneous trials. Um, Again, the first thing we do is go out and do a four-cause inspection, and whatever happens from there is taken, you know, one step at a time. Uh, And it depends on, you know, what what was found during that audit. Now, in this case, there were some questions that were raised about the data integrity of a couple of the studies 
from, you know, 55 years ago. I think at this point in time, it would be impossible to tell whether there truly was, were data integrities with those studies or not. Um, all we were pointing out in our background package was that there is some evidence that um, perhaps those studies had some issues, um, but whether or not whether we can determine that there was an issue or there was not an issue, you know, 55 years ago, we certainly can't do that, and we're not impugning um, the integrity of those sites at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see one more question. Uh, Dr. D'Agostino, please go ahead. Yes, this is Emma D'Agostino. Um, my question is for the FDA. Um, just taking us back to the bio bioavailability data again, I'm wondering if you can comment since the CHPA um, just talked about how we really don't know what the bioavailability is and that it's only 1% or they're saying that we don't know that it's 1%. Um, but we've heard from the FDA that we do think the bioavailability is only 1%. I'm wondering if you can comment um, on what we heard from the CHPA. Thank you for that question. So you're questioning the 1% bioavailability. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wren to answer that question. Thank you. So um, about our bioavailability, if you're talking about the strict definition that how many dose was absorbed in human body following that oral. We do not have, yes, other than that 38% flawed study, we do not have other good studies to, to support it, but it can be inferred because, following, the parent phenylephrine drug concentration, the total AUCs, or you can consider as amount, divided that I'm talking about because it's in the blood that's absorbed. And use that AUC value or the amount of value divided by what was absorbed. The total phenylephrine, including metabolism, including parent phenylephrine, that's less than 1%. And the total, this phenylephrine absorbed cannot be more than 100% of the dose that you intake. So therefore, the oral um, availability for parent phenylephrine is less than 1%. That's, I said, that's what I said in the morning, it's airtight. It's an inference. And uh, regarding those EC50 values from other drugs in other disease areas, I can't, I'm not expert. Uh, we can go one drug by one drug and look at all these and have another meeting for this, but I'm not expert in those areas. I haven't reviewed all these drugs, but in terms of alpha adrenergic receptor and agonist effect, I can, I can say based on the approved indication, which is for treating hypotension, if you compare that EC50 value to the blood or the plasma concentration of the parent phenylephrine, that's definitely higher than the EC50 value. So um, that's it, uh, my answer for, for this question. Thank you. If the chair would allow Dr. Jalot to add additional context. Yes, go ahead. Okay, we keep hearing about um, total phenylephrine. So I think the, the best way to look at it. Oh, share. Can I have oh, you oh, say can we share? Kathy Jalot. Thank you. Share, sorry. No worries. All right, not used to this. Okay, so I, I think what it comes down to is this total phenylephrine, and that's not the total. I mean, in general, the assays that were presented, the one that was presented from um, the briefing book with the, the data from a, an NDA, that is really hydrolyzed from the sulfate. What's missing, and like I said before, we've done metabolism studies, and the only amount in the urine, which is a way to check how much was um, metabolized down that pathway, is 47%. So greater than 50% is getting in. And then when once it's in, it goes through monoamine oxidase. 
metabolism. And that's why we, we restrict take, um, people cannot take this medicine on MAOA inhibitors because it would increase the bioavailability of phenylephrine. So what's happening here, it's a mixture. So you have metabolites that prefer to stay in the plasma because the goal is to be eliminated in the urine. The free drug can leave the plasma and move to the site of action. So what you're measuring on total is really a mixture, which changes the overall pharmacokinetic profile. And you can see that with the red curve. It has a longer half-life, and so it's not representative of the um, phenylephrine itself. And that's something that was brought up by one of other committee members this morning with Dr. Fig. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dykowitz, I'm going to give you the floor. Hi, I'm Mark Dykowitz. Um, so in our discussion, the comment's been made that the modern studies on seasonal allergic rhinitis patients that have not shown benefit with phenylephrine are not relevant to the consumer population to whom the phenylephrine products are indicated. If I look at the product label, it says that uh, oral phenylephrine products uh, temporarily relieve nasal congestion due to the common cold, hay fever, or other respiratory allergies. So my reading of that would be that that would apply to patients with um, uh, seasonal allergic rhinitis, which brings up the question in terms of patient usage, um, who is using this uh, uh, product? I suspect it's a lot of patients with seasonal allergic rhinitis, but in the um, uh, survey that was um, presented to the committee, starting around side CO8 and, and following, uh, was there any effort made to determine, um, even with patient self-assessment, what sort of conditions were uh, uh, the people taking the oral decongestants for? No. I will ask Dr. Drews to approach. Howard Drews, I'd like to uh, address the first part of Dr. Dykowitz's question. Um, when you look at the guidelines for the uh, evaluation of drugs for seasonal allergic rhinitis, um, you're looking at people who have got diagnosed allergic rhinitis for multiple years, positive skin tests, uh, sustained nasal congestion in run-in periods and probably throughout a season. And, you know, these people know who they are. Um, they get symptoms in the spring, the fall, whenever, um, and they know who they are. Um, if they get temporary nasal congestion, and they follow the recommendations on, on the label of a phenylephrine box, they will take it for a short period of time. And then if it works uh, for their nasal congestion, it satisfies their needs. If it does not, then clearly they will move to some form of other treatment. But what I think we're dealing with here is the probably about 80% studies of of varied epidemiologic studies, anywhere between 60 and 80% of patients with allergies uh, don't reach the level of symptom uh, complexity uh, where they need to see a healthcare provider. They are perfectly well able to manage with the sort of medicine that you've heard Dr. Henderley's mention for their uh, for their uh, uh, nasal um, itching and sneezing, or as Dr. Meltzer mentioned, but also uh, for this particular symptom, these are the sort of people who can um, uh, use this. The second point I'd like to make is that patients on the whole who have allergies don't say, I have seasonal allergic rhinitis. People who have temporary stuffy noses know when they get it when they get an upper respiratory virus, and they know when they do that, and that's almost everybody. They don't see a healthcare provider. And people with allergies 
who don't need uh, to be treated throughout a season, again, know who they are and get short-term treatment. Um, I, I can't speak myself to the specific survey, um, but I think that the sort of people who are using this are not the same sort of people that are being addressed in the practice parameters and the treatment guidelines. And while Mr. Tringell is approaching, I will at least uh, add to the conversation that based on the sales data that we obtained while we were paying for this meeting, the majority of the sales are actually occurring uh, in cough cold products that contain phenylephrine. Mike Tringale, CHPA, in specific regard to the question about the survey, no, we did not screen for nor ask about any condition that the respondent may have had. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I don't see that we have any additional uh, clarifying questions from the panel. So given that, we will now adjourn this first day of our two-day meeting. Uh, we've had lots of uh, data presentations, um, and we will start promptly tomorrow at 9 a.m., September 12th. Uh, panel members, as you individually consider the data that's presented, please do remember that there should be no discussion of meeting topics with other panel members until we reconvene tomorrow. Uh, day one is now, uh, now adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>